June 22nd, um, and <clears throat> I guess it would be good, Tony, to start with roll call, just make sure we got everybody here. Yeah, Jimenez. Alan. Here. Owen. Here. Roscoe. Davis. Here. Esparza. Here. Arenas. Here. Foley? Here. Mayhem? Here. Jones? Here. Licardo? Present. Thank you, Tony. All right, we have a quorum. Uh, Tony, uh, correct me if I'm wrong in this. We have a time certain for the police reforms work plan, uh, which is item 4.3. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Okay, that's where we'll go. Item 4.3, police reforms work plan, reimagining community safety staff report. Uh, we'll go first to a staff presentation and then to questions and comments of members of our community. Welcome, Angel. All right. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, members of the City Council, Angel Rios, Deputy City Manager, uh, City of San Jose, uh, joined here uh, by uh, Sulma Maciel and Peter Hamilton, uh, as well as on our, on our, our list of panelists, uh, we have Chief Mata and Chief uh, Assistant Chief Joseph. And also joining us as panelists, uh, Jamal Williams, uh, co-chair of the Black Leadership Kitchen Cabinet, Poncho Guevara, Sacred Heart Community Service, and Mika Sterneta, representing the uh, NAACP, La Raza Lawyers, and La Raza Roundtable. Um, for some, uh, some context, uh, you know, May 25th, 2020, was a catalytic moment uh, for our nation and for our city. Uh, it was on this day that George Floyd, a black man, was murdered by a white Minneapolis police officer. Uh, in response to this murder and other police killings, uh, street protests arose across the country uh, as well as in our city. Uh, individuals, our residents expressed concern, anger, and frustration. Uh, much of this tension it uh, was a result of uh, undiscussed and unaddressed systemic racism in our society overall. Um, the city's response to these protests and to concurrent incidents of social unrest uh, quickly attracted strong criticism from community leaders and the broader public. The council scheduled items to hear these concerns. And on June 9th and June 16th, 2020, uh, council, uh, the, council, uh, the council scheduled items to hear uh, and address these issues. Uh, at these meetings, the council heard extensive public testimony regarding concerns about specific city actions related to recent protests, as well as broader concerns about policing. After hearing this testimony and extensive council discussion, the council took action to direct the city manager, independent police auditor and city attorney to pursue a range of proposals related to policing in San Jose. The administration collected the council direction provided to the city manager into one tracking document known as the police reforms work plan and is overseen by our assistant city manager, Jennifer McGuire. The purpose of the work plan is to track progress in implementing council direction and to keep the council and public updated on staff's efforts. Um, when we take a look at council direction, um, this, this slide here pretty much kind of captures the direction that really came out of those two council meetings. We won't go over them into a lot of detail, but in a nutshell, the, the overall direction, you can go to the next slide, uh, really addressed or focused on two uh, specific areas, alternatives to policing uh, and building community and enhancing community and police relations. Uh, and then there was also a third that kind of emerged over the course of this conversation, and that was around neighborhood safety. And um, the main takeaway, uh, or, or the main uh, focus of these really focus on with respect to alternatives to policing uh, involves looking at al identifying alternative service models uh, to address issues that are currently handled by police. Uh, for example, uh, responding to mental health uh, uh, crisis or incidents uh, as an example. Uh, the second around community and police relations really uh, focus on how do we improve community relationships and trust uh, between our police department and uh, members of our community. Um, 
the timeline uh, th that kind of led to uh, us uh, uh, launching a reimagining community safety advisory group a as a result. And, and, and that group and the work of that group was really driven by four overarching goals. The first one, creating a shared vision around community safety. The second one, really focusing on engagement of community stakeholders and really facilitating a dialogue and community process that evaluates and recommends new ways in which the police department and non-law enforcement sectors intervene with social issues and reduce social conflicts, especially those that are non-criminal in nature, uh, and a, a strong focus on carrying out an effective and inclusive community engagement process that is uh, not only transparent, but also yields high participation from all sides of the issue. Uh, issues and uh, and ultimately build strong relationships between the community and police. And then lastly, uh, this group uh, was was charged with forming and generating recommendations that would enable uh, the vision of of community safety. Um, over the, over the course of that process, if you go to the next, we launched and uh, we basically were into our third meeting uh, when when. Uh, when there was, uh, you know, significant concern by a few members of the advisory uh, council, uh, mainly around the scope and the lack of direct police reform work. Um, now, the council direction that we received leading into this uh, uh, was focused on alternatives to policing, but not necessarily police reform directly. And that became a major point of contention uh, among some of the advisory council members. Uh, there was also some concern that uh, you know, ultimate recommendations may be filtered and or modified by the time they get from this process to uh, the mayor and council for, for recommendation. Uh, that led to the resignation of some of our uh, advisory council members. We subsequently put a pause on the process and you can go to the next uh, slide there. Um, and and uh, put a pause on the process and went back to PISFIS and reported on and provided a status update on kind of where we've been, where we are, and what the issues of concern are. At PISFIS, we really framed three key decision points that really needed to be addressed in order for us to really move forward in, a, in an effective uh, and cohesive way. Uh, the first had to do with, uh, with, with scope and whether or not we should add police reform uh, to that scope. Um, at PISFIS, we received uh, some really good feedback and, and there was a uh, unanimous consensus that we should add police reform to this, uh, to, to, the, uh, to, to the scope of this work. And Joe, I think there may be a problem with the slide. It seems to have gone backward. Okay. Just wanna give this a little okay. bit of slides a chance to okay. catch up. Yeah, Peter, you, you, you can stay right there on that slide and I'll, I'll catch okay. up. Okay, and then the second had to do with structure. You know, there, there was a, uh, a desire by uh, some members of the group to have more autonomy from the city, again, for the reasons I, I mentioned earlier. And the third had to do with whether or not we should include or exclude law enforcement at the table. Uh, there was significant discussion as to some felt strongly that, that uh, police uh, uh, should not be at the table, others felt they should, uh, and we wanted to basically frame that question and get uh, feedback uh, back from uh, council as well. At that council meeting, we did receive a direction to kind of to go back and take a look at um, uh, types of structures that are potentially available, uh, a recommendation to proceed with adding scope, as well as uh, definitely including uh, law enforcement voice uh, in this process going forward. Uh, and that brings us to, uh, to tonight's uh, um, tonight's council meeting. Uh, since PISFIS, we have been meeting with a subset of the advisory council. Uh, there, there was a proposal that was developed by a coalition of, of uh, different members uh, uh, around with recommendations around this process. We've been meeting over the last several weeks, you know, going, going through different iterations of this proposal and the proposal that is attached to, uh, to the supplemental memo today is the latest version. Uh, we, we feel that it's moving in the right direction. It definitely incorporates uh, significant feedback uh, from city staff and, um, and, and we have some recommendations to go along with it. Before I get into the recommendations, we also received direction at PISFIS to come back uh, to, to really examine the types of structures that we could potentially use. And, and so basically we identified four. Uh, we've also been in contact with the city of Austin, Oakland, Atlanta, 
LA, uh, a number of different cities that are doing this work. And, and there's, there's uh, four that have that pretty much rise uh, to the top. The first is uh, body advisory to the city manager, which was the original structure that we launched. The second has to do with uh, a, a, an advisory council that is appointed uh, by the city council and reports directly to the city council. And that's probably the most consistent one. Uh, uh, th th that's the one that aligns closest to the coalition proposal. Uh, there's also an exterior process, one where there's complete autonomy from the city and, uh, you know, groups pull together, they run their own process. Uh, there is not a direct connection to the city, but ultimately they can take the report and present it to uh, the mayor and council. Um, and then the last one is a bifurcated process that really emerged over a conversation at PISFIS around, should we bifurcate the, the scope of this work? In, in other words, should we focus uh, one process on police reform and the other one on the original intent of reimagining, which was really centered more around alternatives to policing and neighborhood safety. And, and uh, we, we refer to that as a bifurcated process. There's a lot more detail uh, with respect to each and every one of these in the supplemental memo, if you wanna do a deeper dive. Um, next slide, please. Um, and so uh, the proposal that I referenced earlier, uh, in, in a nutshell, this is kind of a, 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 a synthesis of it. Um, <clears throat> you know, basically uh, calls for an expanded uh, project scope, which would include uh, uh, police reform. Um, it, it does recommend a community led process. So instead of the city facilitating and running these meetings, this would be a process that, that is led by community leadership um, they, uh, they, will, they would be supported by the city, but the process would actually be facilitated and led by uh, community members. Um, they proposed the, the, the establishment of an advisory committee composed of about 27 voting members appointed by community organizations uh, and various uh, uh, other um, uh, sectors. And, um, and then it would also include eight non-voting members. And this would be representatives from largely governmental organizations that, that have information to share, but aren't necessarily uh, voting members on the advisory council. Uh, in, in an effort to also ensure the engagement of, of youth and young people and the youth voice, they also propose uh, the, the uh, establishment of a youth council composed of 12 members appointed by the community organizations. Uh, they would, this youth council would work on a parallel track to the advisory uh, committee, and then will develop their own scope and develop their own recommendations uh, independent from the advisory committee. Uh, they also asked uh, for, for staff support, consultant support, and independent legal counsel. And uh, they project that the timeline, uh, this work could be done in approximately six months. Uh, staff believes that this proposal can be implemented with some modifications. Uh, so moving on to those uh, modifications, uh, we, we came up with a set of 10 recommendations, uh, including project scope, timeline, formation of steering committee, community outreach, advisory committee voting members, the others that you see listed on this, uh, on this slide here. The, the supplemental memo goes into, into greater detail uh, and in terms of uh, uh, kind of narrative and, and text to back up uh, the recommendations. But uh, what I'd like to do is maybe just highlight a few of the recommendations that I think are, are, are substantial enough to, to discuss. Um, so we can go to the next slide there, Peter. Uh, so around project scope, uh, we, we, we propose language that simply clarifies the focus on the scope a little bit uh, more clearly. Um, it, the scope that is proposed uh, by the coalition um, keeps the alternative to policing language that we had in the original approach. Uh, it, it adds under the area of police reform, uh, this area of transformation of, of police policies and practices, uh, as well as increased police accountability and transparency, uh, as well as a uh, strategy around implementation strategies on, on how to implement some of the recommendations that ultimately would, would go uh, to the mayor and council. Um, Next slide there, Peter. Um, the, the, in, in, with respect to timeline, uh, we, we do think uh, that this work could potentially get done in six months. However, we also know that should uh, the group uh, opt to go with a new consultant uh, that would require a new RFP, 
uh, and and as well as the recruitment of both youth uh, members as well as uh, other community members may take a little bit longer. And so we, we think that this timeline is a little bit more um, reflective, a little bit more realistic, considering uh, that startup time that may be uh, necessary. Uh, we of course don't object to a six month you know, process, but we do think that it'll, it'll, it's more realistic that uh, this work will get done in about a six to eight month uh, process. So that's a, we have a recommendation around that timeline uh, just to ensure uh, an effective uh, end product. Um, next slide, Peter. Um, in, in the area of uh, formation of a steering committee, uh, the advisory committee uh, will establish a steering committee. And, and the way we see it is that this steering committee should basically be that primary point of contact for meeting, planning, coordination uh, uh, as we coordinate and partner around this work. Uh, since this, this, uh, this recommendation uh, would shift kind of the, the focus of facilitation and leading this effort to community leadership. Uh, the formation of this advisory committee is essential to ensuring uh, good effective communication and troubleshooting wherever, wherever necessary. Uh, in the area of community outreach, uh, there, there's some significant language there in the, in the memo as well. Um, but we wanted to be very clear around outreach expectations. And, and, and we believe that these expectations are also in the spirit of what the uh, proposers uh, were thinking as well. So I don't think we're saying anything different. We just wanna be uh, very clear around uh, that outreach uh, you know, should be conducted both targeted to specific communities and to the general public. Uh, so, uh, so really a, a robust, uh, comprehensive outreach strategy. Uh, that target populations, uh, you know, should include communities of color, faith, faith communities, communities disproportionately impacted by policing or public safety issues, uh, the business community, police rank and file, and other communities, especially those that have traditionally been left out of city decision making. And as I said earlier, uh, this is in, in line with what is being proposed as well. So, um, so I think there's alignment and consistency there. Um, we also believe it's important to make space for a wide variety of different opinions. Uh, you know, as, as we all know, you know, the issues involved with, with, with police reform and or alternatives to policing uh, can become very contentious as we saw having I mean, three meetings into our process, right? Um, and uh, at the same time, we think, we, you know, that we need to be very deliberate and intentional about creating space and, uh, for people to have different opinions, because it's only through you know candid and transparent conversation, even if it means uh, divergent perspectives, uh, that we're going to you know reach good public policy that ultimately should should uh, best serve our, our community, which that that always needs to be the end goal. And so, we just want to reiterate that point and and, and to ensure that that uh, that that is an expectation. Um, and of course, the advisory committee will take the lead on setting the outreach strategy, uh, but city staff will, uh, would like the opportunity to provide input on that outreach approach. As, as, uh, as a city staff, we, we are in contact with a lot of neighborhood groups, a lot of neighborhood associations, a lot of neighborhood leaders, and we want to be able to share that information uh, with, the, uh, with the group uh, to ensure a maximum community engagement. Um, next slide. Um, uh, in terms of advisory committee voting members, uh, you know, the city council, uh, you know, because this would be a city uh, council approved um, advisory group, uh, the city council uh, is required to uh, um, approve uh, those individuals. Uh, in order to kind of make this as streamlined as possible, um, there is an attached list of nominating organizations for each seat on the advisory committee. Um, if, if, you if you choose to do this tonight, um, you know, you can approve that group of nominating uh, organizations and then the steering committee will then uh, fill that advisory council accordingly. Uh, there are some uh, additional recommendations that staff made in this area and we are recommending the addition of six seats to the list of advisory committee seats proposed by the coalition. Uh, specifically around neighborhood uh, perspective and neighborhood, um, uh, the neighborhood voice. Uh, we, we also uh, uh, provided some recommended criteria around uh, appointee, appointees needing to reside in areas designated uh, e either by the Mayor's Gang Prevention Task Force uh, uh, gang hotspot list, there's about 18 of them, uh, and or Project Hope sites. 
and uh, appointees should be actively involved in their neighborhoods, uh, such as through a neighborhood association or community organization or project and, and be able to really have a good handle on neighborhood issues in their respective uh, neighborhoods. Uh, and then they uh, should of course also be interested in advocating on behalf of their neighborhoods uh, on issues of neighborhood concern related to public safety. We really feel that uh, you know, the, the neighborhood voice and tapping into that neighborhood voice is gonna be paramount to a successful process. And as such, that's uh, the recommendation that we have here. Um, we do uh, go uh, one step further and we do uh, uh, you know, also offer that staff, city staff will, uh, can take the lead in identifying these uh, six representatives and pass that information on as a recommendation to the advisory council as well. So we're not only, uh, you know, setting the expectation, but we're also offering our assistance in identifying uh, the appropriate neighborhood leaders. Um, next slide there. Um, in the area of staff role, uh, there is a request for, um, for staff and consultant. Um, so uh, we, we, we are uh, recommending uh, funding uh, in the amount of $100,000 to $125,000 to cover uh, consultant and or um, any translation and or uh, non-personnel type, uh, type work that may be required. Um, staff, uh, on, on the staff side, we also would be hiring a, a part-time temporary, uh, I mean, a, a temp U position to provide staff support, mainly in the area of meeting management, not so much in policy development or anything like that. It's mainly in the area of of assisting with meeting management since these meetings will be subject to Brown Act and, and the procedures uh, that all other city appointed uh, commissions and or uh, boards or groups uh, would have to abide by. In the area of consultant procurement, uh, the city will also take the lead in uh, doing that work. Uh, we of course would work in partnership uh, with the advisory group uh, and, and, and they have an opportunity to help inform any RFP should one be required, uh, as well as they can uh, sit on the, uh, the interview panels and, and assist with selection. But ultimately, uh, the procurement of a consultant will also reside in uh, the city administration uh, side of, of this work. Uh, next slide here. Um, Next steps, uh, if the city council uh, approves the staff recommendations, and, and again, I, I just went over a few of the recommendations. There are 10 in the, uh, in the memo, and, we, and we'll be happy to answer any questions around those as well. But uh, if you choose to approve uh, this recommendation today, uh, then you know, we, will proceed, we will proceed according to the timeline uh, that is uh, proposed in recommendation number two, unless there's um, uh, any other alternative uh, suggestions. Um, if, if you do not, uh, if you choose not to approve this recommendation, then of course we will, uh, you know, revise the project plan and kind of go back to the drawing board and, and figure out what next steps would be. Um, I, I do want to, I, I do want to um, state that uh, there, you know, th this process when you going into this was it had the, the potential for being very contentious and, and very tough and and I, I really take my hat off to, to the community-based organizations, the neighborhood leaders, uh, the members on this panel today that have joined us as well, because it's easy to criticize a process and it's a lot tougher to st stay at the table and help work through solutions. And that's what these leaders have done and as well as others in the community-based sector. Uh, and uh, we really appreciate that partnership. We know that this is difficult work. Uh, and the last thing I would say before I turn it over for questions and answers is that, you know, the one thing we have learned from Oakland and Atlanta and um, Austin and some of these other cities is that, um, you know, developing rec some of the recommendations that could potentially come out of this can be uh, pretty expensive and pretty, um, uh, can, can, be, can have a, a significant fiscal impact. Um, we, we are asking, and that's, it's also in, in the body of the memo uh, around our recommendations, that should there be any fiscal impact to any of the recommendations, that uh, to the extent possible, those, uh, those ideas are costed out and uh, funding, potential funding sources potentially identified. Because the, the one thing that we can learn from some of these other cities is that there's some great recommendations that have emerged but they've been unviable in terms of just the ability to fund. And so the more we ground the recommendations in viability and something that can truly be funded, 
then I think uh, that will result in more effective, uh, uh, you know, results on, on the back end. At the end of the day, this is shouldn't be about any organization or any specific agenda. It really needs to be about neighborhood and community safety and the safety of our residents in, in the city of San Jose. And so um, with that, um, I'll turn it over to you all. And as you know, we have other panelists here as well, if you want to speak to the proposal and uh, we'll open it up to you. Great, thanks Angel, appreciate it. And uh, welcome to our uh, panel members, uh, Pancho Guevara, Jamal Williams, and, uh, and Mikael Stromera, thank you for your work. Um, We'll come back to you, I think, for Q&A and, and discussion. Uh, I, I think that's the format. I, forgive me, Angel. Were, were, were they going to make a formal statement or should we go to the public first? Yeah, we can go to public comment. They're, they're here to answer any questions. And, and in fact, actually, before we do that, I'll, I'll just, you know, you know Jamal, Poncho, uh, Mika, is there anything that, that uh, you'd want to add before we, we go to the public and then back to Q&A? Uh, I want to make sure you have that opportunity, should you, should you wish. Thank you, Angel, and thank you, uh, Mayor Ricardo. I think um, I think what we just wanted to add to this, we're here obviously to answer questions, but to be able to give you a sense, like there is a tremendous amount of energy and enthusiasm, over 70 organizations, uh, you know, not only have endorsed this proposal, but we've had dozens actually working on developing the framework around this. And, and rather than this just being a city process that you're developing for us to engage community input, this is about folks rolling up their sleeves, getting involved and making sure that we're able to move this process forward. We're a year, removed from you know from the commitment on the part of the city council to be able to address the to be able to work on on this reimagining process um, we understand that it's taken some time to actually you know get some traction on this um, and we actually feel like the like the main recommendations that angel like brought up are really really essential for us to be able to move forward with this specifically it was our interpretation uh from the council you know from the directives that came from last june um uh, council member Perales's, um, you know, memo which you saw, which you see a uh, quote from in the uh, in the memo from May 12th, 2021, is to accept the recommendations in the memorandum um, uh, amending recommendation six to establish not only a process to review our use of force policies, but also include a process that broadly engages our community and what the future policing should look like. So that element of expanding the scope of this process, I think, is reflected in that directive that you have there. In a couple of the process innovations that we come up with, is creating a youth council making sure that we have organizations that are willing to roll up their sleeves and actually do that engagement process and um, and certainly want to be able to make sure that we're representing all these things. But in, in a group that's really tight, people that are really ready to work, and I think we're, we're really prepared to be able to do so. So we feel excited about the conversation tonight and look forward to answering your questions as we move forward with this. Thank you, Poncho. Uh, Jamal or Mika, did you want to add anything before we go to the public? No. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for being here. I know we'll engage in conversation shortly. Let's go to members of the community now. Uh, and with apologies, I know many folks just joined us. Uh, we have constrained public comment to one minute simply because uh, we've got an enormous amount of work to do here before midnight. And we want to make sure we get all done before midnight. Uh, Nihar, welcome. Or before they begin, I just wanted to leave this um, interpretation information up for just a minute. It was up earlier. Thank you. For those of you on the council, in order to hear the interpreters, you will need to go down to the interpretation button and choose the English channel. Um, it defaults to off, so choose English to hear the interpreters. I'm going to stop sharing now, and you can move on to public comment. Thank you for that announcement. Okay. Nihar, welcome. Hello, my name is Nihar Agarwal, and I'm a member of the Race, Equity, and Community Safety Committee, or Rex, at Sacred Heart Community Services. We've heard from our community again and again that we need to approach community safety in a holistic way that recognizes that increasing safety does not equate to more policing. Demetrius Stanley and Daniel Tovar were both killed by plain clothes officers and were completely preventable. We call on Council Member Cohen to release a public statement regarding the killing of Demetrius Stanley, a District 4 resident. We call on the entire Council to create um, an advisory committee to study alternatives to policing, the impacts of current police policies, new strategies to increase police accountability, and implementation strategies to produce real change. I yield my time. Thank you, Sophia. Welcome. 
Um, hello, my name is Sophia and I'm a community member at the Racial Equity and Community Safety Committee with Sacred Heart. I'm also a graduate of Cristo Rey San Jose Jesuit High School and I live in District 3. I'm here to ask that the council votes yes for the Blue Ribbon Commission. I want to make clear that I don't want to go back to business as usual after last year's reckoning. I don't want to continue living in a city that refuses to house the homeless, but has no problems with tacking on a couple hundred thousand dollars to police budget every year. I don't want to live in a city, a city that I have lived in since birth, a city that I and many others have given our time and love to that doesn't love us back. A city that responds to peaceful protests with rubber bullets, tear gas, and military tactics. A city that cares more about optics and solutions. I don't want to live in a city that treats our neighbors as threats instead of as people. As I close out my comment, let me make something clear to the council. This isn't a game. This isn't something to chat casually about or roll your eyes at in public and private. These are facts of life for so many of our community members. Um, thank you and please vote yes on the Blue Ribbon Commission. Thank you, Brenda. Good evening. Uh, first, I want to say thank you to everyone who is part of this and volunteering your time, as I know that it takes a lot of time to do anything and most of us don't have that. Um, I do want to say that this is much needed. Um, after experiencing um, this in my own community with David Tovar, who lived in an area where I live, and having to see the lies that they were giving to the community, that there was a man with a gun running around, which this man was already deceased. They had helicopters, and they were fear-mongering the community for a long time till 3 a.m. It was not okay. To see something like this and seeing that there is gonna be structure and accountability, I'm looking forward to see all the work of everyone, because this can't keep happening. We have to hold everyone accountable and we're still waiting for justice for David Tovar. Thank you, Paul. Uh, yeah, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. I'd like to formally submit my uh, application desire, however you want to put it, uh, to be on this panel. Uh, I, I mean, the, I'd like to mention a name that precedes George Floyd. And that is the name on behalf of the Chicano community, Danny Trevino. If you don't know who Danny Trevino is, then educate yourself around Chicanismo here in Sambo. And you'll know what we have contended with over five generations I've been dealing with that. And I am fully committed because I believe that Chief Mata is sincere in his desire to form that relationship with the community in order to ensure that safety communication and the effective administration of these policies that are gonna come down the pike are effective in the community so that we can have that relationship that has been broken and tentacled for generations. I'm fully committed. Sandra, welcome. Hi, good evening. My name is Sandra Asher and I'm a resident of District 10 in Almaden Valley. I also happen to be a board member of both Community Solutions and Parents Helping Parents and a member of Racial Equity and Community Safety at Sacred Heart. I'm also a person with a, a non-apparent disability as well as a mother to an autistic son. If public safety is a priority for you, then you should support the advisory committee led by community members, including those with disabilities and expand its budget. We consistently hear that SJPD is understaffed I propose that they are simply being spread too thin and asked to do too much. We need to divert calls for social issues, such as mental health and homelessness, and fund resources to support these marginalized residents. The possibilities to make significant change are out there. Cities like San Francisco, Oakland, Portland, New York, and Denver have already led the way. The question is, will the council vote for an advisory committee so that we may bring these possibilities to life for our city? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Robert, welcome. Great. We're expanding the membership to include uh, handicapped people, whether obvious or not. And it's great that we're bringing in people from neighborhood associations and, and other, or, other groups like that. But I don't see any representation for the unhoused. I don't see any, anything in here that says that we're going to bring in unhoused people to talk about how they are being singled out and how they are uh, constantly being uh, harassed and arrested and prosecuted uh, by the police department and the system that exists here. And I think it's a real shame that uh, I have to keep coming on here and asking for 
representation on so many different committees, so many different, uh, you know, panels or whatever, wherever it is, to get the voice of the unhoused to be heard for more than just a minute during a council meeting. And I'm, I'm really getting tired of the of this uh, going onward and, and people not recognizing that there's a large group of people that are not being represented and we need to have that voice of a, a, a unhoused or formerly unhoused person on this committee, please. Thank you, Mr. Gary. We'll come back to that issue, I'm certain of it. Uh, Molly McLeod. Hello, my name is Molly McLeod. I'm a person with a disability. My son had a non-apparent disability when he was tased and beaten by San Jose police. And um, that's something to know. People with hearing loss have been shot for non-complying with police orders. This is national. And there's a current lawsuit against SJPD about that. Police will stop one in five youth with autism before they reach 21. Um, people with untreated mental health conditions are 16 times more likely to be killed by in a police incident than someone without a disability. And um, when I hear that the disability was not specifically called out in terms of representation, but it is absolutely represented. Um, serious mental illness diagnosis, this is information from Santa Clara County, 44.3%, um, that's 1,109 people with severe mental illness in the jails. The Olmstead Act, that's 22 years ago decision to, today, says people should be treated in the, in the community receive care in the community. Thank you. Uh, Blair? Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Uh, thank you for the words of uh, previous speakers. Robert Aguirre offered some really interesting words. I think this uh, this is the uh, basically the Blue Ribbon uh, Reimagined Task Force ideas. Uh, thank you. Good luck how we all can do with this process. Uh, how can we make this a process that is a learning process of to lessen police, to invite more health and human services ideas to our community? And, you know, this is really important stuff. And then at the same time, ask and work towards um, the ideas of, 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 of reaching out to the community and lessons that could be really learned that are, are ideas of peace. And I think can really work to heal our entire community. How do we invite all parts of the community to this process? How can we all be learning about this process? Thank you. Good luck with this. Thank you, Peter. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, we can, Peter. Hello, Honorable Mayor and City Council. Uh, my name is Peter Ortiz, and I am the Vice President of the Santa Clara County Board of Education, and I currently also sit on the Reimagining Public Safety uh, Committee. Um, I'm just speaking uh, in support of the community recommendations to build more autonomy uh, for the commission. It's important that uh, the community has uh, more power and say so and how these discussions are uh, had. And um, uh, I hope that the city council can move forward in support of their proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Rachel, welcome. Hello, uh, my name is Rachel Kumar. I'm with Sacred Hearts Race, Equity, and Community Safety Committee. I'm also a homeowner in San Jose's District 9. When I think about the way my tax dollars are being spent, I want to see accountability, and I want to see results that really increase the safety in our neighborhoods and in our community. Uh, with When I see someone in my neighborhood with a mental distress and disorder, I don't want to see a police officer with a gun. And I don't think the police officers wanna be dealing with that situation. I want my money to go where we can prevent that and take care of our community. So with the amount of money and power we're giving to our police officers, we need to see better accountability, including the community. And they need to be empowered to enact alternatives that will actually increase community safety. I urge you to vote for the expanded advisory committee with better community input and expand their budget to enact real change. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Mayor Licardo and senior members of the City Council. My name is Nick Kawada, and I am the Policy Director for the Silicon Valley Council of Nonprofits, an entity that unifies and strengthens the voice of local community serving nonprofits in Santa Clara County. I speak to you today regarding the need to center community voices and community members with lived experiences in this process. Traditional roles of law enforcement have clearly not met the needs of BIPOC individuals and have perpetuated anti-Blackness sentiment throughout. 
Although challenging, we ask that the city cede its power in this area and to listen to those that are often unjustly targeted to better meet the needs of marginalized communities. Please support the proposal to create the advisory committee immediately. Thank you. Thank you. Chantal, welcome. Thank you. Hello, my name is Chantal Schaefer, and I'm a committee member of Sacred Hearts Race, Equity, and Community Safety Committee, and I live in San Jose's District 3. The pandemic has shown that San Jose residents continue to struggle with housing and wealth inequalities. And instead of investing in our public services for future generations of residents here in San Jose, you granted a 4% wage increase for the SGPT and continued to ignore community suggestions and input. We need you to advocate for more alternative public services that meet the residents' needs. And the first step would be to vote for the advisory committee with a budget of $1 million, which will support keeping people accountable for actions that threaten community safety and support the voices of the community. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Karen? Hello, my name is Karen and I'm a community member of Sacred Hearts Race, Equity and Community Safety Committee. Through the COVID-19 pandemic, we saw how multifaceted community safety is. It was through the dedication of healthcare workers, mental health professionals, housing assistance programs, and many more that we were able to make it through. With an issue so large, it is a logical conclusion that SJPD is not too thinly stuffed, but spread too thin. After all, to a hammer, everything looks like a nail. When our community came out to peacefully protest after the murder of George Floyd, we were treated with rubber bullets, tear gas, and military tactics on civilians. This is unacceptable. The residents of San Jose deserve a chance to help create better solutions. Vote yes for the advisory committee. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the person with the inscription Zoom user. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Welcome. Okay, thank you. Hi, my name is Adriana Chavez Lopez and I live in District 3. I'm an MFT intern and a member of San Jose Strong. Please vote yes on the Blue Ribbon community Committee. When our community came out to peacefully protest after the murder of George Floyd, we were treated with rubber bullets, tear gas, and military tactics on civilians. Our community members need to be prioritized, and that means being bold and investing in alternative public services that meet our needs. The residents of San Jose deserve a chance to help create better solutions. Vote yes for the Blue Ribbon Commission and a budget of $1 million so we can get this done together. The COVID-19 pandemic has shed light on the fact that we cannot let things continue as they were before. We have to invest in our public services for future generations of residents here in San Jose, like my three kids. We need to look towards mental health solution, relief to immediate human suffering by financing housing solutions for all of us. The possibilities to make significant change are out there. The question is, will the council vote for a blue ribbon commission so that we bring these possibilities to life? Thank you. Elizabeth, welcome. Elizabeth, your device appears to be muted. Got it. Oh, there you go, we got you. Everyone, um, Elizabeth, Race Equity and Community Safety Committee with Sacred Heart District 3. If you ask anyone, public safety is a top priority. Everyone wants to feel safe in their home. As a Black and Latina woman, I fear for my life that while experiencing a mental health crisis, I would be killed by the police because they are unable to properly handle these situations. This is the reality that folks of color, folks with mental illnesses and disabilities face each day. There's a disproportionate number of Black and Latinx folks who are homeless, living in poverty, and lacking appropriate resources. We know what is truly needed to assist members of our community. It is not an increase in excessive force or the police budget, but rather clinicians and social workers, folks trained in trauma-informed care, who can rise to the responsibility of truly protecting and serving our community. We need to reimagine community and system of government that is for us and by us and provide our community with real solutions. So if you want to make a community safe for everyone. If you want to combat racism and build a community in which we all thrive, support this advisory committee. Thank you. Thank you. Derek, welcome. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can, Derek. Excellent. Hello, my name is Derek, and I'm a staff organizer for Sacred Hearts Committee for Race, Equity, and Community Safety, or RECS for short. And I'm a resident of District 5. I'm calling in today to support 
uh, the Reimagined Public Safety Advisory Committee as proposed by the black and brown folks who made up the original task force. As a padrino of two beautiful brown children who are currently living in District 5, I just wanna say that what you decide today will affect their futures. As a friend of the Demetrius, family of Demetrius Stanley, who was killed by an SJPD officer in District 4, what you will decide today will affect how the leaders of this city are remembered. I'm calling on the council to make an investment to our children's futures. We don't have to make the same mistakes. We can make a better San Jose. Our residents are waiting on you. Will you hear, will you heed the call? Thank you. The person with the phone number ending 1367. Yes, this is Lillian from District 6. I'm calling because I uh, actually listened to the earlier program this morning um, with Chief Mata. And I have to tell you, if we don't go forward, we're going backward. Uh, the advisory committee has to entertain some new ideas and our shift in what I call shift of consciousness. Um, a lot of people come to San Jose, they think this is the, the Mecca, Silicon Valley. We're on the map more so than any other city in California. We have the opportunity to change our police state is what I actually see it as. Um, when the chief Mata talked today about half a million calls, I don't know if that was in a year or in a series of years for the um, police department, I found that unbelievable. Um, so we really do need to reimagine what public safety looks like. We need to understand that we've had a shift of consciousness from the rich to the poor to the middle class all over and San Jose is on the map and we need to. Thank you. Jala, forgive me if I mispronounce your name. Uh, it's Jayla, but thank you. Sorry, Jayla. No problem. Uh, so my name is Jayla and I'm a community member with Sacred Hearts Racial Equity and Community Safety Committee. Um, and I also live in District 3. Um, SJPD is getting almost 4% in wage increases, and it's not worth giving even more money to the police when this money might be better spent investing in public services that would actually keep us safe. Um, so instead of for funding more force, we need to invest in mental health solutions, financing housing, and more. The residents of San Jose deserve a chance to help create better remedies, which I feel that this advisory committee is an opportunity to do. So I would urge the city council to vote yes for this advisory committee and also a budget of $1 million. That way we can get this done together. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tamara? Hello, my name is Tamara Hall and I'm a special education teacher and a resident in District 3 in San Jose. I'm also a member of the Race, Equity and Community Safety Committee at Sacred Heart. I want everyone um, on the city council to think about what the police have been doing over the last 10 years. And has it really been in support of the black and brown communities? In my experience as an Afro-Latina, it, it hasn't. I cannot rely on the police. We need community oversight. It isn't affecting and helping us. And I believe that we need to reinvest our money into uh, organizations, into departments uh, that are run by the community, into um, small businesses that are supporting the community and making sure that we're supporting the unhoused population and other vulnerable groups like unhoused people, like students uh, with disabilities in schools and making sure that any mental health crisis not being seen with police officers who will then murder them, which has happened many times in the past. And we, you know, I know. Uh, Marco Antonio. Hi everyone. So I'd like to just say that with the idea with the, around the corner is coming Pride Month of the anniversary of the Stonewall riots. And I just want to say that Pride Month would not be started without blood, sweat and tears of normal people going out there and facing off against a militarized police force. So with that being said, I think the excuse and narrative, the thinly staffed, you know, kind of BS you always give us and everyone gives it to me, uh, seems more like an excuse, which leads to nowhere. So with that being said, you should really just support one of the things that someone has said before, before I came on, something, plant trees if you want to, 
do literally anything else um, is all I'm asking. I think that's all we're really asking. So excuses always lead to nowhere, and they are monuments to nothing. Adapt, survive, guys. Come on. Uh, Melissa, welcome. Hello, my name is Melissa Munoz, and I'm a resident of San Jose's District 9 and a member of Sacred Hearts Racial Equity and Community Safety Committee. Growing up in a Latinx family in San Jose, I have seen many of my family members be unfairly targeted by the police, especially the young men. I worry every day that an unfair targeting might very easily turn into a murder. We must reimagine public safety. We cannot continue to lose black and brown lives at the hands of the police. An advisory committee would help us push forward our vision of reimagining public safety. The time is now. In addition, because of the tremendous financial strain that the COVID-19 pandemic has caused so many of us, I cannot understand why SJPD would receive a 4% wage increase. We must prioritize investing in housing, mental health solutions, and other public services for our future, our future generations. Will the council vote for an advisory committee? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Latoya, welcome. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah, we can, Latoya. Okay, awesome. Good evening, Mayor and, and um, Council folk. Um, so I'm here uh, really encouraging you all to vote in our expanded community safety advisory board. As you can see, we have a great coalition of youth representing orgs. Um, and I think this is really important because youth have not been a part of this conversation in the past. And while we do have a youth commission in our city, it doesn't actually represent all of the diverse um, communities that we have here. And if you look at the organizations on there that represent the youth, they represent all the different cultural backgrounds, system impacted youth. And, um, and I think that is what's missing. And so I think having this expanded piece of this advisory board will include these youth voices and really make sure that they're helping make the decisions for our future San Jose, right? So I'm really encouraging y'all to, um, to vote this in um, and just make sure that our youth have a seat at the table. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Catherine, welcome. Uh, good, evening. good evening, Mayor Licardo and the council and representatives of SAPD. Um, I'm a member of Sacred Hearts um, and our Abe Listen Committee and we need to include the voice of people with disabilities and people from the unhoused com community, as Robert Geary was saying, um, both of these groups have disparate impact in how the police treat them. And we need to do something about that. And we should be spending our money on having social workers help people who need help instead of criminalizing their behavior. Thank you very much. Thank you. William, welcome. Uh, hello, Mayor and uh, Council Members. This is Will Armeline. I'm the Director of the Human Rights Institute at San Jose State University, uh, Criminal Justice Chair of the NAACP, uh, debug member, uh, uh, Sacred Heart Board member. Yeah, uh, many hats relevant to the conversation, I suppose. Um, we at the HRI uh, had the pleasure to, to do some work on this proposal draft. We were happy to do so, and we're happy to join the 70 organizations who signed on. Uh, and, and I think, as you can imagine, uh, I'm calling in to support um, uh, approval of the community uh, proposal and also appropriate funding for them to do the job that's in front of them. Uh, thank you very much, and I'll yield the rest of my time. Thanks, Bill. Um, next person is RK. Uh, Hello, my name is Rupini Kamat. I'm a community member here in support of the Blue Ribbon Commission. Uh, it's clear to the community that the SJP are not well suited to responding to public safety concerns without endangering residents or causing unacceptable loss of human life. I'm thinking in particular of the deaths of Dimitri Stanley, who is needlessly killed by plainclothes police officers who never identified themselves as police, as well as David Tovar, who was shot and killed within seconds of encountering the police, who further showed reckless disregard for human life by firing indiscriminately into nearby apartments. 
San Jose residents deserve better options for first responders than a police department that has chosen again and again to use harassment and violence over de-escalatory tactics when responding to crises in the community. Uh, please vote yes on this commission so we can work together to develop strategies of public safety that address root causes of violence instead of treating community members as threats to be eliminated. Thank you, Rachel. Go ahead. Oh, sorry about that. Hi, my name is Rachel Statton and uh, I'm a student at SDU as well as a community member with Sacred Hearts Race, Equity and Community Safety Committee. I live and have always lived in San Jose District 5 and the last two decades of my presence in the city have made some things exceedingly clear. And it is that committees like the Blue Ribbon Commission are absolutely the Blue Ribbon Commission are absolutely necessary. With friends and family who have been affected by police violence and feeling unsafe in their own homes and communities, I am more than concerned by the rhetoric that is often promoted in the city. Consistently investing in police is not getting us anywhere, and is historically going to continue to promote more and more violence. It is time to put our community members first, and especially ensure that the voices of the underrepresented in the city are heard, acknowledged, and that change actually happens. The residents of San Jose deserve a chance to help create better solutions. Please vote yes for the Blue Ribbon Commission, as well as the $1 million budget to start working towards actual change that address the root causes of these violence, uh, this violence. Thank you so much. Thank you. Sparky? Hi, Sparky Harlan, CEO of Bill Wilson Center. And I was originally appointed to the Reimagining Community Safety Committee of San Jose. And I must say, I missed the meeting when everybody quit. And when I went back to listen to it, frankly, it made me really heart sick. This committee was not supposed to be formed for every opinion in the world to respond to how they feel about police, but community members who really felt they had no voice to talk about what community safety meant to them. This alternative that's being proposed by community members really was a thoughtful process involving the people who really need to have a say on how they would reimagine community safety for their community. I urge you to support this in addition to the Youth Council, because they also need a voice. Thank you. Thank you. Veronica? Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, and Mayor Ricardo. My name is Veronica Guzman, and I'm the founder of Yo Soy Tu Voz Parent Group. Um, these uh, parents have children with disability and mental health illness. Um, I'm also an activist and when it comes to mental health. I, I'm not gonna you know, repeat what everybody else said. I'm sure you got the message, but I'm here to tell you that today was, was a historic day for our community with disability. I was the, um, the, board, the County Board of Supervisors approved a proposal for the disability, Office of Disability Affair. I will just hope that you will do the same thing. Our community needs to feel safe. I cannot tell you how scary my parents are for their children to be just come across a police officers and their fear on, on their uh, conversations. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Yeah, hi, my name is Liz Finney. I am a uh, staff organizer with the Sacred Hearts Race Equity and Community Safety Committee. And I don't really have a lot more to add to what other people have said. I do think that there's a serious lack of police oversight in our community and that we really need to take this um, new advisory committee seriously. Um, if we really want people to feel safe in their communities, which I do, I don't know if I said that I live in District 3, but living downtown, um, you see a lot of the disparities and you see a lot of these situations of unsafety for people. And so I really, really urge council to um, vote yes for this advisory committee and expand the budget so that we can actually tackle these issues in a real meaningful, tangible way. Thank you. Thank you, Tina. Hello, my name, uh, okay, here we go. Hello, my name is Tina and I'm a homeowner in District 9. I'm a software engineer and a volunteer member of Sacred Hearts Rex Group. Okay, so we live in Silicon Valley. The entire world knows who we are. We are leaders, we are entrepreneurs. We house people who own multi-million dollar homes. We change the world. 
Our city needs to do the same. Our city needs to lead. I feel we need to move forward with the Blue Ribbon Committee and reimagine public safety and be the world leaders that we are. Thank you. Thank you, Tina. Thank, thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, I wanna thank all the members of the community who came out to speak uh, and uh, also to roll up their hands, uh, roll up their sleeves rather, to, to work uh, with us and with, with each other. Um, I support uh, the Hispanic Advisory Committee. Um, I appreciate many of the staff modifications, including the addition of the six uh, seats uh, representing um, neighborhoods that are uh, either heavily gang impacted or Project Hope for neighborhoods. I think that's a, a great addition. Um, I, I heard several members of the community uh, expressed desire to see uh, particular individuals or groups that are well represented on this. Um, I know I heard Robert Aguirre mention the unhoused. I know Bill Wilson Center is on attachment B and I expect uh, others will be heeding the call for ensuring we have representation for the unhoused. I also appreciate the concern expressed about having um, someone who can represent concerns for those suffering from mental illness. Uh, and that community should also be represented. So I, I hear very clearly and I expect the community organizations are also hearing this. Um, I, I would, just a recommendation and I'll move on to my colleagues, uh, but that uh, I hope that outreach in addition to all the other organizations that were mentioned, it wasn't explicitly mentioned, but I know it was implicit uh, and I hope it will be made explicit, which is neighborhood organizations, neighborhood leaders. I think that's, you know, they offer a very important voice. And I certainly hope they will be part of the outreach very explicitly. And I, the last opinion I'll offer, and then I'll, I'll, I'll stop, which is, I don't think eight months is going to be enough. Uh, I suspect this is going to go longer unless um, the leadership of this advisory committee uh, really narrows the scope and focus to the highest priority items. Um, it may be one of those things where perhaps the highest priority items are taken in a phase one, uh, and then the committee can decide what to do next. But I am, I am a little concerned that there is an effort to uh, to boil an ocean. Uh, there's a lot of issues to take on here uh, with great breadth, um, and uh, I would want to ensure everybody goes into it with either clear expectations or a scope that's appropriate for the time. So I, I just offer that as a, a consideration for folks to think as they think about it as they're moving forward. Uh, I just saw a hand go up in that among the public. Um, Jessica Mencius. Welcome, Jessica. Hi, hi, I'm, hi. Sorry, I'm using my wife's computer. My name, my name is Melissa Santos, and I'm a long life, a lifelong uh, member of the community, uh, just specifically District Five. Um, San Jose has uh, has given my family everything, yet we feel uh, fearful and have anxiety because my brother has development disability is targeted day, uh, by the SJ police time and time again. Um, we, we often uh, worry we will receive a call that our, that my brother is a victim of SJ police. Um, our family just really hopes that police reform happens soon rather than later. Thank you. I yield my time. Thank you. Uh, Rebecca? Good evening, Mayor, Council Members. Uh, Rebecca Armendares with Silicon Valley Rising. And we are calling in support of the uh, Blue Ribbon Committee and ask that you give it adequate funding to do the work that needs to be done. Um, we've seen other models, um, independent police auditors, things like that in our community before. And unfortunately, it's not working. So we hope that this model with um, substantial community input uh, that is diverse and representative of all 
uh, folks from different sectors of our community, especially those who are impacted by police violence and abuse, um, will we'll make the impact needed to save lives and restore trust. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tessa is, is followed by Brian. That'll be our last speaker and then we'll return to Kelly. Oh, okay. Um, are you there? You can hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Well, thank you for taking um, my call. And um, it looks like, which I appreciate that you posted what you're talking about right now about the Berryessa, even though people are talking about police. So anyway, I'm just seeing the post and it's saying that we're talking about the Berryessa rezoning. Uh, and no, no, that's that's uh, that's an error. That's, uh, that's we're an not error? talking about Berryessa. No? Oh, well, no, that's what not. I see on the screen. Anyway, so, you need to fix that because that's what's that's what's to yeah, we're on the police and, reforms work plan. Okay, please reform. All right, fine. Thank you, sweetie. Thank you so much. Well, yeah, I, I definitely think we need a lot of police reform. And um, I don't think we're getting that. I, I see that, you know, the police are making the highest salaries. Deb Davis is walking around to say, you know, let's bring them to the, the, the corporations and support the corporations. I think the police need to really be. Okay, uh, Brian? Yes, I, I have a unique, well, I don't know if it's unique nowadays, but um, I come from a background where at least uh, in my the, the city I was in, because of trouble that was going on, we would have the police actually parked outside our uh, uh, house or parked outside our court. When we would drive off, they'd pull us over for a ticket. Usually when I was pulled over, it was um, easily an hour. They would check everything they could, look around, search the car. And I was raised, you never argue with a policeman. And when I grew up, that was amen to that because you will suffer for it. On the other side, these uh, ladies and gentlemen of the police force walk around with a ticket on their back or a target on their back and they make a lot of money because honestly they go until like 50, 55 at best and their bodies are sworn out from all the physical aggression and stuff they've had to deal with. It is not an easy thing to do on both sides. And I just wish there was a better answer at times. This is the best we have though. Thank you, Brian. Okay, returning to the council, I want to thank uh, Angel uh, and everybody on the team, uh, Peter and everyone who's worked so hard uh, to uh, help the shepherd uh, the city's work on this effort. Uh, I certainly want to thank um, uh, the, the team at San Jose PD as well. Uh, I know that there are those who believe that they should not be at the table. I believe strongly they should be. Uh, they're important members of our community and they have an insight that's absolutely worth hearing as well. Uh, I uh, want to also thank uh, my colleagues, particularly Council Members Bross and uh, Vice Mayor Jones, uh, for your work on this. And we'll go to those two gentlemen next. Council Member Bross. Yeah, thank you very much, Mayor. Um, and I, I echo uh, your appreciation and thanks of our community members that uh, participated with us today uh, and through the process as well ever since uh, this conversation began last year uh, as well to our, our city staff uh, Angel for your leadership um, and to the panelists uh, that are with us today Boncho, Mika and Jamal and to uh, all the participants uh, who have been engaged with us through throughout this process uh, I personally feel it's much more important to get this work done right rather than to try and do so too fast or without adequate uh, participation. And so I'm, I'm happy that no one uh, was, was too proud to try and salvage what we had established uh, and that we decided to reset and ultimately get here with this opportunity that we have uh, today. Last month, we had people walking away from the process um, and, uh, and now I'm happy to see where, where we're at today. Uh, and so there's there's certainly a lot of uh, a lot of thanks uh, for the work that that's gone in over this past month. Uh, thank you, Poncho, as well for referencing the the memo that I had drafted, uh, which was unanimously accepted last June, um, that asked us to not only create a process on reviewing use of force use of force policies, but to also create a process that uh, broadly engages our community on what the future of policing should look like here in San Jose. And and I do think that we're uh, we're, we're now going down that, that path uh, to achieve that, um, I would agree. Uh, some of the comments, and I know the mayor addressed this already, um, but I do see the unhoused uh, listed uh, twice actually on the list from the coalition, which is the uh, destination home 
and uh, the Bill Wilson Center. Uh, I'm assuming maybe an adult representative and then a youth. Um, so I do see that and I appreciate that. Um, and as well as uh, from the mental uh, health or mental illness uh, a, a position from the Behavioral Health Contractors Association. So I do see that as well. And then from the disabled community, um, and that's uh, with parents helping parents. So I, I do see those listed there and, and I appreciate uh, that those are included. I, I, you know, I think there could be a lot of interest from individuals that, that, that may wanna participate. I do think though that this, um, the list that was created here really has captured um, the, the different uh, communities that we would want to represent. And, uh, and from the feedback that we've heard today, I think maybe some people might not have noticed uh, or seen what, what those titles were there to represent. And so I wanted to just make sure that that was clear. Um, and then uh, additionally, I have some questions for our panelists here. Uh, take advantage of the fact that you've, you've joined us uh, to engage with us. And uh, there are a number of suggested changes that our staff uh, have made from your original proposal. And I'd like to get your feedback. Um, and I welcome uh, any one of you to, to, to speak or all three of you if you'd like. Uh, and then specifically, I'd, I'd like to hear your, your input on uh, the six additional neighborhood positions, um, that, which I, I believe would, would, would make it to, um, to maybe eight overall, if, uh, if we're counting in the, uh, the two neighborhood commission spots. Um, and then uh, the youth involvement, how we've um, how we have, have shifted from what your proposal was, and then the timeline. Um, and I think you heard the mayor uh, speak to that as well on, on some of those. But I'd like to get your opinion on specifically those th those three. So uh, so thank you, Councilmember Perales, and uh, I, I want to make sure that um, that uh, Jamal and Mika are also able to weigh in. But but just to start with this. Um, Number one, actually, we feel like there is a tremendous, like most of the changes or most of the recommendations that helped uh, helped elaborate a little bit more about what, what the scope of work could be and some of the other things were really, really helpful. Being able to look at the timeline that's not looking at a six month, These were, this was a proposal that was made with suggestions for how we'd like to approach it with, with, that, with that focus. Sometimes when you create a goal that says we're going to get it done in a year, it'll take two. So saying, you know, we should have been working on this a year ago and we need to be moving forward with this is really, really important. So having an aggressive timeline we think is really important, but actually doing it well is, is also really important to us. In terms of the specific uh, changes, we, when we were in, in initial conversations around neighborhood representation, we know that our organizations are embedded in neighborhoods, are actually part of neighborhoods. And the organizations that are there and people that have lived experience working with these things are deeply, deeply connected in neighborhoods. And so any suggestion that, that these neighborhoods are not represented by the, by the coalition of organizations is a little bit ridiculous. But we do understand that there is neighborhood representation. Therefore, we added um, similar to what was in the advisory group process where there are two representatives on a 44 member group. Um, there were two representatives, one from the neighborhood commission, one from a specific neighborhood association. We, uh, we, we initially uh, didn't include that because we were trying to offer some things, but we said, yeah, we, we could add those. And now we have a suggestion to add uh, uh, six more, which feels a little bit um, unweighted, but I think there is an opportunity for us to be able to incorporate and in making sure that these that, that these project uh, hope um, neighborhoods in particular are um, are represented through these organizations and you know the idea of like a twofer you know um, you know folks that represent various constituencies would be represented because we actually think that a smaller group um, with the tighter focus and being able to make sure that happens, but moreover. The idea of these engagement teams that are represented in our proposal are really about making sure we're surfacing all these neighborhood voices, making sure that we're getting those to the table, that we're doing active outreach, we're making sure that we're surveying and talking to folks. Um, and, and I think that approach applies to every one of these sub constituencies. The folks that were identified are not here to represent that neighborhood or that or, or just that neighborhood or just that organization. They're taking responsibility. They're going to have to take responsibility for developing an entire engagement strategy to reach out to these constituencies, make sure they're well represented, and that we're actually surfacing their voices. So I've been texting with, uh, you know, with Robert uh, Robert Aguirre, one of our you know great leaders that's been working on uh, on the unhoused, and we want to make sure that we're able to not just have someone on this on this uh, on this advisory you know committee 
talking about and representing these issues, but, but we have an entire strategy around making sure that every one of these subgroups are identified are really, really, you know, are really, really present. So, um, so with that, um, I, I, I'll, I'll leave it, I'll leave it there. Um, I think the last thing in terms of the, the youth uh, council, I had a conversation earlier today with, uh, you know, with um, Angel, and I think it was kind of our mutual uh, desire to make sure that what Latoya um, mentioned in the public comments is that there is a space for youth to be able to focus in on that. So that's one difference between the proposal, I, I, and, and I know it wasn't highlighted very much in terms of what Angel uh, presented, but I think the idea of actually having a space that's curated by and led by and developing recommendations that are really that are really key for youth to be able to make that happen. And it is the desire of everyone to support youth and being able to uh, make sure that happens, but not just jamming some token youth on a larger body, but creating a space that's really by and for them. And I think that's a completely workable solution. I would just like to share that um, I absolutely am in consensus with everything uh, Pancho said. Uh, sorry, my apologies. Um, how's everybody doing tonight? Thank you all for having me here. Uh, I, I want you all to look past, look slightly past just the names of the organizations and think about the, the way that the, the people who will be representing those intersections, those, those organizations intersect with neighborhoods, intersect with disability, intersect with homelessness and housing challenges. And, and, and yes, there are those, uh, the, there's that column at the end that highlights this organization works on this specifically. But as we know, as humans, as people, we experience many different things and, and live through and, and, and are part of many different communities. And that is the hope that through these 27 spots, there will absolutely be six people that represent our neighborhoods. There will be multiple people that represent these neighborhoods. And so if we just look at this very linear, we'll miss how the, the, the organizations who do the work in the communities will, 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 will choose people who represent the, the community and the voice that we are, are, are saying is necessary. Um, and, and we had a meeting uh, with, to, to help to put this proposal together. And that was where the youth council um, idea came about because we recognized, and it was Latoya who, who challenged us to say like, if you were 15, 16, 18, 12, going through real challenges with police, would you feel comfortable speaking out in this space? And the answer is absolutely not. Right, maybe one or two, but would your voice be heard? Would your con concerns be heard? And would they be would they be um, validated? We know that that's necessary, and we know that our youth and the uh, members of the com the committee will represent the neighborhood. And I think adding six more spots to a twenty seven person committee feels a uh, uh, a bit over over overdone. So. Thank you. And just uh, for reference, we're, we're hitting the 10 minutes. Uh, the mayor's going to cut me off after this. Um, but uh, I'd like to hear from, from Mika as well, if that's all right, Mayor, and then I can wrap up and, and, and raise my hand again. Thank you, and I'll be, I'll be quick. First, of course, thanks for uh, welcoming me here uh, and the organizations that I'm representing. Uh, I am a San Jose resident, and my children go to school here in San Jose. I think it's important to, to say up front. With respect to the, um, the overall question, uh, you know, obviously, um, the, the, uh, the in initial expression of, of resignation was that we wanted to be autonomous uh, and we wanted a community-led process. But I want to I want to say that since then we have worked collaboratively with Angel and uh, and his team. And so uh, what you're what you're hearing about today is is work product that is collaborative. And so generally, we find these. Uh, recommendations as constructive um, and adding and, uh, and in support of our proposal. I will echo uh, the sentiments of my uh, my friends who've already spoken, and and I would only add, you know, um, that that um, the efficacy and speed is really important, and and this neighborhood uh, addition seems to be somewhat of a solution without a problem. Um, I do think for the reasons that have been stated, we already have the kind of representation uh, that is being urged with respect to um, neighborhoods. Um, and so I, I think if, if 
the council would like to urge that each organization consider the importance of neighborhood representation in making their appointment. Um, that would uh, that would achieve the same end and it would fall within the spirit of the recommendation. Um, but I don't think that we need to have a separate process outside of an autonomous advisory group uh, to have a selection process and application process for neighborhood participants. Um, the youth council, you know, uh, one of the, uh, with respect to point number two, the youth council, one of the commenters tonight said uh, that this process is really a shift in consciousness. And even the word reimagining is quite bold. And so I think that, that, um, that it is worth thinking uh, of doing something dramatically different and putting together a youth council with independent processes and opportunities to speak for themselves to have authentic conversation and dialogue and have that memorialized in a final report and recommendations is bold, is reimagining our commitment to the youth and giving them a seat at the table in a way that hasn't been done in this space before. Uh, and that's why we should we should do that. Um, and, and third, with respect to um, to point number three, the timeline. Thank you, uh, Mayor Licardo, for, for wanting to be attentive to uh, doing this correctly. Um, th and, I, and I don't necessarily uh, take issue with that, but I would say two things. One, uh, I really want to emphasize the issues we're discussing are urgent. Uh, the, the persons who feel uh, the, the weight of, of, of the issues that we're discussing uh, feel them every single day uh, in our community. And these are extremely urgent issues to each of them, and they should be uh, to all of us. And so if we are going to extend the timeline, which I, which I do think is a reasonable consideration, we should also leave the space for some midstream opportunity for action. And what I mean by that is, can we make recommendations at the six month part, uh, uh, six month point, uh, or for an eight month point, however we divide it up, quarters, half, whatever. Um, and so I think in that way, we can do both. Thank you for uh, entertaining my Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, I'd like to summarize a, a motion, uh, Mayor, and, and incorporate some of what, what we've heard on, on some of the feedback here. And I would have spoken a little longer, but recognizing the time, I'll, I'll, I'll summarize that into a motion here. Um, and so uh, I, myself, uh, Vice Mayor Jones and the mayor have issued a memo. So I'd like to, to incorporate that first um, and then make uh, a couple amendments to the staff uh, recommendation. Um, number one in the neighborhood, uh, the new neighborhood positions is six total. I would agree that we could likely get people that wear two hats and I'd like to actually strive to do that. So I'd like to ask that out of the 27 individuals that we, we identify who of their you know, could actually wear a, also a secondary hat of one of these gang hotspots, and that we add no more than two neighborhood positions that would allow uh, specifically gang hotspot areas throughout the city to be identified by staff and uh, and fill in uh, maybe areas that we can't achieve through um, through the 27 member body, and that way it, it, it could keep it still reasonable. Um, and I'm doing this just to make a motion. I understand the rest of my colleagues are going to have input, so it may change with their with their input, but I want to be able to summarize a motion. Uh, number two, within the youth involvement, I would agree. Um, the, the times in my life when I had uh, what you would call negative interactions with police officers, I was under 18. Um, and, and the youth that, that are going to be engaged are not going to, I think, be as um, as fruitful or is able to be fruitful in a body like this, I would agree with those comments that it is important that we try to find uh, a better space. And that doesn't mean it has to duplicate this entire effort and, and you know mimic exactly the same number of meetings. But I do think we need a, a real solid space for our youth that may be a little bit more robust than what uh, staff has proposed in their memo. So I'd like to see if we can beef, th beef that up a little bit. And I'll ask uh, Angel and his staff to, to go back and just see how we can how we can actually add a little bit more of that youth voice uh, to, to this component. And then uh, lastly, on the timeline, um, I agree with the mayor that this is likely going to take a lot longer. But I think what we should strive for is that once we get everybody identified, let's say that we're not going to count start the clock until we sort of have the first meeting, if you will. I, I would like to see if we can hit six months after we get the first meeting going and then achieve an initial set of recommendations, whatever it may be, right? That way we know that we're going to get something out of it after six months. And I would agree there's probably going to be another phase of this, right? And it's going to be ongoing, but at least we know that we have a deadline we're aiming for that's going to be, uh, you know, keep people moving ahead. So those are my, my three additions in those areas. Um, and that's the motion. Thanks. Second. Thank you. There's a motion and a second. Uh, Vice Mayor. 
Thank you, Mayor, and uh, thank you, Pancho, Pancho and Jamal and, and Mika, and especially Angel. Um, you got a tough job. You've um, been able to keep this process moving forward. But uh, I especially want to acknowledge the, the members who uh, had their objections, raised their objections, walked away from the process, but then came back. I'm a firm believer of the adage that, you know, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And you guys are back at the table and you're gonna be able to, to make a contribution to move this process forward. Uh, I did have some concerns and um, I worked with Angel and he kept me updated in terms of the process and the progress that he was making working with you and your group uh, about managing both the, uh, reform and reforming policing versus reimagining community safety. And the concern that I had was that police reform was gonna take a prominent position and overshadow and push out the conversation and the dialogue and, and the progress of reimagining community safety. So my question to any, uh, any of you, uh, I'll start out with Jamal. My question to you, Jamal, is what strategies do we have or do you have that you can manage both those two objectives and those, those two goals, even though, even though I know they overlap somewhat, but yet at the end of the day, they are two relatively distinct objectives. How are you going to manage that process to make sure that, that they both get equal attention? Appreciate that. Thanks for starting with, starting with me. I feel special. Um, you know, I think we have some amazing people in our community who will be able to help facilitate this process along. We felt it was a real disservice that y'all initially took that out and y'all being whoever created that first process we were part of. And that was a disservice, right? You all were having us just focus on community safety while we know police have been harming our communities for a long time and you didn't wanna allow us to talk about that, which is why, part of the reason why we left. Um, I believe that we have some very special, uh, amazing, amazingly talented people doing work in this community who can help facilitate a process that the community wants to have. They want to talk about what public safety looks like from, from uh, responding to mental health crises to, 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 to uh, unhoused, unhoused issues, to traffic lights and, and potholes. But we also want to make sure that if, if police are gonna continue to be out on our streets, how do we ensure that our lives are safe? And it's not through what's been happening. And it's not through adding more police. And it's not through the same rhetoric that we continue to get. And, and, and we've already developed a, a, a skeleton of how we can move both processes along uh, in parallel. Uh, so we're not starting from ground zero here. We've actually been thinking about this for a long time. And so, and, and, and again, the talent and the people who do facilitation um, and, 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 and planning for their organizations on a continual basis, continual basis are all, all represented in this, in this collective uh, proposal. And we're gonna ensure that the process, uh, whenever we get those consultants flows in that, in that same manner. So thank you again. Thank you. Mika, Pancho, I don't know if, uh, wanna tackle that one? I mean, I, th I think the only thing I'd add is that, that the steering committee is going to take a lot of responsibility for making sure that we're, we're getting these voices represented in, in that mix. And so I think what you're looking at is tremendous amount of expertise, you know, both from people that with lived experience that have actually been impacted by these systems, being at the table and being able to help frame the conversation and make, making sure it keeps rolling, but also folks that are really, that are really dedicated to try to make sure that we're able to balance things out. To the, but to your original you know, point around being overshadowed by, by these things, the, the truth is, um, I think a lot of the energy is really looking at alternatives and making our community safer in the first place. But I think um, there, there was a huge area of emphasis to make sure that we are able to balance out 
um, at being able to make sure that we're living in the world as it is, and that means we need to make reforms happen, but it will not, I, I do not believe it will overshadow, but separating them would actually be doing a disservice because they are interrelated. Being able to try to make um, some really effective work happen is, is, is something that we're all dedicated to making sure occur. Thanks. And the only, and I'll just briefly add, you know, because because I think the backdrop of this question is is uh, bifurcation, um, and and I and I think that the that the issue isn't that um, one process will overshadow another, uh, but rather that one process will enrich and nourish the other. We're talking about comprehensive services and systems, and sometimes in order to know and understand the need in one area, we've got to identify the problems and potential uh, areas for reform in another area. And in that way, it's critical that these things are done together and that there's transparency and communication during the process. Again, as I said earlier, efficacy and speed are critical. And I think thinking about this in comprehensive systemic terms uh, is the best way to go. And, and, um, and, and um, I'm confident that uh, it will be best for each pathway um, and, and, and that our community partners won't prioritize one or the, over the other. Um, and so I just wanted to add that, um, that I think the, the real answer is that um, they will benefit each other, not. Uh, you put yourself on uh, mute, Mika. Uh, were you done? Yes. <laughs> you muted yourself. Oh, okay. Um, so, so thank That's you. my signal. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, so, so thank you for the, for that feedback. Um, in the motion, uh, part of the memo is uh, for um, staff to come back in September, where we could do a check in and an evaluation. I have uh, all the confidence in the world that you know it won't be an issue. But as been stated earlier, there's a lot that you have on your plate. This is a very involved and complex uh, undertaking. Uh, it's gonna go well past six months. I have no doubt about that. And uh, we, we should have these check-ins just to make sure that everybody is in alignment with the progress in the strategy. But I, I thank you for um, you know, everything that you're doing and I'm looking forward to a very thoughtful and actionable outcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Foley. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Angel, for the uh, presentation. And thank you for all the community members who were here who spoke on behalf of this work, encouraging us to support them. And, and I intend to. And thank you, Jamal, Poncho, and Mika for your uh, balance and expertise and for bringing this back to the table. I'm really happy to see that we are discussing this again and that we are able to bring the efforts to reimagine public safety and community safety in a different way. Um, I was a little concerned when it fell apart a couple of months ago, so I'm really glad that you, you are coming back to the table and we're coming back to the table and discussing a better way to create real change within the city of San Jose. But we must do so with thoughtfulness, effectiveness, mutual respect, honesty, and integrity. Um, one I, I have a couple of questions and mostly they're around the youth voice. I, I really liked the coalition's idea about the youth council. I think it is extremely important to get our youth voices heard. So if they are not council members, and I understand the reason for that, there's a, in uh, Angel, in, in your memo, you articulated how many meetings they would be. And frankly, uh, teenagers don't have that kind of time to devote to maybe four meetings a month to, to this activity, although they may have, uh, be very passionate about contributing to an outreach or a town hall or a community meeting of some sort. So can someone, maybe Jamal, Jamal or Paul, because Jamal, you seem really passionate about the, vo the youth voice. Whoever is most passionate about the youth voice, how do you see, how do you envision 
us reaching out, embracing, listening, encouraging input from them. Again, uh, thank you, Council Member. We, we really do have some, some special people already working with our youth on a continual basis. Uh, Ujima, uh, Adult Family Services, has a youth group that they meet with weekly. <laughs> and, and, and there's so many other, other organizations as we have listed, Fly, and, and Hero Tent. And youth doesn't just extend to you know, high school age. We have commu community college a, uh, students, so, so 18 to 24, um, that, are, that are continually working in our organizations uh, uh, with Sacred Heart, um, with Youth Hype, with so many. And these are already concerns that have been brought to the table. They're not, they're not brand new. Uh, conversations and our conversations that are that have already been happening in many different facets with debug and and, and so many different other spaces so uh, outreach will have to begin through those organizations that we that we listed but we're confident that there are people already ready to to commit now again as we were putting the proposal together and working with the city um, the, the, there are there is room to tweak you know, like we said if, if uh, you throw out four meetings a month. That could be a lot. We could switch back to two. Um, uh, or, or maybe there are four meetings and, you know, the expectation is people, people come to two. Um, but we still have some, some room to wiggle with there. But I, I'm, I'm actually not concerned at all about getting the, the, the voices of our youth because we hear uh, their voice all the time and we just want to make sure it's centered. And, and council member, if, if I could, I, I think it's important for me to clarify our, our recommendation because I want to be very clear that we are not recommending against the establishment of a youth advisory council. In fact, we support it 100 um, percent. And, you know, Poncho Jabal and I have had this conversation you know, earlier today. The, the, what, what was really driving our recommendation was that you, we, we felt that, that the coalition can get to the same end result and establish a youth advisory council without having it be subject to the Brown Act and all the noticing red tape associated with running a public meeting because if this is a separate advisory group appointed by the council, then it is gonna be subject to Brown Act and that's not a bad thing. However, uh, what we know about youth is that if say they wanted to have an impromptu meeting and there's an, say there's an issue that, that, that happens tonight and they wanna to meet tomorrow, the last thing they want to hear is, oh, you got to post, you know, you got to, you know, get minutes, you got to. So what we're trying to do is actually make it easier uh, for that work. And we, and our recommendation is rooted in, this could be a, uh, an advisory council that does exactly what they propose, but just not subject to Brown Act. And it was kind of a work around that. But uh, as, as Poncho and Jabal and I discussed earlier, you know, if, if, if the preference is to go that route and still abide by, you know, uh, and, and again, I'm not suggesting that we should always be circumventing Brown Act by any means, but I do know, you know, just knowing how the Youth Commission has operated, that was really the premise behind why we established Youth Advisory Councils with the Youth Commission, so that youth had that latitude to meet whenever they wanted to on their terms. And so that's really the spirit behind it. So I, I, I do feel I need to clarify that because by no means is anybody on city staff uh, recommending against the establishment of the Youth Advisory Council. We, we support it. If they wanna meet 20 times, I say let them meet 20 times, but we're just trying to make it easier for them to cut red tape. Great, thank you. Pancho, did you wanna say something? Yeah, I'll, I'll just say that I think, I think the idea, and this is something I wanna give uh, you know, big shout out to so many folks in the coalition that have been involved and Latoya helped really frame this kind of conversation. You had members at the very first meeting saying, this is, this is an issue that affects youth. We need to, you know, like half of this group, like we're, half of this group should be young people because they're the ones that are experiencing, you know, a lot of, a lot of these difficult situations as, as uh, council member Perales like mentioned. Um, but instead of saying like, let's jam some people into some spots, there needs to be a group that that's self-governed and and let's not sell young people short in terms of what they can what, what they can do and how they can measure up to it. There are so many young people that have incredible leadership skills. Uh, we have folks, you know, involved in the uh, uh, racial equity and community safety committee at Sacred Heart that are you know young people in high school and you know in college and others that are are ready to step up. They lead meetings now. They lead it all the time. Let's not let's not sell people short. Uh, but I appreciate where Angel is coming from. But we think that it should be on par and be able to have its own process, be able to do it. 
scheduling it's not four meetings a month it's two meetings a month that, that were, were recommended if they don't need two meetings if they need to be able to do subcommittees and organize themselves or working groups or outreach teams those are things that they can also do that aren't that aren't necessarily required but having that process that's parallel and powerful is something that i think would be a, a tremendous message for the city to send to our young young people i i could not agree more as a mom of a 24 year old it is so powerful to listen to what young people have to say when debating really key issues and and this is the most important issue that we're facing today police reform is hugely important and it's not just to faces of color but also to my white daughter is very incensed about the way George Floyd was murdered and all that evolved around that. So I listen to her when she has uh, strong opinions, which she always does. I, I listen to her and sometimes she'll say and accuse me of not understanding and listen to, listening to where she comes from. But I truly listen to the voice of the youth because they have that lived experience that I don't. They come from a much different world than I do. They're, I'm, I'm a lot older and been through a lot of different things, but not in the way that they're looking at life today. So it's really, really important for us to hear the youth voice. And so I'm so glad to hear that uh, the efforts are not to marginalize them at all, but to really expand their voice and reach out to them as much as possible. So I really want to applaud you for that. That's really, really critical. I just have one other question, and it's probably a question for Angel. Um, and that is uh, several people who called in called about budget, and they mentioned a million dollar price tag, but I don't see a million dollar price tag on your proposal. I, pre I what So what's the financial implication of the process. It just looks like a consultant and then additional staff time. Yeah, yeah. As as we've as we've been meeting with the group and and you know we we use the RFP that we put out um, for the for the initial process as kind of a barometer uh, framework. Uh, what we came up with was a budget of a hundred to one hundred and twenty five thousand dollars for a consultant and uh, or any non personal type uh, expenses, plus the addition of a uh, of a temp U employee, a staff tech employee that, um, that would be able to provide meeting support and help navigate through the Brown Act uh, and uh, Brown Act compliance and all. Um, uh, so that would be kind of the dotted line uh, in terms of support from the city. And of course, as, as I hope you're hearing today, you know, there's, you know, the, the, the conversations around really centering this work around how do we, you know, all come to the table and, really with the focus of, of enhancing safety in our community uh, for, for all our residents is really kind of, you know, um, is, is really the, the end outcome of all this. Uh, th that's what we've kind of come up with in terms of a budget proposal. Um, I've heard, uh, you know, several, you know, concerns about, you know, timeline. I'm sure that if this work gets, ends up evolving to a broader scope or more scope, then you know I'm sure that's going to trigger the need for additional financial assistance. But back to Councilmember Prelice's idea, uh, you know, uh, you know, comment, you know, perhaps you know, as we do these check-ins, as Vice Mayor Jones has has uh, requested, and um, you know, I think we can also check in in terms of you know how the budget is doing, uh, and then come back to you with a recommendation on that if that's uh, if that's necessary. Oh, okay. Thank you. So uh, I'll, I'll just close up by saying that this is really, really important work. And while it is really important to get it right, it is important to do it quickly. I'm going to argue with my count, fellow council colleagues a little bit. And that is because we cannot afford to lose one more life to violence, to a, uh, a, uh, an autistic child who is unresponsive when a police officer comes their direction. We, we cannot afford that anymore. So time is of the essence. We must be thoughtful. We must be effective. But we cannot afford to lose any more lives. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Davis. 
Thank you. I want to thank Jamal and Mika and Boncho for coming this evening and for putting bringing forward this um, proposal. I think it's given us a, a, a lot more to talk about than than we would have had this evening. <laughs> Um, sorry, I got distracted by the cat for a second. Um, I just, I just have one, and I'm very thankful to my colleagues who have been much more engaged on this issue since they're on the the public safety committee, and and have Project Hope sites and and um, other things in their districts. I just wanted to ask, um, in looking at the list. I see uh, LGBTQ youth space on the list of nominating organizations. I didn't see the Billy DeFrank Center on there. And I know the Billy DeFrank Center has been um, the, the community center for the LGBTQ plus community. And I, their board is very active. So I would, I would like to have them be added to this because they're, they're not just focused on LGBTQ youth, but on all ages of LGBTQ um, community. And so I, that, that's the one um, thing when I, one organization, when I was looking on here about whose voice might not be um, represented that I, that I thought was missing. So I'd, I'd like to, to request that that um, group be added. I'm personally comfortable with that as, as the maker of the motion. Okay, thank you. And um, I, it's it's mostly because I just think that I, I saw the, the LGBTQ youth space and I saw Bill Wilson Center, but also there was Destination Home. And so there was, there's two groups for, um, for the unhoused population and focusing on youth. So I kind of thought that the LGBTQ community should be similarly represented. Um, and that's really the only uh, comment I have. I, I do agree with council member Foley that that time is of the essence. So I, I really appreciate the timeline that was laid out for the check-in in, in September and also having a six month initial set of recommendations to really um, come back to us and keep, keep us in the loop. I, I think it makes sense to have this um, to have this group be be as autonomous as possible, but we, of course, we want to have the check-ins so that we can be um, kept up to date and in the loop. So thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Esparza. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank all the folks um, on the task force and that have been working on this. Um, and I actually especially want to take, I want to take a moment to really thank Angel Rios uh, for his hard work on this. Um, this was not a, um, you know, he was an important person to assign to this work. Um, and I know folks, some folks are newer than others. I first met Angel over 20 years ago when he was working for MOXA, leading youth activities, um, gang prevention activities in the East Side. And to me, he was the perfect person to put on this because he knows full well how much our communities need investment and how much reimagining our communities need and communities like District 7, communities like District 5. Um, and so I just really wanted to take a moment and thank you, Angel, um, for your dedication um, to our community. Um, and so uh, I wanted to, to talk about a couple of things. Um, and one is that uh, about the community, I uh, want to make sure that, that our community is at the center of these discussions. I actually don't think it's an inconvenience to make sure that we reach out. I think it's important that we reach out to folks, um, particularly San Jose residents. Um, uh, my office has met with folks and, and some folks don't live in San Jose, but have very strong opinions on public safety in San Jose. And they're certainly free to their, to have their opinions, but it's our residents and my residents that have to live with those consequences. And, um, and so I'd like to hear more about how we're reaching out to residents to gather their input. 
And specifically, I'd like to know how we're reaching out to Rock Springs, Valley Palm, Seven Trees, Santee, Poco Way, Colmar. How are we getting input from communities that aren't traditionally captured via Zoom meeting um, or uh, a meeting across town or a meeting that's held in English? How are we reaching out to incorporate their feedback um, in this process? Councilmember, if that's directed to uh, to some of the yeah, I don't know if that's directed to Angel or to the proposers. So feel free to jump in. Well, let me let me take a little stab at it. Number one, I would I would argue vehemently that the organizations that you see on the list are ones that are actually have relationships that are working in these communities in deep ways. So the kind of organizations that are there are very very connected with those serving. Those okay, people. but my question is how we're getting those resident feedback. So that, that speaks to what we're talking about. The way that many organizations are organized, they actually have not only feedback loops, but actually reaching out. These are the organizations that lead in promotor engagement, organizations that lead in terms of doing these different forms of engagement. We've been working with the Human Rights Institute at San Jose State University to develop some surveying tools that we plan on being able to utilize with this. So we're developing something based on other efforts that have existed in other parts of the country uh, that have actually been developing it. Our goal is to get thousands of responses to that through this network of organizations to be able to make sure that that happens. Um, but I, I would almost direct the question back to the city as well. Like part of the proposals that, that you actually passed last week is what does the engagement process look like for the city to make sure that you're centering voices of community members in all public policy decisions, budgetary and otherwise, and being able to make sure that that happens. So that ongoing investment, the Office of Race Equity taking lead charge on that kind of thing. And that's why we think we, we didn't, that's why our preference is not to do an outside process, but to be working, collaborating with the city to try to make sure that we're able to do this hand in glove with that. So I think the, the issues that so, you're bringing up is, are, are exactly what we want to be able to so do. So the city would be working in partnership with the group to get that input, to solicit that input, um, possibly using the surveying tools that would be multilingual. So you're, this would be a joint partnership with the city doing that outreach um, to solicit that input. Is that what I'm hearing? Is that correct? Yeah. If you, if you read the proposal itself, it says the first obligation of every member of this steering committee member is to be doing that engagement work. They're responsible for doing so. It's not just okay. about sitting on a council. Okay, and then, um, so I have a question on the, the committees. So I actually wasn't happy with just six because the original proposal last year, we added resident input. Right. So I thought six didn't seem like enough. Um, and so what I'm hearing, what I heard is the two hats of the 27. So the 27 members would be San Jose residents and we would know, like, make sure that we're capturing folks throughout the city. So would that be captured then? Um, and I'm looking at Council Member Perales at, at, to ensure that that's what he intended in his motion, because I heard two hats in the motion. So. I just want to get some clarity on that. Yeah, my my uh, suggestion in the motion was that rather than add six additional neighborhood specific spots, that we only add two. And then what we look to is in the 27, now 28, if we add Billy DeFrank, in those, in those 28 spots, um, we would identify people that could actually wear, you know, multiple hats and specifically neighborhood hats. And so someone that actually, you know, can live in, you know, one of our gang hotspot neighborhoods, as well as happens to be part of one of these organizations and that um, we identify who those are. Maybe the process would be those 28 individuals get identified first and you see what neighborhoods of hotspots are now, you know, um, checked off the list. Okay and then allow staff to fill in the blank with the two additional neighborhood spots on maybe hot spots, gang hot spots that are not uh, covered. And, and that, again, that was just a suggestion. I, I you okay. know, I, I proposed it so we could get to a motion. Uh, it's, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm willing to take input. So, so that's helpful. Cause I, um, I, I heard that in the motion. And so um, then would you, um, and I, and I like the two hats and capturing that in the advisory, uh, in the committee members, I'm sorry, we've got the committees and advisory. So 
um, for the 27 members. Um, so then would, I, I like capturing that. I think it, it paints a picture of, you know, all of San Jose participating and giving input. And I, and I do think that's important. And so um, then Councilmember Perales, would you then be willing to give a range two to six, just to make sure we capture um, parts of the city that, you know, if there is a gap, Poncho, you know, saying he's got it covered, but just in case there's a gap, that there's an opportunity for that gap um, to be addressed. So a range of two to six then. Yeah, I, I'm comfortable with that. And just to make sure I understand it correctly that we would fill those 28 positions and then see how many of these neighborhood gang hotspots are covered through there. And if we only need two more positions, we bring two more on. But if we happen to need three or four, we can we can add more on up until a max of six. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, yeah. Just to make sure that we get we do incorporate that feedback. Yeah, and, I am. Com I, I, yeah, I'm okay. comfortable including that in, into the motion. And then obviously to keep the numbers small, right? Encourage. Yeah. <laughs> The, yeah. the, the people that are identifying yeah. the, the individuals, right, that they try to find uh, people that can wear those multiple hats. Yeah, I feel you. And um, and thank you, Poncha. I was really happy to hear about surveying tools that you're working with San Jose State and then partnering with the city because um, I, I'll tell you what I would like to see is that we solicit that input um, from folks. And we do find surveys, that we do find other ways that folks um, to give their input because um, I'll tell you, I, I've had people reach out to me from Los Gatos, from Morgan Hill, or, you know, and, and people that live in, in very nice places in the Rose Garden, and I'm glad they live in nice places. Good for them. I really am. I really am. But how do I go to Santee, or how do I go to some of the neighborhoods that I represent and tell them that their voices are, will be heard? And so I just want to make sure, and I appreciate San Jose State, um, really stepping up to make sure that we do incorporate that feedback. Um, and, um, and so a uh, couple quick things. Um, I, I appreciate the timeline um, as well. And I'll tell you, this council voted to add to BEST, which I, I often call the, the original reimagining under Susan Hammer. And that started from uh, a District 7 resident, Silver Creek grad, who, who had kind of turned his life around. Um, and, uh, and, and this notion that we should invest in gang impacted neighborhoods, that we don't just send cops out, that we invest in our youth, that we put in um, infrastructures. And, and I love what Mika said about comprehensive services and systems. That's what we need, right? And, and I'll tell you, I don't have a single neighborhood in my city that has ever told me that they don't want police. So to me, this isn't about defunding police. To me, this is about creating these alternate comprehensive services and systems to be better, to, to provide more um, to our neighborhoods, neighborhoods like the ones I represent that deserve more. And that's what it is for me. Um, and so um, I... So I, I, I'm looking for those reimagining ideas that, that the, the eight-year-old that goes to Santee, when I go to meet with elementary schools in my district, the kids, the kids from kindergarten to sixth grade, they ask me what the city's doing about gangs and what we're doing about gunfire. So, so I'd like to give them a better answer about how we're investing in their future and in their neighborhoods. And that's what this process is to me. Um, and so I have, a, so I would like to hear those concrete, um, concrete uh, opportunities for the cities to invest. And I'll tell you one thing that's very, very important to neighborhoods like the ones I represent is that we have transparency and accountability for those alternatives. So when it's a Friday night and seven trees and um, somebody's being gang raped and the whole neighborhood can hear it and nobody wants to call the police, which is something that has happened in my, in my community, um, how, do we, how do we address that? Right when there was a uh, mentally ill 
homeless man who knocked out in a fire, knocked out the telecommunication systems for Santee for weeks because it took 16 calls to the county to get him help and get him a placement. That's what we have to do better. It shouldn't take 16 calls and it shouldn't take the police going out there 16 times to provide that alternative. And that's what I am looking for this group to do. What are the alternatives that produce results and that are reliable that will come at 2 a.m. on a Saturday or at 2 p.m. on a Friday that have the same transparency and accountability that we expect from everybody else? So, um, so quickly, I, um, I think that's it. So that's it for me. Thank you. And I'll be supporting the motion. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Arenas. Uh, thank you. I'm going to make my comments uh, really quick um, because I know we, we have a long um, journey ahead of us still. Um, I you. want to thank you for, <laughs> for, for um, calling in and letting us know um, your thoughts about um, this process. Um, that is absolutely important. This is what we strive to achieve is to have this kind of feedback on every item that the council discusses. And so I hope that we can continue to have these voices heard at our council meetings on an ongoing basis. Um, I think that is also really important as part of um, this group, this advisory group, because there's policies that, that we decide on. Earlier today, we talked about the IPA um, year-end report. In it was an overrepresentation uh, data of overrepresentation of black and brown um, people in it. And so it, there's policies that are interlaced in, in all of our, um, all of our uh, meetings. And so we need to find a way to make sure that we have a comprehensive uh, discussion and that you are all participating as well in some of those other conversations that we're having that may not be the objective of the advisory, but it certainly relates to it very directly. Um, so is there any thought about maybe having some of the advisory uh, uh, members come back to council on some of the uh, agenda items that make sense? You, you know, I, uh, Councilman, I, I think that is, uh, that's doable, you know, because what, what, what has evolved here is really a, a, a pretty robust community engagement process that's going to be a real conduit to, to our impacted neighborhoods, especially, uh, as well as citywide perspectives. And I think linking those perspectives to other issues in the city, uh, because there's so much intersection with this work, I think would be a smart thing to do. I think what we could do is, is as we, you know, as this process gets launched, stay in close coordination around the, the, the framing of the issues, and then sharing that information with, with, uh, with you all as mayor and council, as well as uh, all, the, all, you know, through the city manager's office, all the department uh, heads and, and their respective departments to really weave this work into the work that we're doing. You know, this work does have a race and equity lens to it. So this is something that we'll also continue to, to look through. Uh, and, and yeah, we could definitely do that for starters. Um, you know, we'll use the PISFIS subcommittee uh, to do uh, report outs uh, where, where, this, where this group will have the opportunity to uh, report out through PISFIS and then uh, wherever necessary, cross-reference to the full council. But um, yeah, I definitely think there's an opportunity here that, uh, can, that we can take advantage of. Wonderful. Um, I believe in, in creating systemic change and we can only do that by working together, um, not in parallel of one another. Um, so I appreciate that. Um, the other thing I was going to mention is that I have a district that is um, that has three country clubs on one end of it and um, has also gained hot spots on the other end of the district. And these are perpetual Hot spots. This is Meadow Fair and this is Welch, um, but they're not anchored by any agency. I've been actually trying to get agencies out into this community. And so one of the um, concerns that I have is that um, 
And I actually, I had earlier today, I recognized um, two of my community members um, who helped with uh, establishing some uh, dog parks in Welch community. Um, but I had to hire the neighborhood association president so that we could really have some change in that neighborhood. And this is, you know, similar to what a promotoras framework is. And I had actually a proposal during the budget, uh, although it wasn't um, approved, but this is part of the uh, an issue that our city has been facing um, throughout this whole pandemic, and it's to um, connect with the community that is hard to reach because it takes resources and it takes time. Um, and so, one, I just wanted to make sure um, that my community is represented. I don't want to. I don't want it to be left out simply because um, you know in our in our schools. Uh, Evergreen School District, it, it is not a district that most agencies target. Although we have eight out of the 13 um, schools as Title I. So we do have an absolute need um, and we're, we're missing agencies out there. Um, so I wanna make sure that uh, whether, you know, we double this, wear double hats or whatever it is, but that those areas are, are covered. And, I see a bunch of shaking your head, so. Yeah, yeah, and Councilman, that does get to the root of the issue, right? Whether it's two or whether it's six, I think the key is we want not only uh, uh, feedback and the perspective of, of impacted neighborhoods, but, but also feedback from people that have ideas around what they want for their children, you know, uh, what, what they want for, you know, you know, what they want for their teenager, what they want for, and, and, and those two things aren't always the same, right? You know, you could have a perspective, you know, based on impact by police or any other form of, 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 of issue or violence. Uh, and so we wanna make sure we have both, right? So it's not either or, but both. And, and that's the key. And again, whether it's two or six, I think it's, uh, we wanna make sure that we capture those voices as the diversion as they are, but if we're going to do this right, we, we got to, you know, that's our, our main barometer right there. Well, well th thank you, Angel. And I found that the most effective tool that I had in Welch was hiring this um, neighborhood association president because she lives there, right? She knows, uh, it, you know, nobody has to tell her about it. Nobody has to call her up. She's the one who's out there checking out the park. She's out there um, seeing if there's anybody gambling. So, so they're in the know, and 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 there isn't any agency that can be in the know as much as the neighbors who live there. And so, um, I really hope that you take this to heart and, and make sure you don't forget Meadow Fair and Welch. So, I appreciate that, and um, and thank you for the work that you are all doing. Um, and I know that you're representing a greater group here, and your voices um, uh, are the ones that we hear today, but I know there's a lot of folks behind you. And so I want to thank you and I want to thank them as well. Um, and, and Angel uh, for being our, 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 our perpetual uh, uh, leader in our community um, that understands uh, grassroots efforts and understands the needs um, in a way that uh, you can't really teach somebody. Um, and so I, I just want to thank you all for, for the work that you're doing. And obviously I'm supporting this because I second it <laughs> and because it's a great project and it's a great proposal. Thank you. Thank Council you. Councilmember Council Rennes, I just want to emphasize that, that that partnership with the Neighborhood Association and, and the Neighborhood Commission is really, really important part of this outreach architecture. So we, we look forward to being able to work with them closely on this. Andre, I just wanted to say thank you for that. Uh, because, you know, I associate myself particularly with the comments that were made by Council Member Esparza on that issue. You know, I think it is, it's one thing to say we're, we're picking community leaders who happen to live in San Jose. It's another thing to say we're working with people who actually have a sense of responsibility to the place because they're on the Neighborhood Association Board or because they coordinate the folklorico for all the kids in that neighborhood or because you know, they're running the PTA for that particular school or, or they run the CERT volunteers. I think that that is what, at least I believe is a really important perspective that is sometimes lost when we have dialogue among organizations that have strong views and perspectives. And I, I just hope that is a voice that we clearly capture. So thank you for that. Um, okay, uh, Councilor Peralta, I know you've got your hand up. I would just ask in this second go around, uh, we've got 
a big item coming up next, I think you know. <laughs> yes, I'm gonna save most of my time for that item. Um, okay, good. So just one uh, prime example, and then I'll make a, just a slight amendment to my motion. Uh, and I don't mean to dime him out and I won't say where he lives, but I'll give an example here. Uh, my, my guess would be maybe somebody like Jamal will sit uh, as, as uh, a representative, say from the uh, 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 Black Leadership Kitchen cabinet, but he also happens to live between two uh, uh, historic, uh, persistent hot, gang hotspots, uh, has two young daughters, uh, you know, a daughter that goes to a, a, a preschool in the area, um, frequents, you know, the, the, the parks in the neighborhood. Um, and so someone like him, right, could just naturally be wearing multiple hats. And that's kind of what I think in my mind, that's what I was envisioning, right, is that that's the kind of representation we can get um, on this body. And I, I think we can achieve that. And I think that, you know, that the, the uh, you know, the conversation here has highlighted that and, and the importance that it is to this council. And that's why I was willing to, to make the amendment to that to the motion, right, to say two to six is, is fine with me, uh, you know, if, if we can't achieve uh, that goal with with only the additional two. The other amendment that I'll make, because it's now been clarified, um, is in regards to the youth, uh, my, my encouragement that we, we sort of try to make uh, the youth participation more robust. I understand better now, Angel, what you were intending is that essentially it's not a a formal brown acted body that has to report directly to the council. And then instead it's a body that maybe is advisory um, to this task force. And uh, I, I actually would agree with that, that that I think would make it easier for them and then uh, easier for the task force to, to help them be successful. And so I would, I would, I'll, I'll just stick with that recommendation that, 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 uh, that you have created. That was the only uh, amendment to the motion. Okay, and I assume that's fine with the seconder. Uh, was that, who was the seconder? I think it was Council Member Arenas. Yes, a long time ago. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Council Member Arenas, that's okay with you? And yes, I'm fine with that, thank you. Okay, great. All right, let's vote on uh, uh, Mayor, Council Member Davis. Mayor, just very quickly, uh, I, I, and I'll make this very fast, but I gotta give Please. some thanks to very Peter important. Hamilton, Suma Maciel, Sabrina Park Garcia, Lori Sabrino and Gina Espejo, and Gina Espejo staff that have, have been helping on this collaterally and big kudos to them, small but mighty team doing this work. So uh, just quick, quick thank you to all of them. Thank you, Angel. Uh, Councilor Davis. Thanks. I just, um, while you were talking about the amendments, Council Member Perales, I realized when I asked for the Billy DeFrank Center that Council Member Arenas wasn't, wasn't asked if she accepted that amendment. So I just wanna make sure that that gets in there and and council member Arenas, or if you're okay with that addition as well accepted okay thank you okay here we go uh let's vote on council member Prowlis's motion menes yes Prowlis? yes yes cohen aye Prosco? aye davis, davis? yes 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 arenas yes Foley? Aye. Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Thank you. Okay, thank you everyone. Uh, and thank you, Angel, for all your work. Uh, we've got more work ahead, certainly. And I just, just getting to the starting line, but I think we're off to a good start here. Okay, uh, uh, we are now going to call uh, items 10.3 and 10.4. The city initiated general plan amendment informing rezoning for the Berryessa Park Urban Village plan. We're gonna, it's going to be heard concurrently with item 10.4. The city initiated general plan amendment informing rezoning for the Bar Berryessa Urban Village. Well, wait a minute. I just read the same thing twice. Okay, 10.3 and 10.4 are being heard concurrently. I'll say that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, moving on. We do have a presentation from staff and I wanna remind everybody it's 8.43 uh, and our Zoom turns into a pumpkin at midnight. So we're all gonna focus on being succinct. Thank you. Mayor, point, point of order, uh, I believe we have to take up the issue that we had to defer from orders of the day to, to actually discuss the orders of the day before we actually get into the presentation. Is that correct, Nora? Yes. I assume that uh, we could take that up in the orders of the motions themselves. That, that would be counterintuitive to hear the item first before we discuss uh, uh, deferring it, Mayor. Okay. 
Uh, the concern I have is this, Councilmember Frost, if we take public comment on a separate motion, we're never going to hear the underlying motion. And I know very well that all the issues that are being raised on the issue of deferral are precisely the issues we consider under the underlying motion. So I think we ought to take it up as part of part and parcel of the item and we'll consider public comment and council comment together on the entire issue of whether we defer or move forward. But I'd just like to ask for Nora's uh, legal opinion on, on how actually this should be taken up. Um, the, all of the, if the council is gonna debate anything taken up on orders of the day, it there has to be public comment and everything. And if it is going to be substantive um, for time purposes and in terms of um uh trying to manage the meeting it the uh comments can all take place and then the motions can take place i understand that it may be more time consuming um if the deferral is going to happen on at least one of these issues but um there's a there's a lot of uh discussion that's going to take place also and uh as long as it's opened up to discussion and it's not just a flat vote on on the deferral then um, there needs to be full public discussion. So I guess I was looking for more of, rather than a gray, a gray answer on a, on a definitive, how, how that we would take up uh, a recommended, as I had recommended deferral, which was then you know, pointed to the fact that, that because uh, the mayor objected, we had to hear that now with the item. Again, I believe it's counterintuitive to say, let's hear the item first and then discuss a deferral. So I'm just looking for your legal, what legally is there a, is a, a, a time when we have to take up one or the other? Yeah, a council member, if the, if the matter was taken up in orders of the day and if there was discussion, it would have had to be a complete open discussion, including discussion on members of the members of the public. If there isn't a debate um, by the council on the deferral and there's strictly a vote, then the debate is and then then you can, if it doesn't pass, you could go to the um, to the rest of the matters. If it um, uh, does pass and there's and there's no debate, then whether whether or not anything else that isn't deferred needs to be heard tonight can can be um, heard. But I, my understanding is that, uh, unless the motion to defer is not going to be debated by the council and is strictly an up or down vote, um, there is an, there, you need to have full comment and full discussion. Okay, that's, uh, that is understood. So if we were to take, if I were to carry my motion from the morning, then we could not debate it now. We would simply take an up or down vote on the deferral um, and or the alternative is hear the presentation, hear all public comment, right. and then following that, take up a decision of deferral. Exactly. Okay. I think, um, you know, one last question. If we were to take up right now an up or down vote on deferral, and if that were to fail and we were to hear the item, and after we hear the item and hear all the public comment, could someone make a recommendation for deferral at that point? Um, there, there could be as part of uh, taking up all the other pieces of the um, uh, recommendations, the staff recommendations and all the actions that the council would have to take on these matters. Okay, so we could get two bites of the apple. It's not the way that I wanted to do it. I would have preferred to have lobbied for why I was asking for a deferral, but uh, hopefully my colleagues read the memo. So I will make a motion uh, on an up or down vote for the deferral asking for one one week at, at this point. Second, and that's the motion from earlier today, right? Because you yes. did this already. Okay, got yes. it. All right, uh, uh, in the interest of time, uh, I'm going to urge a vote. At this time, there's a motion on the floor. I won't be supporting the motion. Uh, we will uh, vote up or down on this item so we can then move forward to get the public comment. Tony? Yes. Yes. Morales? Yes. Owen? Nay. Roscoe? Aye. Davis? No. 
Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Goalie? Goalie? I'll come back. Mahan? No. Jones? No. Licardo? No. Foley? I'm sorry, I have stepped out for a second. What are we voting on? Deferring, I'm looking for glasses. Deferring 10.3 and 10.4 for one week. No. One. Okay, the motion fails. So we're gonna proceed with the uh, presentation from staff and go right to public comment. Welcome, Michael. Uh, Michael, you're uh, muted right now. Michael, I think you're still muted. Michael, you're not showing as muted. Maybe do you have a microphone that's that's not plugged in fully? Because we heard you earlier. Maybe we can just give him a week. We'll come back. <laughs> yep. Can you hear me now? And yes. Oh, awesome. Okay. All right. Woo. Can't wait till COVID is over. Let's start from the beginning. Okay, great. Okay, so here we go. So good evening, Mayor and Council. I'm Michael Brio, Deputy Director for Citywide Planning. I'm joined by a large crew of people, including Nancy Klein, the Director of uh, Economic De Office of Economic Development, Chris Burton, our new director in PBCE, Charlo Gomez, David Keon from Planning, uh, director of BOT, John Risto, Wilson Tam, also from B BOT, Menji, Philip Juan from Public Works, and Nicole um, Burnham, deputy director with PRNS. So tonight, the council will be considering approval of the Berryessa Bart Urban Village Plan, as well as approval of a rezoning on the flea market property. I'm first going to present um, information on the various of our urban village plan process and plan. So the various of art is a um, regional transit urban village in the general plan. Excuse me. It is in the first first uh, horizon of growth in the general plan and as a regional urban transit urban village, the various of our ur urban village plan plans for a significant amount of growth. More specifically, it plans for 4.2 million square feet of commercial and 5,100 dwelling units. The, um, the urban village surrounds the Berryessa North San Jose BART station, which in the interim is a um, end of the line station, at least until BART 2 is faded within the next, BART phase 2 is completed within the next day, decade. By the year 2030, the this BART station is anticipated to have 25,000 new riders or just riders. Um, of course, how much or how successful we are in terms of driving, uh, driving ridership to this BART station is really in part going to be contingent upon the land uses, the intensity of land uses, and the mix of land uses around this BART station. Fortunately, this village has significant opportunities for new development to support BART. Over the last three years, starting in 2018, staff have been working with the community, property owners, and DTA 
to develop a framework to guide the development of a successful new transit integrated mixed use and urban neighborhood. This plan process that's occurred over the last three years has included extensive community outreach. It uh, in included three workshops, two of which were in, in person and had 100 plus people attendee, attend at both. And the final workshop due to COVID was an, was an online webinar. It was broken into three separate webinars. In addition, um, there was also uh, an online engagement uh, program where people could provide input and comments if they were not able to attend the workshops. So the urban village plan starts with a vision and this vision really sort of um, identifies what, what, or what the various of our urban village will look like in the year 2040 if we're successful with the implementation of, of this plan. Um, and I'll just read it really quick. An innovation district, the vision is an innovation district attractive for people and business with many green spaces and recreational opportunities along the creeks. Michael, I'm sorry to interrupt, but we're going to be on really on a tough schedule. If, I think everyone can read. I, I think it's important for us to, to get into public comment. We've got a lot of people waiting. Okay, well, I can just skip the presentation if you'd like. Or no, no the presentation's fine. It's just, we can read the text. Don't feel okay. the need to read it. Okay, and there's, so there's five guiding principles. I won't read them. They're up there on the screen. There are, um, the, the, the village is broken into uh, four districts or opportunity sites. And there are, uh, they, they have a distinct character within the plan and policies and different approaches for each of them. They include the Berryessa Lundy Commercial District up on uh, uh, Lundy uh, and King, Berryessa Lundy and King, the Vercino property, the BTA Station property, and the Flea Market South property. The land use plan accommodates uh, the full amount of planned growth. It creates a framework to develop a mixed use transit and pedestrian supportive environment. And it concentrates employment growth adjacent to BART, given that intense employment growth really is the key driver of transit ridership. Of course, it, uh, develop, it, housing is also important, so it includes housing densities to support the transit ridership. And consistent with state law and council direction, this um, proposed action includes a rezoning on the BTA property consistent with the various of our urban village plan. So the um, so this, this, this drawing illustrates the uh, envisioned sort of massing and scale of development. The plan includes land use, urban design, stand, land use policies, urban design standards and guidelines to achieve this vision um, where, with a con concentrating uh, the highest intensity development of BART and scaling it back as it approaches the neighborhood. So the, uh, the plan has an ambitious goal of of achieving a 65% mode split, whereby 65% of the people get to the urban village and the train station by some other mode than driving. It includes, it identifies 20 transportation and project, transportation improvement projects that are intended to improve multimodal access. It includes parking demand strategies and transportation demand strategies um, to, to achieve this goal of a mode split. I should mention that these, the parking strategy and the PDM strategy were really a model for the citywide strategy that the council will be considering in the fall. So the planning and recommendation of course is here and that's to consider an addendum to the EIR, um, to adopt the various of our urban village plan, um, to adopt a general plan amendment to integrate the plan into the general plan, adopt a conforming rezoning on the BTA property and approve modifications to the Barry Bart Urban Village plan to allow for five acre urban market, which I'll get into in a minute. So next, um, next up is the, uh, the actual rezoning on the flea market site. So my computer just froze. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> so quickly, some background on the flea market. I think as you all know, it opened in March, 1960 founded by George Bum Sr. And while it started with only 20 vendors, it's currently grown to having over 4 million visitors a year. This site has a really long planning history. Uh, beginning in 2000 with voter approved measure A to fund BART extension to San Jose. 
Originally, BART was planned to go down the Southern Pacific Railroad right away through Japantown, but under Mayor Ron Gonzalez's leadership, it was moved to the Western Pacific right of way where it resides today as a way to bring transit to the east side and spur investment and, and new development in San Jose. Um, the next, there's a lot of milestones here. I'll just cover some key ones. The next key milestone was in 2007, the city council approved a, re, approved a rezoning on both sides of Berryessa on the flea market for 2,800 housing units and 365,000 square feet of commercial. In 2016, there was a, a rezoning approved by the city council um, with direction to an the direction to rezone the South Flea Market site for between 1.5 and 2.2 million square feet of commercial development. In 2017, the applicant files its current rezoning application for up to 3.4 million square feet of commercial and 3,450 dwelling units. Um, around the same time, the, BART, the city initiated the, the DDUV planning process as a result of a grant received from MTC. And of course, here we are in 2021, where you're considering both the, both the DDUV and the South flea market rezoning proposal. The flea market rezoning proposal um, uh, is zoned for a minimum of 1,700 dwelling units and a maximum of 3,450 dwelling units, a minimum of 1.5 million square feet of commercial and a maximum of 3.4 million square feet of commercial and allows for a 50% parking reduction from the current parking requirements in our code. The proposed flea market rezoning supports BART and the goals of the general plan. It's consistent with the draft area of BART urban village plan, establishes standards on how the area could be redeveloped. Of course, this is not a development project. Uh, development projects would need to come in for development or PD permits at a future date. So what has occurred in, in 2021? Well, a lot has occurred. As part of the planning commission uh, hearing process, we've heard significant concern from vendors and community members about the closure of the flea market. We've heard concerns that they would display small business owned by persons of color, often Im new immigrants to this country. Um, it, that the flea market is a significant source of income for many business owners and their families. That the flea market provides incubator space for small businesses so they can graduate up to brick and mortar and this could be lost. And, and an acknowledgement and, and sort of an emphasis of the flea market really is a culture and iconic asset for San Jose. On March 24th, the Planning Commission, largely due to the, the input that we heard at that hearing, continued the item until May 12th. Council member is leading, Council member Cohen is leading a con conversation on how to address the concerns of the vendors over the last four months. Um, between the Planning Commission in March and the Planning Commission on May 12th, the property owner proposed integrating a five acre urban market. On May 12th, the Planning Commission recommended making modifications to the various of our urban village plan and the zoning to allow this urban market. Um, last week on June 16th, the mayor, Council Members Cohen and Perales hosted a meeting with the vendors at the flea market. Council, Mo Council Member Carrasco also attended. The meeting was attended by over 300 persons where the council and the mayor heard concerns and the desires of the vendors. Um, conditions were discussed to support the vendors and to create an inclusionary process uh, to, to develop a new urban market. I will now turn it over to Nancy Klein, who will take it from here. Good evening, mayor and council. Thank you very much. In the next steps that are described in staff supplemental, as well as certain council uh, proposed actions, we would work to establish the flea market advisory group. And the intent is to have a majority of the members be members of the vendor community. OED, including the work to future team would then review small business resources with the vendor community and the vendors themselves would identify which resources they feel would be most useful to them. Staff would then bring in representatives of those resources and decide together, vendors making the selections, what resources were made available to the vendors. This, um, the consultants that you see here, we'd scope out consultants. There's a series of consultants that have been discussed with the vendors and other members of the community. 
Again, the consultants would be selected by the vendor by the vendors with support from city staff. Consultants likely to be chosen include economic consultants with urban market specialization, especially those that are familiar and operate public markets, um, and either in California or throughout the country. We'd also be looking for consultant ass assistants that provide economic assessments that would reflect all of the many benefits the, the market provides, not only jobs, history, and culture, but demonstrate the economic engine of over 430 to 700 vendors, their employment, their jobs, and the direct and indirect economic benefits. The economic assessment will inform the design and operations of a future market. We'd also look to see models for development and ownership, such as a privately owned but publicly accessible market or a popo of a sort that may well have at least a 65 year operating covenant to assure continuity for the market. Could, we could re, re, uh, research city owned property or land trust going forward. What we would need to do is analyze the costs to develop the markets and determine if necessary, any gap financing that would be provided by the public. Gap financing tools may include uh, community financing districts or enhanced infrastructure districts or other available tools. We would also look to explore partnerships with BART, VTA in particular, to potentially design in market activities to expand beyond the five acres suggested below the tracks of BART itself, and also a potential partnership for weekend operations in the parking lot and parking garage. And of course, review potential for off-site market options. Next slide. Michael, you want to do that one? Okay, thank you. So um, the Planning Commission recommends, this is the Planning Commission recommending council adopt the CEIR approve a zoning or approve a zoning ordinance for the, the fee market rezoning, approve an ordinance modifying the US 101 Oakland Mayberry PDP, um, pro, uh, adopt a resolution uh, giving the uh, current project a credit in the TDP, and also approve amendments to the proposed zoning to allow the five acre. And that concludes staff present. Wait. I think there's one more slide, which my slide is not moving. Nancy, can you do the next from memory? My computer's frozen. The next slide is really a recap of those options. We'd work with the vendors. We'd select relevant consultants. We'd assure that the advisory committee that's established has a predominance, uh, a majority of vendors, and we would work to uh, define how the main elements and amenities for the market and see uh, market options uh, for partnership as well as seek uh, potential offsite market locations. Thank you, uh, Nancy. Thank you. Um, Mr. Shainauer, you represent the applicant, is that right? That's correct. Okay. Um, please proceed and then we'll, we'll go to public comment after your comment. Can I put my item on the screen? Okay. Well, good evening, Mayor Licardo, members of the council. My name is Eric Shainauer. I represent the flea market owner and the applicant in this case. Um, since most of the discussion will be about the flea market, I don't want the council to lose sight of the history and the major project that is in front of you that's important to the city and to the BART system itself. As staff indicated, we already have a project approved by the city council in 2007. 
that project has 1,800 units, 210,000 square feet of commercial left, no commitment to affordable housing on site, no market planned in the, in the development, and no proposed vendor support. Tonight, the council has a binary decision. Either approve the urban village plan and the new project that's before you, or we move forward and develop the project that's already approved. Any delay, any denial, and we simply build the project that the council approved in 2007. A reminder that in May of 2016, it was the city council that directed us to bring you this new zoning. On that council was council member Perales, council member Carrasco, council member Licardo, and council member Jones, all voted to tell us to bring this new zoning before you because you wanted more jobs. The project that's proposed will dramatically increase the office development to 3.4 million square feet, enough for 11,000 jobs. It will increase the residential capacity to over 3,400 units, and we are committed to building over 300 units on site in the new neighborhood. The development will result in the completion of 9.2 acres of neighborhood parks, the completion of nearly one mile of Recreation Creek trails and over 17 acres of creek riparian habitat uh, along the Penitencia and Coyote Creek. The project will has already and will continue to fund over $21 million in area-wide infrastructure. And the new plan that is in front of you incorporates a new five-acre urban market and includes a vendor transition financial support plan, and other vendor support. Excuse me one second. Is that visible on the screen? It's not, no. Somehow I got kicked out of screen share. Can someone can, can send someone that back? Can the screen share, please? Let's try this again. Sorry for the delay. How about now? Can you see that? Yes, we can see it. Okay, sorry for that. So um, we have <clears throat> worked with the vendors over 21 years as we have planned and built out this project. And the current activist vendors who have gotten engaged in the last six months we met with them on April 16th, and this is the list of demands that they gave us on April 16th. Number one was to provide land to uh, allow the recreation uh, of, a, of a market on site. As I've already mentioned, our plan now incorporates a five acre uh, urban market at the BART station in the center of our plan. Secondly, E economic relief for the vendors during the transition. We have offered voluntarily $2.5 million uh, for the vendor transition fund. And number three, they want to control the cost of the rent. What we've said for the new market is that the rent will be comparable to other open air markets throughout the Bay Area. So we have answered the three primary concerns that were presented to us in writing by, by the vendors. And just to close, this in 3D is what it looks like. So the blue buildings are commercial office, the yellow buildings are residential mixed use, and we've proposed five acres in red to create a new urban market that is common all over the world in an urban setting. And we're placing it in, in the plazas right at the BART station so there's great public transit. And as staff has indicated, there are ways to expand this footprint by using the public streets around the central plaza on the busy weekends and expanding across the tracks 
to plazas that are at the BART station, as well as space potentially under the BART tracks and in the surface parking lots at the BART station. So we are confident by working together, by form of formally creating the flea market advisory group is the best way to engage the vendors to make all of these decisions about the future going forward. So tonight, we hope that you will adopt the staff recommendation, planning commission recommendation, and the recommendations in the memo by council member Cohen, council member Jimenez, and council Ma and mayor Licardo. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Eric. Uh, we are going to move now to members of the community. I wanna thank the many members of the community who have already participated. And of course, the many hundreds of vendors who have made this such a special place. Uh, because of the rush we have to get our work done, I'm going to limit public comment uh, to one minute and to conclude public comment at 1045. We now have 30 hands raised that should enable at least 90 people to be able to voice their views and we hope we can hear from everyone that way who wants to speak. Uh, Amanda Fischel, welcome Amanda. Amanda, I'm sorry, you don't have a Zoom uh, version, which enables us to hear you. If you can download the most recent Zoom version and then raise your hand, then we'll be able to call on you and we'll hear you. Tessa, welcome. Uh, okay, Peter, Peter Ortiz, welcome. Hello, Mayor, can you hear me? Yes. Hello, Honorable Mayor and City Council. My name is Peter Ortiz and I'm an elected trustee for the Santa Clara County Board of Education representing East San Jose. I'm calling in support of the Berryessa Flea Market Vendors Association in response to the land use process that many have deemed as unfair and heavily in favor of the wealthy property owners. I appeal to the humanity in our council members, especially those who have lived hand in hand with our Latino and Vietnamese communities who stand to be impacted greatly by this decision. Uh, with our city ex experiencing rapid gentrification, now is not the time to look the other way. And let me be clear. I would prefer the flea market to stay, but if it is to close, please support the memo put forth by council member Carrasco to minimize the impact on our vendors and on East San Jose. Thank you. Thank you. Tessa? Thank you. Oh, let's see. Okay, good. Thank you so much. Um, well, I just support that the um, businesses are fighting for their, um, their rights and appreciate that um, you know, they're, they're doing a, a fast and things like that to really get your attention because we see that when general plan, you know, that here you are making a general plan change, I guess it's conforming, but you're making a rezoning and we, you know, our neighborhood has also been impacted with, you know, trying to make financial gain. So it's a corollary with what's happening at 615 where we're building a hotel and our neighbors don't want that. And how do we get our city to listen? I guess we have to go on a you know fast too to get the attention of your you know your policymakers that are all about economic development, and this is you know where they're they're fighting for their their well being, and we're fighting in our neighborhood at six one five Stockton Avenue to not have a hotel, and we need the community. Thank you, Paul. I really did this Paul Soto from the Horseshoe, Hijo de los Campesinos de San Si Puedes. And I just want to put everybody on notice on public today that's listening, that this Mr. Schoenauer gave us a perfect textbook example of what institutionalized racism looks like, what it feels like, and what it sounds like. And I'd ask Mr. Schoenauer to show a little bit more respect when he comes to these city council meetings. You may have a wealthy uh, a benefactor, but I have a collection connection to the land, homeboy. And the various family, you are sitting on land and are, and, and are the beneficiary. In fact, your paycheck has got blood on it, homeboy, because the various family was savagely and brutally murdered for that land. And the Bum family came into possession of it. So you want to talk about, come here and talk to me condescending? Hey, old boy, you just, you're on par with it. Uh, Gabriel, welcome. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, my name is Gabriel Manrique, Community Organizer for LUNA. 
It is awful that the city of San Jose wants to raise a historical and cultural landmark and jeopardize the livelihoods of dozens of hardworking vendors by voting to possibly close down the various flea market. The flea market is a place where families from all over the Bay Area come to spend quality time. I started going to the flea market in the early 90s where I have fond memories of my family and friends. It is shameful that the city of San Jose will displace hardworking families from the flea market that is their only source of income. I ask the city council to not shut down the flea market and protect our vendors. Thank you. Bueno, uh, buenas tardes, ¿me escuchan? Este, estoy hablando hoy en favor de los vendedores que están este, abogando. Um, ahorita todos están en huelga de hambre y este, no es justo que ustedes uh, no los quieran escuchar porque un hombre viene y los amenaza. No entiendo cómo ustedes gente que están representando a los votantes, le tienen miedo a un millonario que está chantajeando con hacer lo que él quiere. Nuestros jóvenes están afuera. No sé qué significa esto para ustedes, pero ellos están porque ellos están representando a sus padres. Ustedes fueron elegidos por la gente. Tienen que representar a la gente, no a un millonario que trae un pañal y está llorando aquí. Gracias. Hello? Hello? We can hear you. Hello? Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Brenda Sendejas. I am calling from District 5. Uh, today I stand in solidarity with all the flea market vendors. I do want to say that, you know, David Cohen, I expected more from you. This is your district. And to not defer it for a week, I don't understand what the hurry is for you guys because a man came in here with a bad attitude claiming that he's going to build, just like Trump said, right? He's going to build a wall. He's going to build this flea market. It's unacceptable to come in with this attitude because this is people's livelihood. These are kids um, fighting for their parents. And I'm sure all of you would be doing the same thing. Um, David, Eric, and Rolando did this deal without vendors. That's not okay. Unacceptable. $2.5 million is two-ply toilet paper. It's nothing to these vendors. Thank you. Jeffrey? Um, hold on. This is Tony Tabor, city clerk. Um, the interpreters need to get onto the English channel and tell the council what Spanish speakers and Vietnamese speakers and Mandarin speakers say after they speak. Um, so if one of them could remember what the previous Spanish speaker said and could tell us what that was right now and then in the future, just immediately translate when she's done. Because I heard interpretation on the Spanish channel, but we didn't hear it on the English. Okay. Sure. Can we get some indication they've, they're fixing that now? Yeah, go ahead. I can hear you on the English channel. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you, Tony. Uh, we'll proceed, Jeffy. Yes. yes. Tony, you'll need to mute. Are we, are we good? Are we good with the interpreter stuff? Okay, sorry, apologies. Um, Jeffrey Buchanan, we have working partnerships. Ask you to please defer the item, if not, to support the Carrasco and Perales memos. The livelihoods of hundreds of working families, people of color, and immigrants hang in the balance. Those hit hardest by the pandemic, and now the city council is being asked by a wealthy family and their corporate lobbyists who came here delivering gangster-like threats that unless you deliver a gut punch to these families, they're going to take their ball and go home. The plan before you wipes out the majority of these businesses. It's disingenuous to suggest it addresses vendors' concerns. Now you're, you're seeing a, a major campaign donor slash lobbyist who's weaseled his way into every single planning decision body in our public planning process as a city, come here with the goal of enriching himself and his clients, telling you that you need to make this decision to put these businesses out of business at a time when they have not had a chance to be heard in the public process. It's despicable that we saw 
uh, a leader like David Cohen take 60 meetings, emails, and calls from Eric Shainauer and refuse to meet with labor leaders, the vendors, civil rights leaders. This is just wrong. Please defer. Kelly, welcome. Hi, thank you. My name is Kelly Fallon and I am a senior policy manager at the Bay Area Council, which is a regional public policy organization representing over 350 members of the Bay Area business community. And I'm calling to support the transit village development at the Bay Area Support Station. We hope that you will accept the conditions of approval outlined by Mayor Licardo, Council Member Cohen, and Council Member Jimenez that will allow the flea market to remain in operation while approving up to 3,450 desperately needed new housing units, including over 500 affordable units. The project also includes up to 3.4 million square feet of commercial office space, helping address the jobs and housing imbalance by bringing jobs and housing directly next to transit in the corridor of San Jose. We look forward to reading the details of this plan as they are further resolved and encourage the city council to allow the discussion to move forward to a resolution that benefits the community and supports transit-oriented development of this nature. Thank you. Thank you. Mitra, welcome. Good evening, my name is Mara Pelagio and I am here with Luna and I am extremely upset about this issue. For months, the vendors have been silenced, they have been retaliated against, and you all have been negotiating about their livelihoods without even consulting them. Who will these new jobs be for? Who will this new housing be for? The project continues to gentrify, dreadline, and displace our community members who are at the margin. I urge you to listen to the demands of the vendors who are going on a hunger strike right now and provide a 90-day pause to this vote to allow them to ne negotiate an equitable deal. $2 million would only provide about $4,000 for each vendor, which is equal to like one month of rent. This is very unfair. And again, just listen to what the vendors have to say. Thank you, I def defer the rest of my time. Thank you. Tony? Welcome. Hey. Good evening, mayors, uh, council members. Uh, my name is Tony Romero and I work with Luna. I am in solidarity with the vendors of the flea market. The vendors have demonstrated how the American dream can be achieved through entrepreneurship. You all have heard the stories of the vendors being able to send their children up to college. San Jose should be a progressive city and this is not progress. Evicting more than 400 vendors out of their workplace just to build more unaffordable and expensive housing, that's not progress. Progress should be for residents, not for developers. Thank you. Thank you. Brian? Can you hear me, Mr. Mayor, okay? Yes, we can. Um, you know me, Mr. Mayor, and some of the council does too. I went through the, a particular project. I can't mention it. I misunderstood something, and I do not hold the project accountable. I hold me, and now I'm living in a different place. I got more money for the place I was at than I would have ever gotten without it. What I'm trying to say is neighborhoods die. Places of community die. They're murdered. Now it's gonna happen because of progress. If it is, if you really wanna know what's wrong with our country, go there, ask those questions. I, I would ask you, because I know what it did to me. I, in a way I'm grateful, but People struggle, and some of the people in the community I was in, they didn't survive the process, literally. Thank you, Brian. Blair? Hi, um, I felt there was an interesting uh, negotiation process that was starting, uh, that was uh, around a few weeks ago. I hate for uh, ultimatums to happen at this time. Uh, there is a uh, you know, Cal State funding issues that the developer is currently working on that as the vendors union, we need to be clear about exactly what that is and how, you know, that process can work. Um, there are issues of vendor space, uh, vendor co-ops, and actually what I feel is as allowing the vendors union uh, decision-making in the design of the, pro of, the, of the future development. These are important things to negotiate and work towards. Uh, Let's not lock us, ourselves out of anything and collapse on this. Let's learn how to really bring this together and make this a vendor's union future of what the, the flea market will look like and for the developers to accept that. And that can be okay. Let's do it. Thanks. Thank you. Gavin? 
Hi, my name is Gavin Laurie. I'm with Catalyze SV. I uh, want to thank you, Mayor and City Council, for taking my comments. Um, while much of the focus is on the flea market, our members were also concerned about the building height limitations and density of the urban village. Uh, we believe that a billion dollar public investment in a, magic, in a major transit hub should maximize residents, workers, and visitors adjacent to the station. Um, we believe that areas within a quarter mile of these transit hubs should really push for maximum building heights of at least 500 feet unless uh, required to be less by the FAA standards. Taller buildings in the urban village would support additional residents and workers, um, and this would be good for the planet and good for the city. So although it may be too late in this process, we really push uh, future developments and future urban villages to look to maximize uh, building heights, um, especially in these areas around these important transit hubs. So thank you for taking my comments and hopefully we can see this in future plans. Thank you, Eileen. Eileen, you're still muted. You need to unmute your device so we can hear you. Good evening, um, I'm Mayor Licardo and members of council. I'm Eileen McLaughlin, resident in District 1. I'm here to support the proposal of the memorandum of the mayor and council members Cohen and Jimenez. I also want to thank council member uh, Cohen for his leadership in bringing this vendor uh, issue forward and putting it in public eye. I am really here because I can't believe it took 14 years before the city of San Jose gave the vendors a voice. What kind of city does that? Thank you. Uh, Robert? Yeah, Robert Aguirre here. Uh, I, I too wanna echo uh, what, what Jeffrey uh, Buchanan was saying about uh, not not involving people in in these a lot of these decisions, and also uh, what they were saying about um, the the density uh, from Catalyze SV. I agree with that. If you're going to be doing this, I saw that all the office and building uh, per, uh, commercial buildings were very much taller than the uh, residential. And if we're at such a shortage of, of housing right now, I don't see why in that neighborhood, the residential um, properties can't be as high as the commercial properties uh, to increase density. Uh, we're, we're badly needing of housing and this is an opportunity to be able to do this. And I don't think we should be blowing that. I also agree that, uh, that vendors should have a much more say into what's going on. This is a tradition that has been going on, uh, especially among um, immigrants into this uh, country. And uh, we're taking away that, that opportunity for people just for uh, the financial benefit of a few. Uh, also want to make sure that thank, it's not- Thank you, Robert. Uh, Tony? Yes, good evening. Uh, this is Tony Miranda. Uh, I'm representing the Silicon Valley organization, currently serving as first vice chair of the board on the executive committee and also as co-chair of our development review and housing policy committee. On behalf of the SBO, we support the recommendations offered by Mayor Licardo, council members Cohen and Jimenez, and to not further delay the project. Our position is in the record as stated in the June 18th letter submitted by our president and CEO, Derek Sieber. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Victor? Uh, ben, we'll come back to you, Victor, if you raise your hand. Thank you, Ben, uh, ben Leach, uh, Executive Director, Preservation Action Council of San Jose. Um, it was mentioned briefly, but uh, the flea market is a recognized historic resource under CEQA. Um, when um, the EIR was filed, the market um, was not considered. It doesn't show up anywhere in the market. The uh, current market area was open space. We totally um, support the progress that has been made in the last few weeks. Um, uh, everything that is good about this product has been uh, fought for, asked for by the vendors, and it's um, a testament to uh, collaboration that we got this far, but we're not there yet. Um, we have grave concerns about the viability of the market as proposed. Uh, we strongly support uh, more time to vet this. Um, we do support in concept the, um, the ideas in the, um, the various memos, especially 
um, the most recent memos that just came out today that uh, most people haven't even read. So this. Thank you. The person with their phone number ending 5140. Looks like Jeff, uh, gentrification campus, campus arrows. These guys sold you out. Sold you out, man. Perales, Carrasco, Ricardo. They sold you down the river. And now you're going to have gentrification and public transit. Awesome, isn't it? This is terrible. I can't believe that, that these city leaders sold you guys out like that. Man, I'm going to miss the flea market. 14 years, and this is, this is the bright ideas that you guys have. You guys are a bunch of sad sacks. This is like the old college try or something. This is what happens when you start removing statues and changing names and putting up lifestyle flags. This is what you get. Mass transit, this is what you get. It's going to be terrible. Wait till you take BART. It'll cost you $25 to get to uh, get, get the. Thank you, Mariana. Um, hi, I'm the BFBA president. Uh, yesterday I began in a meeting a hunger strike to demand time and justice for the vendors. My life and my livelihood will be on your hands. As District 4 resident, I'm extremely dis dis uh, dissatisfied and offended how negotiation process between David Cohen and the applicant has taken place. Behind closed doors, we're claiming to be working with the vendors, which they didn't. They didn't have translated in the last meeting. Two weeks ago, after our input was requested, uh, the applicant and the four asked for our opinion and we gave it to them. We did, we, we wrote a delayed uh, process and they didn't do anything. Um, they, the bums, Cohen, Ricardo, and James, your projects are insufficient, have no regards and no, no, no guarantee for the, for the flea market, have little security for the vendors. Uh, our impact, the impact that you guys are going to have is going to be extremely. I will go on a hunger strike and, and I will not stop until the demands are met and my life will be on your hands and I, I will not stop. This is not sufficient and this is not okay for you for 20 years. You're, 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 this is the only plan you have. You do not work with Ben. Uh, thank you, Joanne. Hello, my name is Joanne Martinez. I'm a vendor at the Napa Valley uh, Vallejo Flea Market speaking today in solidarity of my fellow vendors. Um, all eyes are on the city of San Jose and the Baum family landowners. You are becoming the template for flea market redevelopment for decades to come. COVID has had a huge effect on businesses worldwide. Offices are dying. For example, on San Francisco, Twitter has gone virtual. The Berryessa Bar Urban Village Area Plan, in my opinion, is now becoming obsolete in regards to um, its planned employment growth. I recommend to council to include in this document additional COVID effects on businesses. Lastly, bringing in anchor stores that provide minimum wage jobs does not compare to hundreds of self-employed business owners. Thank you for, for your time and please defer this item 90 days to discuss uh, the points made, made by the speakers. Thank you, Mike. Mike LaBarbera, 50 year resident of San Jose. Uh, principal Terra Commercial Real Estate. I'd just like to speak in favor of both uh, things before the council tonight, but I'd like to focus on the urban village specifically. There's a lot of talk about the flea market property, but there are other properties involved in this, specifically the Pacino property. There's been uh, many years of work with many people, including the city, to come up with a plan that meets the city's needs for housing. On the, on the Pacino property, there's over 650 units proposed. 120 which will be below market rate units. It's exactly the kind of the project that we have been instructed by the city that they want. And we please ask for a positive vote tonight so that we can bring this project forward to fruition. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Evelyn. Hi everyone, this is Evelyn. And I've been standing by my brother who is the BFBA president. Um, I've been fasting just so he can, so I could support him. You guys claim you guys are going to do or building more jobs when you guys are simply taking jobs away from people that are dependent on the flea market. I render my time. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth. 
Hi, my name is Elizabeth and I'm a community member. I've lived in San Jose for six years and I strongly am um, in support of the flea market as it is. Um, it's really racist and unfair to be um, kicking folks out and just gentrifying the area. It's a really dumb idea too, because I know the city is striving to make this a city like a destination city, but it doesn't make sense when you're taking away culture, you're taking away what makes San Jose special. And so the more you do that, the less people are gonna come. And it's really not fair to be doing that um, because it's a place that many people come to and connect. Um, and the whole process has just been unfair for the vendors. Um, and so this is really an institutional racist act that y'all are doing and you wouldn't do it. And if it came to little Italy or little Portugal, you wouldn't even be having this conversation. So um, thank you. God. Thank you. Chaba? Yeah, good evening. Uh, Chaba Bustamante with uh, Latinos United for New America. I'm here tonight to ask for a uh, deferral on the recommendation to approve the rezoning of the uh, Berea's uh, uh, flea market. Uh, uh, the vendors need time to renegotiate the backroom deal negotiated by uh, Council Member Cohen and the bump family reflected in the, your uh, mayor, uh, Mr. Ricardo. Uh, you know, I, it'll be a shame if this uh, council were to give in to the gangster-like threats uh, made by Mr. Scheinhauer. Um, you know, lastly, I would like to express my gratitude to uh, council members Carrasco, Perales, and Jones for really listening to the vendors' concerns and for re uh, responding to those concerns in their memos. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Vince? Good evening, Mayor and Council. Vince Rocha with the Silicon Valley Leadership Group. We support this rezoning as part of a smart, climate-friendly, transit-oriented development with hundreds of affordable homes uh, that will be built. Um, and we support the memo by Mayor Licardo, Cohen, and Jimenez. And if the Council passes this tonight, I think the staff presentation is clear. This isn't the end of the conversation and working with vendors. It is uh, the, really the beginning of a lot of exciting ideas and re-envisioning um, new opportunities in, uh, for our city working with um, the vendors. So I really do see a lot of upside here and certainly um, appreciate the council support on these items. Thank you. Alex? Alex, Executive Director, Catalyze SV. Council members Foley, Jones, and Mahan. Let's start with what we all agree on. We all want a fantastic development to happen. One way to get there, pass conditions of approval tonight that are as ironclad as possible to protect the vendors from being pushed out of our community. The cohen Licardo memo, memo doesn't do that. Please excuse my expression of anger, but you are the gosh darn San Jose City Council. You are the authority to approve projects. You determine what's best for the city and our community, not a single family or a single lobbyist telling you, take it or leave it. What Eric Shainauer said for the last few years was, here's what we proposed, take it or leave it. Then David Cohen worked with the landowners, but not the vendors to negotiate a better project. What Eric said again tonight is take it or leave it. Thank you. Waskar? Can you hear me? Yes. Welcome. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Waskar Castro Working Partnerships, and we're here proudly alongside the Bay Area Market Vendors Association uh, and fellow coalition members who have been supportive of the vendors in their fight for justice and representation. While the numbers have varied, several hundred vendors rely on the current flea market sites to sell goods and provide for their families. By displacing the vast majority of vendors, as the currently proposed rezoning would do, we are only adding to the city's current issue of displacement, and we are moving in the wrong direction in terms of racial equity. These vendors deserve resources, support, and an opportunity to voice to have a voice in the operations of a new market. For that reason, we would like to support a deferral. If a deferral is not able to get done to give the opportunity to come to some sort of an agreement, we would support recommendations laid out by Council Member Carrasco, uh, as well as Council Member Perales. Uh, we really think that we'd like to call out the entire process here and, uh, and give the vendors a real voice on this matter. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Natalie? 
Can you hear me? Yes. Great, thank you. Good evening, Natalie Matei, Director of Real Estate for Safeway. As a proud union grocer that has operated in the city of San Jose for almost 100 years, Safeway has been a part of the community fabric for a very long time. As the city has grown, Safeway has grown with it. Today, we operate 14 grocery stores in San Jose, including the new Market Park Safeway that just opened on April 28th at 1455 Berryessa. If you haven't had an opportunity to visit the state-of-the-art 65,000 square foot supermarket, I welcome you to come visit. Safeway opened at Market Park based on the assumption that the city would continue to support the development of substantially more residential in the immediate neighborhood. We encourage the city to not delay the long planned housing development here. Thank you for your leadership and thank you for your consideration of our comments. Thank you, Jorge. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Jorge Casas, a member of Luna and resident of District 7. Uh, the flea market, La Pulga, is an important cultural and economic hub for vendors, their families, and the community at large. Families and people go to La Pulga to shop, eat, dance, and play. It is a theme park for families and people. Uh, and five acres is not enough for our community members who are on a constant grind for their livelihoods and their passion to serve the community of San Jose and beyond. Respect for leaders outside of City Hall today fasting as an act of resistance. <laughs> I'm extremely concerned that the current plans pose a danger of survival and dignity to the vendors and their families. I want to express gratitude and support for the latest memos from Councilmember Perales, Jones, and Carrasco. I join the vendors and community members today in requesting more time to be able to clearly understand what is being proposed and to ensure that the plans don't leave vendors and their families behind. Thank you. Thank you. Anthony? Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, sorry. Uh, okay, so at this point, you have heard countless times that many livelihoods depend on the flea market. However, it does not seem that you are the Bum family cares. I find it inhumane that the vendors were silenced and ignored. Everyone who knows the Bum family knows they have an abundance of wealth. In fact, some of your campaigns have been funded by it. It's obvious that we are faced with a conflict of interest. Given this, I honestly don't think you realize the gravity of, this, of the situation. It is paramount that the Bums do right by the vendors, for it is through them that their wealth grows. Yet they show no gratitude, and instead they have disregarded their livelihoods, my family's livelihood. I implore that you support the vendors. At the end of the day, the bums and the city will make money, but the vendors won't. I see that you all show interest to do right, but the intention is not there. Five acres will just simply not suffice. Remember that you were all chosen to represent the people of this city. Do so, act in favor of vendors, and defer. It is quite literally the right thing to do. If you have the slightest belief in the contrary, then you are quite foolish in every sense of the word. Thank you, uh, Jose. Hi, thank you, uh, Council Member, for your guys' time. Uh, my name is Jose Wall. Um, I'm just going to state this out uh, clearly as honest as uh, there's plenty of liars on the scene. I've been working at the flea market for 20 years. Unfortunately, Eric has never communicated with any of the vendors there, for as he stated for the last 21 years. That we have not heard. From from him, we have not even had any communication or transaction or email or any of that sort. So, Eric, thank you for being a forked tongue, and now we know who you are. For not including us on the table for uh, negotiating our livelihood on the uh, replacement or the building development of the flea market, how dare you guys not even consider us on the table? You guys say you transparency, you're here for the people. You haven't even shown that you're here for the people, and unfortunately, we're the one being stuck in the middle with your propaganda saying that you actually care when in reality, we're telling you we're being left behind. So put us at the table, be adults, and actually let's get to a real solution to this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kay? Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Kay Lerez Quevedo, and I am the secretary of BFBA. I am disheartened to see how little has changed since we became aware of these plans and, and began raising our voices. Today, you are being asked to vote on a half-baked proposal. We're now hearing that the applicant is trying the city directly, that if you don't vote today, they will, they will walk away and build the 07 project. This is exactly the kind of so-called so collaboration and engagement that we experienced. Since the first day, we began asking questions regarding our future. Eric Shane Howard's so-called open houses late last year, which only happened after vendors and community raised concerns about the total lack of 
engagement in the process um, told us that now was not the time to engage in the process. We now know why they feared our activation at this time, because it is, a, it is at this point in the process that we as a vendor, the community, and yes, the city have the greatest ability to change and to make a change. We don't want any more disingenuous dis apologies. We don't want any more attempts to placate or manipulate vendors. We want actions and concrete plans. Thank you. Thank you, Lana. Go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Loud and clear. Hi, it's Lana, by the way. Um, yeah. Hello, my name is Lana and I'm a current resident in District 1. I've lived in San Jose my entire life. Going up here in San Jose means that I've gone to the flea market for 30 plus years. The flea market represents the heart and culture of San Jose and it's important to preserve what little we have left. The flea market is essential for the livelihoods of hundreds of vendors. We are all still trying to recover from a pandemic. The homes that you want to put in place of the flea market will not even be affordable to the working class people. Stop prioritizing developers and tech businesses and listen to the people. We, the people of San Jose, demand that the flea market does not close. I also fully support all the demands of the vendors. Stop the displacement, stop the gentrification, and save the flea market. I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Roberto, go ahead. Hi, my name is Roberto, the president of the Berryessa Flea Market Vendors Association. And today, Eric Shainauer showed exactly how this process has played out. His way of demanding and saying that there will pull out of everything is a microcosm of this process. Him and David Cohen have been doing backdoor deals without the vendors in the forefront. And that's what we're asking for today. Involve the vendors, involve the community. It's not fair or right that we have been hidden or put in the shadow for so long. We're asking for a deferral on this vote so that we can collaborate, collaborate and find a solution that will be beneficial for everyone. It's been far too long that the city has been inactive and has not done any actions with this issue. And now in the span of two weeks, they wanna say it's all clear and done. I do wanna thank council member Carrasco and Perales for stepping up to the plate as well as uh, vice mayor Jones. Thank you, uh, Ms. Devin. Hi, can you hear me? Loud and clear. Perfect. My name is Devin Gonzalez, and I'm a concerned resident of District 5. I have more than a dozen family and friends who work at the flea market and make a living there from selling at the market. I urge the commissioners to delay the vote for 90 days so that the VFVA can enter in direct negotiations for a truly beneficial agreement. The BFVA and the vendors deserve to have an input and inclusion in the flea market plans. This process has been flawed and we need a transparent process that we can trust. The vendors and the community do not deserve to be left behind again. Thank you, I yield the rest of my time. Thank you, Emily. Hi, can you hear me? Loud and clear. Good evening, Mayor, L Mayor Licardo and council members. My name is Emily Martinez and my family and I are residents of District 6. I would like to echo what a previous speaker said. This conversation would not even be taking place if Little Italy were on the chopping block. I support the 90 day deferral period proposed by the Bay Area Flea Market Vendors Association. Do not let yourselves be bullied by the Bum family and their lobbyists. I would like that the flea market stay, but if it has to close, then I support the memo put forward by council member Carrasco. Thank you, I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Aureli, Aureli. Hi, uh, this is actually Jonathan Velasquez, president of the Seven Trees Neighborhood Association, community organizer. Uh, my phone died, so I'm using hers. Um, I'm calling in support of the vendors today uh, the various the flea market has always been a incubator for small businesses. My mother started uh, her business there before moving on to a retail location. This is an integral part of our city. It's integral for communities of color, uh, also to support women-owned businesses. 
um, who happen to thrive and be under here. What we have seen is a lack of transparency and complete unjust process in supporting the vendors who are at risk of losing their entire livelihoods. Uh, what I say to the council is that we're looking at how you vote today. We're keeping these receipts and come election time, we will hold you accountable. I yield my time. Thank you. Uh, Dayanera? Go ahead. Go ahead. Looks like we lost her. Um, Susanna? Uh, buenas noches. Uh, como vendedor de la free market, Solamente quiero mantener mi negocio para poder llevar lo necesario a mi hogar. Entiendo que um, es necesario que tengamos una extensión más de 90 días para tener mejores acuerdos. Quiero uh, tener un lugar donde poder llegar y con, uh, construir nuevamente todos los sueños que tenemos para poder salir, uh, para ser exitosos en estos negocios, seguir pagando impuestos y uh, estar dentro de la ciudad de San José. Nos hemos visto desplazados no solamente Eh, en nuestro negocio, si en, nuestro, en nuestras viviendas, nuestras familias se están apartando porque no pueden pagar las rentas. Y es importante para tener un mejor acuerdo con um, los, los dueños de la pulga y la ciudad de tener un lugar donde, donde poder movernos. Eso es todo. Thank you. Thank you Yes, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, my name's Rob Ficino. I'm the managing owner of Berryessa Properties. Um, and I just want the council to know that, you know, we're ready to invest in this urban village area. Um, there's much needed housing, uh, much needed affordable housing, which we're building, and parks also. Um, I would really encourage the city council to please vote yes on this tonight um, so we can move forward. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Hi, this is Tony Tabor, City Clerk. Can we go back to have the interpreter on the English Channel say what the last speaker said? Yes. Yes, Tony. Go ahead. Tony, we can't hear anything. Hello. Oh, there we go. Uh, I'm Amanda. I'm a lifelong community member here. I am calling in opposition to the redevelopment plan. It's despicable and racist. It's clearly just a job to take a plan to take jobs away from the POC community who have lived here for decades. Um, the vendors are on a hunger strike while the Bum family can't even bother to show up. Instead, they send Eric to lie, condescend, and threaten as not part of the community and they don't even care. We don't need lip service from Sam about hearing vendors and listening to vendors and then taking away their livelihoods. We need a guaranteed spot for every single vendor or no new development plan. I want, I want to ask you city council members, when was the last time you had this turn out to a city council meeting? Your job is to take care of the community. If you take our jobs away from us, we will take your jobs away from you. I think we might have lost Sam. Um, Hello. No, I was muted again. If someone could please stop muting so I can call the next person in line. Thank you. Eunice? Hi, hello. My name is Eunice Santiago, and I am not actually from San Jose. I am actually from Seattle, Washington. Um, I think the fact that I took time out of my day to come here and you know sit through the whole city council meeting um, and to see the 
city council enthusiastically um, vote yet, yes for police reform, but then enthusiastically vote no for this matter um, is very telling of um, how committed they are to seeing people of color safe and sound and in homes and not unhoused. Um, because unfortunately, that is what's going to happen if uh, the flea market is closed. Not only that, but um, two million dollars is not enough for the vendors. Um, you are going to be closing a, a lot of small businesses, as we know, is the backbone of our economy. Thank you. Thank you, Roland. Thank you. When I first came to San Jose in 1984, <clears throat> I asked my IBM co-workers where residents spend their weekends in San Jose. The answer was a flea market, so that's where we had it every weekend. London has a long history of flea markets as incubators, and there is such a market on the east side called Petticoat Lane. Wikipedia mentions that this is where Alan Sugar started his business empire. But what Wikipedia does not mention is that Richard Branson used to have a stall on Petticoat Lane in 1969. He was selling records, and that stall is what started Virgin Records the following year. Thank you, and I look forward to your thoughtful deferral. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Welcome. Yeah. Hi, hello. Uh, thank you. I'm a community member in support of the various uh, flea market vendors um, and uh, request that the council and the mayor uh, move forward with the deferral of this. Um, so you get the an equitable chance for the vendors to have a plan so that they are not displaced and that there is a plan to accommodate their livelihood. I believe the city has an obligation to these community members, to these vendors, as they are a part of your community. And it is short-sighted to assume that progress must mean that while, you know, that progress for the city must mean displacement of marginalized communities. Um, if the city and the council truly believe in, you know, equitable justice, social justice, listening to the people, you know, this is the work supporting people like the vendors here and communities that are fighting for their livelihoods here. That Thank you. Uh, Keila? Uh, Keila, we're not able to hear you. Your device appears to be muted. Please unmute. There you go. Hi, I'm Kayla, treasurer of the Bresa Flea Market Vendors Association. My family has had their business at the flea market for 20 plus years. Both development process have been since the 20, 2008 exclusionary and inequitable. Although vendors, workers, and patrons of the market are most directly impacted stakeholders, it was only until the end of 2020 that the applicant applicant conducted any direct outreach at the market. By then, multiple community meetings had been held, the BBUV plan draft had been released and the environmental impact report comment period was closed. The process has consi consisted of attempts to dim diminish vendor voices and concerns without a careful study and safeguards to protect our future and ensure the market's future. It would have been nice if the city officials had paid an ounce of the attention to our future as they have given it to having new offices built where our source of li livelihood sit. I want to thank council member Perales and Carrasco and Jones for their memos. However, we need more time so that all vendors in that community can understand what is being proposed and ensure that. Thank you, Emily. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hello, mayor and city council. My name is Emily, district five. Thank you for hearing my public comment. I grew up in San Jose and the flea market was a part of my family weekend since I was very young. I am using my voice in solidarity of La Pulga vendors. I am extremely upset about San Jose threatening the livelihoods of thousands of vendors who have been here for generations and silencing their voices and potentially closing down the various flea market. I cannot believe y'all think it is okay to even touch the flea market. This is food for families. This is the livelihood of our community. We are in the middle of COVID recovery. 
I have concerns about the racist genderfied motives with the current plans and don't see any of this keeping the east side in mind. Don't leave vendors behind like y'all did in 2007. The plot, the process is flawed and racist. I am in full support with council members Perales, Carrasco, and Vice uh, uh, Mayor Jones memos. Do your job and look out for the community that makes San Jose. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Luis? Hello, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Hi, um, good evening, Mayor and City Council members. Uh, my name is Luis. I come to you as a proud son of immigrant parents um, who found a way to become business owners and provide for their family through their small business at the flea market. This opportunity helped my brothers uh, and I um, go through the local community college and to graduate from San Jose State University debt free. Um, we have now grown up to be professionals in three, three different sectors of the economy that still contribute to this great city of San Jose. I come in full support of the vendors um, who have been a part of this and who will help make the flea market what it is today. Um, it is a shame to hear um, that the city and flea market owners are moving forward and taking steps to consider removing a part of the soul of what makes San Jose so wonderful to begin with. Um, by accepting gentrification and pushing the very folks who contribute to the cultural richness that is in San Jose and all for profit. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, Jacqueline. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Jacqueline Farias and I stand in solidarity with the vendors. I currently live in Sunnyville and I have been going to the flea market for 15 years now. It was a huge part of my childhood and I hoped it would have been a part of my children's childhoods as well. The flea market is not only iconic to San Jose, but it also allows hundreds of immigrants to make a living. Gentrifying this area is ridiculous. Do not take away this historical landmark. I urge you to not displace the vendors. These vendors need resources, not displacement. Give them a voice and defer the vote. Please save La Pulga. Thank you. Thank you. Fire night. Welcome. Your device is muted right now, so we're not able to hear you until you unmute your device. Fire night, your device is still muted. If you can unmute your device, we'll be able to hear you. Um, we'll go to Bob and we'll come back to Fire Night when uh, that person's able to unmute their device. Bob, welcome. Bob, please unmute your there you go. Bob, we're not able to hear you right now, Bob. Bob, you may have an old version of so uh, the software. Yeah, we're not able to hear you. Uh, Bob, there must be a problem with the device. We're not able to hear anything you're saying right now. We're gonna go to Maria and we'll come back to Bob if Bob is able to enable you know, the device to function. Maria, welcome. Bienvenido. Uh, no podemos oírse. Uh, let me ask our my colleague. Buenas noches. Uh, buenas, Maria. Ah, uh, mi nombre es Maria. Ah, uh, yo solo quiero decir que sacar a esos vendedores de la pulga es afectar a todo toda la ciudad de San José. Ahí está el patrimonio de las familias, um, están sus vidas, están los estudios de sus hijos, están sus viviendas, está su comida. Y quererlos desplazar por alguien que tiene bastante dinero y que quiere seguir haciendo más, se nos hace injusto. Es um, triste ver cómo se les amenaza y decirles que hasta se les va a desalojar porque el dueño del terreno tiene las prioridades. Creo que tenemos que darles más tiempo para que ellos puedan negociar lo que es mejor para ellos y que también las otras personas salgan beneficiadas en un acuerdo común. Gracias. Hi, before we go on to the next speaker, can we have the interpreter um, interpret that, please?
Uh, this is Tony. The mayor's audio seems to have gone out. He's not muted. Um, All right. Um, so Tony, we're not able to get the translation. It's, it's not working or what's what's going on? The, the translation person, um, if you switch to the English channel, he actually already completed. So we're ready to go to our next speaker. Okay. Uh, so G. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Sajid Khan. I'm a San Jose resident, and I've served as a public defender here in the county for the last 13 years. I grew up going to the flea market with my mom and have represented many young family members rely on the flea market for their livelihoods. I stand with the vendors of the flea market who are calling upon the city council to defer their vote tonight by 90 days so that they may have their voices heard and so that we as a city can honor uh, their dignity, especially as they represent many of the marginalized and immigrant communities in our beautiful city. Thank you very much. Thank you. Carlos? Saludos. My name is Carlos Velasquez. I'm a native of San Jose and a resident of District 6. I urge you to take a stand and defer this vote. Like Paul from Horseshoe said, the words and attitude of Mr. Schoenauer are a textbook example of institutional racism. His words sounded more like a threat than a reflection of working with the vendors in an equitable manner. What is being offered to the vendors are breadcrumbs, and we know that the vendors who end up in their proposed market space will not be the current vendors. I love San Jose. I love it con todo mi corazón. When friends visit from out of state, you bet I take them to La Pulga, not Santana Row, not San Pedro Square, La Pulga. This city desperately needs to protect its history and to honor the people and businesses who were here long before those who will live in this new urban village. Take a stand to protect the stories, people, and businesses that make up the real San Jose. Defer this vote for more time. Thank you. Thank you. Victor? Buenas noches, Victor Vasquez, resident of San Jose, worker at Soma of Mayfair. It is true what my folks have said that discussing the development of, on stolen land is real. Obtain, it's been obtained through displacement and we're discussing the potential displacement of 450 families, a destruction of a cultural and economic institution for the Latino and marginalized community. We are in a dire situation with the pandemic, ongoing displacement of residents, and now we see continuous displacement of small family business owners or flea market vendors, like we call them. It is a dangerous sign of our times and we must unite. Yet we ask, the, we ask you for uh, a time to defer and to listen to the vendors. They're outside fasting because they're desperate and have no other options. They're willing to trade their lives for, to encourage your mora morality, your values. They believe in you as a council to support them. I'll, please stand yeah. with the vendors. And thank you. We thank you to thank Council you. Member Carrasco and Perales for your memos. Thank you, Chris. Hello, my name is Chris Lepe, and I urge you to defer a decision before you tonight. I support the memos by Carrasco, Perales, and Jones, but more time is needed. I want to thank those city officials that have started to come to the table over the last few weeks to problem solve. But quite frankly, a few weeks is no replacement for a multi-year process of neglect of those most impacted by development. Rushing the decision has resulted in gaping holes in the so-called plans for La Pulga 2.0 with little to no assessment. For example, in the development standards of the BBUB plan, permitted uses in the public parks open space section permit other uses besides the flea market. There is no guarantee that a flea market will be the only use permitted within the five acres. The BBUV plan and rezoning project is exactly the kind of planning that has created deep racial and social inequities across the nation and our city. I urge you to take a small temporary step back in order to take a big step forward with trust and transparency with the community today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the person with the phone number ending 4475, welcome. David Cohen, gentrifying Latinos from District 4. 
to match his lifestyle of living. He wants a park to walk his dog, custom families, their livelihood, and displacing them, removing the minorities out. Maybe he doesn't want to see them. Safely, lady, I hope that check was worth it. You're a gentrifier. Parking has gone up. They're discouraging people from coming to the flea market because they don't want anyone to continue supporting them. Eric and the Bump family, shame on you. You come in here and bull, bully these people. I hope you guys grow some balls and stand up for yourselves. Thank you. Uh, Tessa? Tessa, you're, you're, you're muted at this time. Tessa, you're still muted. Uh, Luis? Sí, entonces, eh, yo quiero decir primero que nada que me inspira la lucha de los vendedores. Mi familia y yo también somos vendedores allí, hemos sido vendedores en varios lugares. Y también estoy preocupado porque están haciendo una huelga de hambre, Está, están aquí afuera del, del City Hall y no parece haber ninguna respuesta de, del gobierno. Es una pena y es vergonzoso que la familia Bomb y Eric, Eric Schoenhauer estén amenazando a los, a los, a los servidores públicos. Lo que, lo que eso se representa es una mafia nada más. Eso es solamente una mafia que amenaza a los vendedores, amenaza al gobierno de San José, está amenazando a Sam Licardo. Una frase como esa de Eric Schoenhauer es una amenaza directa a Sam Licardo. Entonces, ¿quién manda en esta ciudad? ¿Manda los, los votantes, el gobierno o la familia Bomb y Eric Schoenhauer? Thank you. Uh... She, again, Tony, this is Tony. Let's let the interpreter interpret. Citlali. Citlali, hi. Yes, my name is Citlali Martinez, and I am from San Francisco but my father worked at the Concord Flea Market, which led to his opening of his store in Oakland. Like many of the Berryessa vendors, he used that income to better the livelihood of his family. I asked the council to defer. My community has been let down by richer and more network politicians before, so I don't expect much, but surprise us. I believe this is bad business. This is how the bum family treats vendors that lined their pockets and gave them good business for the past decades. This is how they treat them. And I hope the people responsible for the rezoning and their beneficiaries are never put in the position the vendors were forced into. This is something you don't forget. The children of these vendors are growing up and they are joining the, they are joining the, the people at their playing field. And they will not forget this either. I give up my time. Thank you. Tamara? District 3. I'm um, calling in support of the various flea market vendors. And I believe that in order for us to make sure that we have an economic justice in this area that has so many vast opportunities um, for people, we need to make sure that we're working with uh, people who have their own small businesses. The people who are working in the various flea market own their own small businesses and you are intentionally displacing 450 of them by choosing to profit over housing. That is very disgraceful. And as was mentioned before, these people are gonna remember what you're doing. We're all gonna remember what you're doing when you all are running again for different levels of, of elected uh, positions in this area. And you need to think about how you're, you're coming off. You're seeming as if you only care about money and not people and their livelihoods. Thank you, Maria. Uh, yes, I am here in support of the flea market vendors and their request um, to defer the vote um, and also echo the concerns of other 
uh, con uh, constituents who have voiced concerns about uh, council members being sublimely threatened by the investors. Also, just a quick note to the people saying that this is for affordable housing, um, unless you're referring to a million dollar plus home, sure. Um, to everyone who is here, I urge you, um, keep every single person here accountable come election season from the mayor to any person who is running for the position of mayorship, uh, which includes the, uh, Dev Davies. Um, so hold them accountable. I want to see you all outside of city hall meeting supporting the vendors as well. Um, I yield the rest of my time. Thank you, Francisco. I, I am um, in support of the Vendors Association. Um, I was a vendor for more than 30 years at the flea market. I am a first generation of the flea market. And my son and grandson are now the second and third generation of vendors. Um, and uh, the, the owner's representative just show how they handle their business. Is their way or their way, you know, allowing 90 days to defer this, uh, this, uh, this opportunity is to have the opportunity to have a win-win situation. I don't know what is the rush. Uh, let's listen to these people because the flea market represents the livelihood of many, many residents here in San Jose. Thank you. Thank you. Victoria? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, my name is Victoria Partida. I'm a resident of District 7, and I'm here to ask for more transparency as you allow developments like developments like this. With projects like this, you really highlight who is important to you, and I can tell you that it's not the vendors or the residents. I ask that you start looking at your policies and not creating more gentrification in communities of color. I ask that you delay the vote by 90, day, by 90 days and allow the vendors to have more voice in the negotiation process. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next. Hi, my name is Nick. I'm a, a District 4 resident, uh, 15 year San Jose resident. I'm calling in support of the various uh, uh, flea market vendors. Um, it's pretty telling that uh, the people who um, are on the opposite side of this are almost all, frankly, lobbyists and uh, like real estate people. Um, you know, I think it's important to think about what has given this land value over the course of the last, what, like 50 years? It's the vendors. They pay the rents. They do the business. They're funneling this family money. They, they deserve a voice and a 90-day deferral is not a big ask. And that threat from um, Eric the lobbyist was unbelievable. Um, just real snake stuff. And uh, please do the deferral. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Jesus? Yes, uh, Honorable Mayor and Council Members. My name is Jesus Flores, President of the Latino Business Foundation, Silicon Valley. I am calling in support of the vendors of the Berryessa flea market, requesting that you please defer this item for 90 days to give the vendors the opportunity to continue negotiating with the landowners. Tonight, you have a group of vendors and supporters outside of City Hall risking their health and possibly their lives to support the commi their commitment to their fellow vendors. They are just asking for an opportunity to continue fighting for their well being for their businesses and for their families. Please show some humanity and defer this item for 90 days. Give them the opportunity they are asking for. I also want to express my gratitude to Council Members Carrasco, Perales, and Vice Mayor Jones for their recommendations. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the person with the name Zoom user. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, my name is Adriana Chavez Lopez and I'm a resident of District 3. 
I'm an MFT intern and I'm calling because I'm concerned about the vendors' livelihoods. I am support of the vendors. Please listen to our community members and defer this vote. There are vendors outside in the cold right now who are doing a hunger strike because they want to keep their jobs. We need to listen to our Berryessa vendors and work with them. Please do not displace our vendors. Thank you. Thank you. Terrence? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Terrence Magno. I've been fasting for 34 hours now in solidarity with a hunger strike. Um, I'm an engineer and my wife and I are new homeowners and therefore taxpayers in Northern District 3 near the flea market. We chose this neighborhood because of the diversity and representation of people who look like us. We're the children of brown and Asian immigrants. And because, and because this was just not just another cookie cutter tech worker playground. From visiting the market, market and connecting with the vendors, we've become very proud to be in this neighborhood. Decimating the acreage and displacing its vendors would dismember the cultural heart and soul of the city and deals a death blow to a source of community for people of color like ourselves in a vehicle for upward mobility, entrepreneurship, and business incubation like what was shared about Richard Branson. Now points have been made about housing, parks, but what we're asking for is maintaining a space for residents to make an honest living. And now you wanna tear it off as if it were a mere Band-Aid. Animal and plant populations get even more considerate assessment. Thank you, Veronica. Veronica, we're not able to hear you. Could you please unmute your device? Veronica, your device appears to be muted right now, so we can't hear you speaking. Okay, Dama. Delma, could you please unmute your device? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Um, okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Delma Hernandez. I am a, a domestic violence advocate at Extra Solutions, and I'm also a volunteer of Luna Latinos General for New America. I'm here in solidarity with the Bay Area flea market vendors. Um, and I, as many people have mentioned that the Bay Area flea market is a livelihood to to so many people, I also just want to um, share that although I have been a domestic violence advocate for only a year now, um, it doesn't take much to see how the current plan uh, by Bon Cohen and Licardo um, is abusive toward our various flea market vendors. The Bon family is using power and control tactics such as isolating vendors from the development that is directly impacting them, using coercion, threats, and intimidation as well, along with um, with uh, minimizing our story and, and, and the vendor's experience. So I um, wanna make sure that, that the vendors are, are respected, are, um, are within the same. Um... Thank you. Uh, Serena? Hi, my name is Serena Arnold and I've lived in San Jose my entire life, North San Jose to be specific. I just want to say I'm in support of the vendors. You guys need to defer this vote definitely so that they can have a chance to actually get onto the table and not do these back door deals. The, the fact is, is that all the people in support of it are people that aren't going to be affected by it. Safeway having a lower sales margin is not the same as these people losing jobs. Okay, and let's be clear, the Bum family rep put a, a threat out there. Take what we give you or it all goes away. Just like so many in power have done throughout history. They did the same when they kicked out the leaders of the association using police force in a predominantly immigrant market. Like this isn't rocket science. Council members, you're our representatives. You're supposed to represent our interests as a community. And so we are demanding that you defer time so that we can actually get at the table. These people, like they said, are risking their lives. They're outside of the chamber today. Uh, thank you, Olga. Uh, hello, everyone. Olga Media, in support of current um, various flea market where small businesses thrive like a sweet honey beehive, which attracts community to be fed, taken care of. The flea market helps San Jose families and many other cities to stay positive and active, release the stress before pandemic, during and after this landmark. Um, done so for the last uh, 60 years. 
We have um, a lot of elderly people work there for many years, many generations thrives there. I also see that you're trying to break rich historical and cultural place and let them learn from your specialists and associations. Apparently, those associations and specialists cannot even help you emptying out shopping center with much bigger pockets. None of you work there and um, to understand the deep inside of the soul of San Jose, which actually we need to be proud of. Thank you, Olga. Uh, I I mentioned I'm going to conclude uh, public comment at 1045 so we can get uh, a, a motion before council. Uh, Mayra Flores. Good evening, Mayor Licardo and council. My name is Mayra Flores, a district three resident and a daughter of San Jose. I would not be here today had it not been for the opportunity that the flea market gave to my family. I'm here to speak and say that while the project before you may have been the right one when it was first proposed, the world has changed and it is no longer the best project for our community. Setting aside the inadequacies outlined by Mr. Schoenhauer as part of this project, including the lack of actual density, I think that we can all agree that the community engagement process was not equitable, nor was it transparent and certainly did not include the vendors impacted. Do not put the burden of our housing shortage on the backs of our communities of color and do not devalue the economic impact to their lives and futures. Not only is this short-sighted approach, it gives everyone watching a clear picture of who we really are. Is this who we Thank you. Uh, Deanira? Danita, your device is muted. Welcome, bienvenido. Sí, bueno. Yo, yo soy Eri Baena y, y estoy hablando en el teléfono de mi esposa, Danita Rodríguez. Sí, ella es mi esposa. Nosotros como vendedores por más de 20 años estamos pidiendo que se nos, que se nos incluya en todo este plan. Queremos que por favor nos, ponen, nos tomen en cuenta y aquí nosotros estamos sufriendo por todo esto. Una extensión de 90 días, la verdad, nos da mucha ayuda para poder ver qué va a ser nuestro futuro y también gracias al apoyo de los concejales que pusieron que pusieron a favor que se pueda extender todo esto. Muchas gracias. Gracias. I'm going to pause for a moment to allow for the translation. Okay, Amanda. Hello, my name is Amanda Valenzuela. I'm a constituent from District 3. Um, I just want to take a moment to share with you that if you have never been a vendor yourself, let me remind you what it's like to be a vendor. Um, if you have to pack up all your materials in your car, wake up at four, five in the morning, maybe three in the morning, just to set everything up. And not only set everything up, but be your salesman, your advocate, you are doing everything. And to not take that into consideration, vendors are outside right now in front of city hall on a hunger strike. Don't take away their livelihood. Thank you, Liliana. Hi, can Liliana. you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, so my name is Liliana. I'm in District 5. I have friends that work at the flea market also. Why are we not making affordable housing? That's why there is so much homeless. And this is not going to help us at all in the long run. You're taking away our kids' playgrounds, 
places where they need to be outdoors. People are complaining about mental health, anxiety. You're saying that all the future kids are only going to be able to work at McDonald's? It's ridiculous. I mean, all these people need somewhere to work, somewhere to be, learn to be educated. I come from a single parent, and it was hard for her to have two jobs. And now you're telling us that we cannot even have an economical increase and help ourselves as immigrants for our future. I mean, we need to. We need time. And we need to help our people. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Honor Ruth? Sí, mi no, eh, ¿me escuchan? Buenas noches. Sí. Bienvenido. Mi nombre es Ana Calderón. Vendo en La Pulga por más, por más de 30 años. Por favor, por favor, lo que les pido es que retrasen el voto por 90 días para que podamos para que podamos, que nos puedan incluir en el, presentar un plan donde nos incluyen y no nos desplacen. Para muchos de nosotros, esa es nuestra única fuente de ingresos. Por favor, apoyen al, a la concejal Carrasco y a Jones y a Perales. Por favor, retrasen el voto por 90 días, por favor. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you. Verónica. Great. Hi, everyone. My name is Veronica, and I'm a San Jose resident, and I'm here and stand strong in solidarity with the flea market vendors and their requests to extend time. And the fact that they are putting a lot of danger because the alternative understand is Veronica, we're not able to hear you right now. Appears to be a problem with the device. Who's okay? Can you hear me now? Yes. Who's actually running the city? Is it the city government or is it actually the Bump family and that Eric person, whoever threatened the city council to end everything if they didn't comply? Um, again, I stand here strong with the vendors as their lives are in danger, their lives are in your hands. Please defer to the 90 days. I've used we support. We stand here and we will continue to stand strong with them. Thank you. Thank you. Luis Gallego. Luis. Sí, buenas noches. Sí, bienvenido. Sí, uh, mi, nombre es, mi nombre es Luis. Y nomás estoy hablando porque uh, señor alcalde, uh, con, concejales, uh, gracias por la oportunidad de hablar. Um, Como ustedes saben, acaba de pasar una pandemia. Y lo que están haciendo ustedes es destruyendo la vida a más de 450 personas. Más, uh, y personas de mayor edad que ellos no pueden buscar trabajos en otros lugares. Y como ustedes saben... Uh, los cuatro mil dólares que nos están dando no es nada, es nomás un mes de renta afuera. Y lo más que lo pedimos son 90 días más. Ya ve que las personas afuera del City Hall están ahí sin comer. Por favor. Thank you, David. David. Please unmute your device and we'll be able to hear you. There you go. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. My name is David Lopez, a resident of San Jose and former president of the National Hispanic University. Uh, over two decades, many NHU students and their families worked and benefited from the San Jose flea market. I saw these students and as entrepreneurs, young and old, finish NHU and become real contributors to our society. I also was at the press conference yesterday outside of City Hall to hear the flea market leadership and other respected community leaders. I was very moved by the testimonials and I uh, was especially moved by the students as they shared their stories. Those vendors and those students right now are outside of City Hall. Those very courageous people are risking their health, their lives to make their voices heard. 
I strongly recommend that all of you as a, our city council listen to these small business people and community members. I stand with the flea market vendors. Please defer the vote as requested by the vendors and take the time to come up with creative solutions that will meet their needs, interest, and dreams. Thank you. Carlos, welcome. Carlos, your device is muted. Please unmute your device and we'll be able to hear you. Carlos, you'll need to unmute your device. Maria? Maria? Bienvenido. Okay, uh, Maria? All right, uh, Brian? Good evening, council members, mayor. I guess the question before you is of the two options presented by Mr. Shanehauer. It's really, who will decide what our great city will look like? Will it be uh, run by casino owners and the sons of former city officials trading on their father's access? Or will it be decided by the citizens and the residents who place their trust in you to do what's right? Defer the decision for a better solution. Thank you. Thank you. Ricardo? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hello, my name is Ricardo Camarena, CEO of Basement Entertainment and host of Down in the Basement podcast. I am speaking today because the city of San Jose is threatening the livelihoods of thousands of immigrant vendors by potentially closing down the various flea market. Ever since I was little, I've always visited the flea market, which provided goods and a method of survival for many vendors that they can't attain elsewhere. I am asking for your support and urge you to join our fight against shutting down the flea market, please defer the vote. I stand in solidarity with the vendors and I yield the rest of my time. Thanks. Thank you, Bob. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Mayor and, and Council for uh, the late night uh, meeting. Um, the Barry S. The flea market is more than just stalls and vendors. In many ways, it's one of San Jose's neighborhoods, and it's a, it's a community that we don't really want to lose. And making a hasty decision to expedite development may yield us some short-term financial benefit for a few, but it really could destroy a San Jose community forever. So a city is a lot more than buildings and development. It's our communities that really create our the heart and soul of our city. I came to understand this because during the 2020 primary uh, season, I actually manned a, a stall there every weekend and uh, register voters and, and, and do some campaign stuff. And I quickly learned what a strong community that exists among my neighboring uh, vendors. Uh, it's, like, it's like a neighborhood. And they look out after each other, they care about each other. It's, it's, there's, um, there's a lot of families and the kids are playing with the neighborhood kids. And they also- Thank you, Gabby. Yes, hello, Mayor and Council. My name is Gabriela Chavez Lopez, and I'm the president of Latina Coalition of Silicon Valley and a District 3 resident. And I'm here to stand in solidarity with the vendors of the Berryessa flea market. I can tell you, I feel so proud to be a San Jose resident today and most days, uh, but especially today to see all of this community standing up in support of our vendors. Um, you know, I really do support a deferral to dive into the details of this plan and also encourage the community in meaningful and productive ways to engage. It's obvious there, there is significant interest in this plan. And I encourage the city council to capture lightning in a bottle tonight and make some informed decisions about the specifics being discussed today. It's critical that we center community voices as we plan for growth and development of our changing city through COVID and beyond. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Gurutan. 
Hi, my name is Iram Thakcham, District 6, uh, District 6 resident, supporter of the flea market vendors. How is it that the commercial interests of one wealthy landowning family are being weighed against the livelihoods of hundreds of working class immigrant families? Notice that nearly every individual who's here in their capacity as a community member supports the vendors' demands. And the people in this meeting who support the development plan are lobbyists, PR representatives, and condescending legal counselors trying to make a buck off displacement. Who do you actually answer to, Mr. Mayor and the City Council? The couple hundred affordable housing units, that's not a solution to gentrification, especially if it means the loss of a living for hundreds of families. Respect the health of hunger striking flea market vendors, defer the plan by 90 days, and engage in an actual fair discussion with the Berryessa Flea Market Vendors Association. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, M. Picho? Evening, Council. Uh, I'm calling here to voice my support of our Berryessa Flea Market Association and ask you to defer this vote as they're requesting. Uh, I can't tell you how important that the Berryessa Flea Market is to our community. Uh, most importantly is the economic opportunities of these families who've been working at the flea market, but, but also it's an important cultural aspect of San Jose. Um, it's the main reason to go to San Jose, it is a beacon for our community. There are so many people and products I can't see anywhere else in the Bay Area. Uh, it would be a huge loss to all of us uh, to lose any of these various uh, flea market vendors or to change it to something else. This is a terrible development plan. <laughs> I support our various uh, flea market workers. Thank you. Um I had announced that I would be closing public comment at 1045. It's now 1046. Um, I would like to continue this hearing till tomorrow morning uh, to enable us to be able to hear from more members of the community. Uh, are there any objections to that doing so? So that way we'll continue to take public comment and then we will uh, continue to take this matter if we need to uh, tomorrow morning to uh, continue council debate. Okay, I'm gonna continue unless I hear otherwise. Uh, David? Hello, council members. My name is David. I am an immigrant who came to this country in 1994. My first job ever was at the flea market. That was the place they offered me, my first friends, my first family, and the people that supported me to become uh, my own business owner. So I'm in support with the, business, with the flea market vendors. And the other thing that I wanna say, this is a multi-million dollar development and they only offering 2.5 million. That's like around less than close to 4,000 and something. So this is really a joke that I just wanna bring to the table that this is not fair. Uh, they need to extend the, the offerings that they have and they need to extend more time so that the vendors can be part of this new development. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tessa? Tessa, did you speak previously? I did, honestly. Okay. You, you, okay. All right, Caetano, Caetano. Caetano. Tiene que uh, activar el audio. El botón de audio. Bienvenido. Yeah, we can hear Sí, podemos oír bueno. usted. Oh, mi nombre es Cayetano Araujo Hernández, pertenezco a la Asociación de Vendedores de la Flea Market. Uh, mi comentario nada más es para decirles uh, que si por favor pueden detener por 90 días la, pues, la propuesta de hoy para que nos puedan ayudar a, a resolver entre nosotros mismos el conflicto para uh, tener alguna resolución buena para todos. 
tanto para el concilio, para la primarca y para nosotros. Eh, se los vamos a agradecer mucho. Y es todo, gracias. Gracias, señor. Uh, while the translator is translating, I I'm going to announce that I I'm going to conclude public comment at 11.30. Hopefully that will get everyone a chance to speak. But if not, we'll need to be able to get to council discussion before midnight. So I'd like to do that. <clears throat> All right, uh, Hiwad, welcome. Hi, my name is Hawad. I'm a lifelong resident of San Jose, residing in D1. I'm here tonight to support the deferral for three main reasons. The first is that the landowner is gonna win regardless. It's just a matter of when. It's our job as a community to facilitate a win for the vendors as well. And all they're asking for is 90 days right now. Second, the Perales memo outlines what exactly can be accomplished just from the city's point of view, not even the vendor's point of view with the landowners. And there's a lot in there that I encourage everybody to review before you vote tomorrow or whenever. And lastly, the flea market's value can scarcely be measured by land use aristocrats like Eric S who spoke earlier and offended the entire city. I'm quoting the Carrasco memo now. For Latinos, it is much more than a marketplace. La Pulga serves as a combination of a plaza and market that provides an irreplaceable recreational and civic space for our community. It's a vibrant mercado that has given Latinos a cultural and economic foothold in a landscape that has largely ignored our existence. Thanks. Thank you. Glenn? Welcome. Glenn, uh, you're muted right now, Glenn. We're not able to hear you. All right, Christian Lopez. Hello, good night. Thank you. So uh, I'd like to preface my statement by saying that I am not originally from San Jose. I actually have been living here for about 15 years and um, I am a software engineer and pretty much one of the things that attracted me to San Jose and, and uh, to my current career as a software engineer is uh, the spirit of Silicon Valley. And I think uh, some of the things that, that happened in Apulga, for example, the spirits of uh, entrepreneurship and bringing creativity and diversity into the city uh, is something that we cannot afford to lose. And I, I stand with the vendors of the Pulga and I believe that they, their needs and their, their rights need to be respected and we should be able to defer this uh, decision for, for, for a longer period of time. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa Santos. Hello. Hi, we Hi. can hear you. My name is Melissa. I'm a constituent of District Five. The Berryessa Flea Market has been the heart of this community for over 60 years. Many members of the city rely on their incomes as vendors at La Pulga. 2.5 million to vendors is an insult to the vendors. The Bun family continues to show its true colors to its loyal vendors. This is not progress, this is flat out racism. When the voiceless have to go hungry just to be heard, this is inhumane. As a city, we must do more. As people, we must do more for these vendors. Thank you, I yield my time. Thank you. Adi, or Adi, please forgive me if I just mispronounce your name. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. I am here to support the, well, I am here to support the vendors of the flea market as a community of color, as vulnerable people. The way you handle this situation their feelings, their needs, and their expectations is the way you are handled the people of color of your community. And I am here to support them. And I please, um, I, want, I want you to think about them instead of thinking of only money, um, putting more money in the pockets of the people that are planning to build this, um, this project. I hope that the people that are um, are fasting and their health are good. Please think about them and their sacrifice. 
Thank you. Thank you. Jasmine? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Jasmine Quiroz and I'm a proud resident here at San in San Jose. I'm here to urge you all to select the livelihood of our vendors over financial gain. Provide them the time necessary to identify a win-win situation. Our vendors need our support. They need your support. It's time for the rest of the council to join council members Carrasco, Perales, and VP Jones in order to be one team. If not, we the people will remember who, went, who we want on our team. Delay the vote. Thank you. I yield my time. Thank you. Mario? Buenas noches, ¿me escuchan? Sí, bienvenido. Gracias, gracias. Buenas noches, alcalde, concejales, eh, como vendedor del free market, eh, recurro a ustedes a que nos apoyen dando una, que, que se postergue estos es 90 días que se pide para poder uh, tratar de negociar y llegar a un mejor acuerdo que nos beneficie a todos y esto mejore nuestras vidas. Aquí estamos uh, con los con nuestros jóvenes líderes en, en huelga de hambre, a ver si nos escuchan y que la, comuni es, la comunidad nos apoye y, y usted como autoridad alcalde, eh, la balanza no entre, entre una familia y, y, y 500 familias que, que necesitamos, que es nuestra fuente de ingreso. Pedimos justicia, por favor. Eso es todo. Muchas gracias. Buenas noches. Gracias, Mario. We're going to wait for a moment for some translation. Can the interpreters go on the English channel and repeat that, please? Okay, uh, Jessica. Hi there, uh, my name is Jessica Matthew. I'm with Silicon Valley DSA and I'm a resident of District 1 calling in to support the vendors of the flea market. They are a vital part of our community here in San Jose and they should be respected by our city council. I just wanted to echo what other folks have been saying and repeat that you should work with the vendors and defer this vote. We are dealing with a housing and economic crisis in this city. The things you are doing now will impact literally generations to come. So please listen to all of the concerned members of our community on this call tonight and stand in solidarity with the vendors of the flea market. Defer the vote and work with the vendors to come up with a better plan. Thanks. Thank you. Alma, welcome. Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Selma. I'm part of the second generation of a family of vendors who has been at the flea market for more than 30 years. Um, I know you know, but right now, my fellow vendors are in a hunger strike outside the city hall as a desperate action for our voices to be heard. Council Members, you are public workers who promise to protect the well-being of your people, not to work only for one rich family. You have to understand all the violations on this process. It was never clear. It was never true. The city of San Jose made a huge cruel and racist mistake by approving this project. And now it's your responsibility to create a new benefits agreement that will benefit all the vendors. Please delay this vote. And I want to appreciate the help of Carrasco and Perales. Thank you. Thank you, Alma. Uh, Lisa? Um, hi, hello, can you hear me? Yes. 
Um, it is Liza, by the way. Uh, but hi, yes, I'm here in support of um, the vendors. And well, I kind of wanted to comment how um, I see no empathy for the community, but back to what I was going to say. So for the past, I have been an employee there at the flea market and present client. Um, I have also been going to the flea market for about 14 plus years now, and I wanted it to be known and understood that the flea market not only is a place that, you know, at the weekends you can have a good time with the uh, family, but as a young adult struggling financially gave me an opportunity to learn and develop skills that really came in handy later on in life. Also, uh, growing up, you know, at low, pretty much. Um, anyways, I just wanted to make sure that please defer the vote and just give them time. Thank you. Lamara? Lamara? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hello, can you hear welcome. me? Welcome. Yes, welcome. Hey. Yes, so my name is uh, Lamara Brower. I'm a community member. I lived in San Jose, graduated from San Jose State, and I am in uh, full support of the vendors of the Berea Flea Market, and I ask you to Please defer the vote. I uh, yield my time. Thank you. Uh, Jocelyn? Hi, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Hi, my name is Jocelyn. I'm here in support of the vendors. Um, today I ask you to defer the vote by 90 days. Uh, like the vendor said, this is their livelihood and today they are simply asking you to defer the vote by 90 days. They're not asking you to stop the progress on your village plan. We already know that the village plan will happen, but today they are simply asking you to defer the vote. These vendors are asking for more collaboration with your team so that they can have a little bit more um, compared to everything that they will lose um, if they don't get these 90 days. So we just ask that you defer the vote by 90 days. Thank you. Thank you. Adriana? Hello, good evening. My name is Adriana and resident of District 7, also a member of Maiz. I am a daughter, hija of a food vendor family selling tamales y elotes in the 1990s in front of churches. I'm a daughter of a flea market vendor who has found dignity, has autonomy, and has something to call his own when he sells at the flea market. I've also, I've also been a longtime client and shopper, a beneficiary of all the good vibes that the flea market provides. The flea market is the original concept of a pop-up. The flea market is a market that around the world is protected, including night markets. It's seen as a tourist destination. We at Silicon Valley need to also protect this vital institution, particularly in uh, people of color communities. The flea market is also about interge intergenerational wealth, uh, making sure that generations of families benefit, including children going to college, being sustained by the economy that is being provided as vendors. Please support the vendors in ensuring Thank you. Adriana, I'm sorry, uh, Yusuf, Yusuf? Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right, cool. Um, I wanted uh, to speak today um, in support of the vendors. Um, they are currently outside, uh, outside of City Hall in the cold on hunger strike and risking their lives and health and that is on the necks um, of those who have not uh, co collaborated with them and worked with them earlier. Um, and this is why they took these measures, um, them losing their jobs and community and uh, these perpetuating cycles of poverty, which uh, ensue from such decisions, um, you know, is also on y'all's neck. Defer the vote 90 days and work with the vendors value and strengthen community over corporate interests in all your decisions. I support our vendors. Thank you. Thank you. Catherine? Um, good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, I agree with what the last, all the last speakers have said from the community. We need to support the flea market vendors. They're out there striking because this is you know, hunger striking because this is so important to them. 
um, siding with the developers that they don't have to give just three short months after, how long has this plan been sitting around? I mean, why does it have to be now? Why can't it wait three more months? Anybody who wants to rush you into making a decision on something won't let you discuss it with anybody, they're trying to cheat you. And the market vendors know it and I know it and everybody else knows it. So please grant the deferral. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Angel or Angel? Can you hear me? Yes. Well, hello everyone. My name is Angel Martinez and I am a San Jose native as well as a member of a family that have thoroughly enjoyed the flea market uh, as it once was. Mm -hmm. The decision that the council is facing today, uh, well, actually tomorrow morning, uh, is an unenviable one. However, as you have all heard here today, the community is asking for your help. The flea market is the last remnant of the Campesina roots that, you, that was left behind from our orchard days in the 1960s. It has been a source of not just jobs, but of entrepreneurship that have allowed working class citizens in our town to make a living outside of tech. This spirit has been emulated in farmers markets and affluent neighborhoods, and it should be continued here in the Berryessa area for the Berryessa flea market. A moratorium will allow for all parties to come to the table and allow for a better dialogue between the vendors who, have, who depend on these spaces for their livelihood and the developers who wish to. Thank you, Oscar. Sí, buenas noches, alcalde y concejales. La decisión que ustedes el día de hoy tomen, eh, yo creo que va a ser de mucha trascendencia, no solamente para la vida de, de esta gente, sino también de la ciudad de San José. Eh, sabemos que la historia va a hablar de ustedes, dependiendo de cómo voten el día de hoy o cómo tomen la decisión del día de hoy. Yo sé que ahorita va a terminar la junta y ustedes se van a ir tranquilos a su casa, pero pongámonos un poquito en, el, en los zapatos de los vendedores. Ellos están luchando cada fin de semana con, los, con, lo, con la gente que, que es dueña de la pulga y tal pareciera que quieren alejar a la gente, a los compradores de los, de, de los que van y compran cada fin de semana al subir precios de estacionamiento o al ponerles malas caras a, a los vendedores. Por favor, tomen eh, la decisión en 90 días. Gracias. Gracias, señor. We're going to stall for a moment to allow for translation to catch up. Okay, um, Suzanne. Hi, I'm Suzanne. My husband actually spoke a little earlier, but I have my own thing to say. I, as you know, we recently moved from Sunnyvale to San Jose because we really like the culture here. Um, I'm not an engineer. I actually work for a church. And I don't know if any of you guys on the council are people of faith. I don't judge you if you aren't, that's, that's okay. <laughs> but I wanna tell you that as I was thinking about all of this, my husband was very involved with all the marches and the protests and he was telling me what's going on. And I pray and I hear from God and I just wanna let you know that you guys on this council, the mayor, you're all people in power. You guys were elected, you guys have resources, you have a level of privilege and you are elected into this position and you will be held responsible. So do the- Thank you. The person with the phone number ending 8527. Person with the phone number ending 8527, we're not able Hello? to hear you. 
There you go. Welcome. ¿Me escuchan? Sí. Buenas Bienvenido. noches. Bienvenido. Gracias. Muchas gracias. Bueno, lo que yo quería decir es que eh, yo soy vendedora de la Flea Market. Mi nombre es Lulu. Y yo no tengo mucho tiempo ahí, pero yo siento que las personas que han trabajado por muchísimos años han apoyado al negocio de esta gente porque fue su negocio durante todo este tiempo. Es obvio que se va a vender, la pulga se va a cerrar, pero lo único que están pidiendo los niños que están allá afuera, que son unos héroes que no han comido en más de 24 horas, están pidiendo para nosotros los vendedores que por favor nos den los 90 días que estamos pidiendo. Y no es difícil, es egoísta de parte de todos no darles el tiempo que necesitan. Eso es lo único que quería decir y vamos pues, nosotros apoyamos a, a su negocio, que nos apoyen ahora ellos a nosotros. Yo creo que es lo justo. Gracias. So, I'm a vendor. Yes, so I'm a vendor at the flea market. My name is Lulu. I haven't been there long, but I see some of my next door um, business people who have been there for many years helping the business of the owners. I know that the decision is not so hard to make. Please help the children who are sacrificing their health and their well-being to make their time being. Please give the 90 days for what they're asking for. Jessica, welcome. Uh, we're not able to hear you right now because your device is muted. Tienen que activar el audio. Hi, thank you for your time. Um, I saw you this weekend at the flea market, San Licardo, so I know you enjoy our culture and enjoy being around our community. Um, think about how this will impact, um, you know, all of those uh, small business owners and their families, because how a lot of other people have stated, these people live in our communities too. They don't just come here and sell on the weekends. They, I live, my neighbors are actually vendors at the flea market. I myself grew up you know, working at the flea market, 90 days is not going to hurt anybody. Um, the fact that they put this on the table and they're not giving them time to review what it is that they're getting into, that to me is sketch. I don't trust the, uh, the flea market owners. I don't think they should be involved in negotiations as far as it is a historic um, monument and getting rid of it like that will affect our culture. It wipes out a whole multiple generations, not just one's history. Um, it would suck to see it gone. And I Thank you. Uh, Monica? <coughs> yes, uh, this is Monica. Um, and I saw you this week, last weekend, uh, walking around the flea market. And as you can see, I also have three stands at the flea market. And uh, that's the only way I can provide food and shelter to my family. So that's why we're asking to help us at this moment uh, to for the 90 days before. So thank you for your time and I hope you do the right thing. Thank you, Monica. Alfonso? Uh, yes, hi, my name is Alfonso Yola. I'm a recent resident of District, District 3 um, moved to San Jose last year, so haven't been to the flea market for generations, but I do know in hearing um, the voices of the vendors that it's important for them to be able to have the dignity of sustaining a livelihood. Um, I also know that, you know, it's hundreds of small businesses that are there and getting rid of them without thinking about the impact of them and their families, I think is uh, something really dangerous. And, you know, it's a sign of good and compassionate governance to lead by listening to those that are most impacted by decisions that are made. So I think that, um, you know, knowing that the vendors are all in agreement of having this moratorium and this deferral of 90 days, I think it's uh, incumbent on the council to listen to what the vendors want and defer for 90 days. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Brian Bahena. Yeah, hi. Uh, I would like to six, uh, express and ask for like uh, to give us ninety days. Uh, I'm speaking on behalf of my my fellow vendors and my and my parents. Uh, they are near. They spoke earlier. My my dad and I've been selling there for eighteen years for the, all my childhood. 
and it really has played a big impact on me. So I, I just want to ask for 90 days, so please, and I hope you do the right thing. Thank you. Gabby? Hello, um, I am Gabby Vasquez. I grew up in District 10. Um, tonight, I just wanted to remind City Council that there's clearly a deep disconnect between the vendors and the developers. Um, if there was proper engagement and outreach, we would not be here. By now, many city staff and previous city council members know that they could have done many things differently. Uh, that being said, there should be no rush for this development. The least you can do is provide the vendors with some sort of security of their future. And um, I ask you all, all um, who, who would benefit if this was passed today? Thank you so much, City Council, and thank you, especially City, um, city Council Member Perales and Carrasco, and to your city staff, to your staff for your support. Uh, I yield my time. Thank you. The person with the phone number ending 9065. Hello? Uh, hello, welcome. Bienvenido. Sí. Mi, mi nombre es uh, Marta. Buenas noches, señora alcalde y concejal. Soy vendedora de la Flair Market. Por favor, sean un poco más humanos y denos los 90 días que necesitamos. Recuerden que algún día ustedes o sus hijos o hermanos o familia estarán en la misma situación y alguien los va a ayudar si ustedes nos ayudan a nosotros. Muchas gracias. Gracias. Hi, my name is Marta and I'm a vendor. My name is Martha and I'm one of the vendors at the flea market and I just asked the council members to be more human and give us, grant us the 90 days that we need. Bueno. Bienvenido. Sí, buenas noches. Este, soy vendedor de La Pulga. Mi papá pues, era vendedor de ahí, ¿no? Murió hace dos años y básicamente murió haciendo lo que más le gustaba. Y bueno, la voz del pueblo se ha levantado. Eh, creo que el 98% de las personas que hemos hablado estamos a favor de que se mantenga la pulga. Y, y este, pues, la voz se ha levantado y si ustedes trabajan para nosotros, eso es lo que queremos, 90 días que se detenga el plazo para que se firme esto. Gracias y buenas noches. Gracias. So I am a vendor. I'm a vendor at the flea market. My father worked there until two years ago that he passed away. He was very proud of it. And now the voice of the people has been heard. 90% of the people that have spoken have been in favor of maintaining the flea market. And so please grant us the 90 days to make the right decision. Uh, uh, hello, hey, how you doing? Uh, say, uh, how you doing? Welcome, Carlos. Hey, uh, thank you, Sam Ricardo, for having me here, Mayor. Um, I just want to say, like, you know what? I've been a part of the community for a very long time, and I've been a DJ with uh, a lot of people that you know as well. As Mark Lopez and Mark Lopez. I just like say names right now. But we really need help right now like, to keep the flea market open. Um, I could do anything in my powers as far as my part, but like we really need this to like happen. Like we can't let like, our people out here. Like San Jose is the first city in actually California. And if people really want to know the history about it. Thank you, Karen. Uh, good evening, Mayor. Good evening, Council Members. Um, I'm Karen. I'm here to support my, my dad, who is a vendor of the flea market and has been there for like almost 20 years. And also all the vendors in the flea market as well. Um, 
the first time when I, I came to the U.S., I started helping my dad at a flea market. And also, I was attending college. I graduated. I transferred to San Jose State. And now I'm pursuing a master's degree. I, I'm just going to ask the council, mem the council members to think about the people that they're displacing and think about their children and their grandchildren too, because they are the future of San Jose. Thank you. Thank you. Leslie Carvajal. Good evening, um, City Council. My name is Leslie Carvajal and I am a resident of San Jose. I uh, wanted to show my support by speaking on this matter. Uh, I don't know if you noticed, but this is a form of gentrification by leaving thousands of families and vendors without without a job, which as we saw with the pandemic left people homeless, hungry, and in debt. And I find it inhumane inhumane for the city council to turn a blind eye to a blind eye where rich people come to destroy our communities for their selfish pockets. Thank you. And I thank you. Nancy? Yes, hello. I am calling in support of the vendors. I am asking for your support because my own family has been blessed by this market and its people. San Jose has decided that the land where the beloved flea market resides will be turned into units and commercial spaces, leaving us with only five acres and no space for the displaced 450 vendors. Projects like these are what slowly have pushed out our lower income communities in the past and are only prioritizing the gentrifier to make a profit. Like the speaker said, these are people of color and they are the ones who will be losing a safe and peaceful space in the city of San Jose. I urge you to join the fight and to defer for 90 days. Thank you. I yield my Thank you, Julian or Julian. Hi, um, I am a resident of District 8 and I'm speaking in support of our vendors. Uh, the flea market has been the place for families like mine to be able to survive in a growingly gentrified city. Uh, this is a place that I hold really close to me. It's literally put clothes on my back and it's put food in people's stomachs. Um, displacing hundreds of hardworking business owners from the flea market will displace possibly hundreds of families from our, from our city, from our communities. Um, families that have been here for generations, families in general that make San Jose such an amazing city. Uh, I think voting on this right now during the pandemic recovery is is a heartless act, and I, act, I ask for a deferral. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Uh, good morning, uh, good evening, uh, Mayor and uh, Council Member. So I'm calling uh, to support this uh, BBUV plan, and I want to uh, want this free market to be gone as soon as possible. Because uh, as far as I know, this uh, flea market property actually is a private property. So um, actually, your board already want to uh, develop this uh, uh, property to pro to provide thousands of jobs to this community. So actually, no way for the board to find a job for you, right? So it's like the employer wanted to shut down the company. Do they uh, are they responsible to find a job for you? Definitely not, right? So your flea market vendor, you are responsible to find a job by yourself, right? And, uh, and this and this uh, development plan is to provide thousands of jobs to the community. Actually, you should make yourself able to find a better job instead of just being vendors. And also, our community has been underdeveloped for so long. We really want a new job and the development plan to be there, to be here. So if you look at the um, very nearby district. Thank you, Lucy. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Lucy DeAnda. I have been a vendor for over 30 years at the flea market. Um, this will have a huge impact on me, my family, um, my employees, as well as all the vendors that I buy merchandise from, whether from here or a different state. Um, it's also um, an impact on our community. Um, I know that you were there this weekend and you had the opportunity to uh, admire um, 
all the people that go there. And you know very well that a lot of people uh, visit the flea market uh, from a lot of different areas, Salinas, San Francisco, Watsonville, and they come to San Jose just because of the flea market. And when they come to San Jose, they spend money in San Jose, they'll put gas, they'll eat. Uh, thank you. Uh, Tanya Escobar. Hi, um, I just wanted to have a rebuttal comment to a previous speaker who encouraged the vendors to seek a better job. I think that's incredibly classist and disrespectful to say that their choice uh, in pursuing a business as a vendor is somehow lower in status. And I think we need to uh, make room for all sorts of people and their choices in life. So just want to say you're supported. We love you vendors. Um, and I hope the council and the mayor does the right thing. Thank you. Um, Glenn Mercado, I, I'm about 95% sure you spoke already, but you keep raising your hand. <laughs> Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, you spoke previously, didn't you, Glenn? Oh, I couldn't because I had uh, technical difficulties. So I was passed okay. over. Go ahead, Glenn. Okay. I'm Glenn Mercado, I live in Daly City and I'm a member of Malaya Movement San Francisco. I'm here this evening in solidarity with the Barry Yesa Flea vendors and the hunger strikers outside of San Jose City Hall. Like many of those who spoke before me, I echo their demands. The Barry Yesa Flea Market is a staple of San Jose and the whole Bay Area, thanks to the vendors. I would be extremely disappointed in this council to simply move forward with the development plans without genuinely addressing the concerns of the Barry Yesa Flea vendors and the San Jose community as you're witnessing now. I don't know how anyone can just be okay with endangering the livelihood of so many families and pretend like they don't exist. They're demanding inclusion when really they deserve so much more. I urge you to save La Pulga and stand with the vendors. Thank you, I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. All right, the, um, the public comment is closed then. Uh, I wanna thank the many people who came out to speak and, and, or, or, or chose to join us by Zoom to speak uh, and as well as many who came simply to listen because so much is um, so much is at stake, uh, and by that I mean there's a clear perception that the decision before us on the council um, is whether or not we're going to close the flea market. Um, I say that's the perception because, unfortunately, under the law, that's not the fact. Uh, we don't have that choice before us. That decision, at least. The closure of the portion of a flea market is, was made in 2007, and I'll get to that in a moment. Um, I, I want to thank, though, all the vendors who have spoken today, who came out uh, Thursday night to the flea market to speak to us, about 300 vendors or so, who spent, uh, must have been about three hours uh, there together or close to it. Uh, I want to thank the vendors I spoke with on Sunday when I went to the flea market, Antonio and Alma and several others who, who helped to educate me uh, a bit about the extraordinary place that uh, they have created uh, by their labor, by their efforts and by the, the efforts of, of their families and families like theirs for many decades. Uh, I, I know there's a perception that somehow or another there is a divide of some kind on this council about wanting to protect the vendors. And I, I want to be very clear that I, I suspect that every member of this council would love to do everything we possibly can to preserve this beautiful centerpiece of our community and to protect the vendors in any legal way that we possibly can. Um, I'm only gonna speak briefly before I hand this off, but I wanna just clarify one basic question, which is that being in solidarity with the vendors doesn't settle the question. It only starts the question, which is how do we best protect their livelihoods and give them an opportunity either to be able to continue operating in an urban market at that site or, or be able to find another place here in the city of San Jose. Uh, I think folks have heard at this point that there has been a prior approval by the council in 2007, and it just so happens that makes all the difference here and what happens. The, 2007 plan was modified in 2016, but we are essentially bound by it if we are not going to approve something different. 
Uh, that is state law. That's Fifth Amendment of the Constitution. Um, we don't have a choice to simply take away a development right that has been given. And you know, one of the speakers, I think Myra Flores put it very well. She said the 2007 plan is not the right plan for today. And she's right, it's not the right plan. And frankly, we went back in time, I suspect many of us uh, would find a better way. Um, but the city council's decision is still binding on the city until we approve a different plan. And we can't simply say, both plans are invalid because there is a vested property right, as we'll be told by our attorneys, but certainly we, I know council will ask those questions of our city attorney. And I expect that will be the answer because I've asked that question every which way to find some path to be able to do more to help the vendors. Uh, so the property owner has a vested right to build, and I think that's what Mr. Shane Hour was articulating, that one way or another, they're going to move forward with something. And the question is really for us, is it going to be the 2007 plan, or is it going to be a new plan approved in 2021, which was actually, I think, submitted way back in 2018. The, uh, the property owner has been uh, patiently waiting for this council's decision. So uh, for me, it's a fairly straightforward question because the 2007 plan doesn't provide five acres for a reconstituted market on that site. Um, and I think that can be a very vibrant urban market, an open air market in a place with a lot of foot traffic that will be greatly beneficial, certainly to those families, but also to the whole community. Um, the 2007 plan doesn't promise a minimum three years of time before any potential displacement, which as I understand it, the property owners committed now under this plan that is negotiated by council member Cohen. The 2007 plan doesn't promise two and a half million dollars to health. Uh, also part of what was negotiated by council member Cohen. And I'd be the first to say 2.5 million isn't gonna be enough to help all the vendors. And five acres is almost certainly not gonna be enough to find a place for all the vendors. We have to do much more. And for that reason, I'll certainly support any additional city funding to help vendors make a transition, uh, a, a soft landing, uh, if that is what they choose, or if that is what they're forced to do based on the outcome of what happens is we try to evaluate um, with the assistance of the, the advisory group that will be formed with primarily with vendors, determine how these five acres will be utilized. Uh, certainly, I'm happy to consider the use of ARP funding, uh, the federal funding, we'll have that opportunity in October. I think based on the latest conversations I've had with city staff, it is difficult to find a way to use that money uh, for this purpose, but I hope we can find a creative path to doing so by then. Uh, if not, we'll, we can look at other dollars. Uh, for example, perhaps construction taxes that come from the development itself, that could help. Um, but we need to find dollars that will be sufficiently flexible to help the vendors be of some use. In any event, we don't need those dollars today. We'll need them as vendors are needing to make their decisions and their transition. And the good news is if we approve the 2021 plan, uh, if I guess that's what we can call it, they will have time. And that's perhaps the most important thing of all, uh, to be able to have the time to be able to find options if necessary. Uh, or to be able to reconstitute a market on a smaller site there at Berryessa. So I wanna say thank you to all the vendors for your ongoing advocacy uh, and your willingness to work together. Uh, and we're gonna to need to really roll up our sleeves no matter what happens with this vote uh, to help vendors make a transition. Uh, if we vote no, we're gonna have to figure out how to do it a whole lot faster. We won't have the benefit of three years delay and we won't have the benefit of those dollars and we won't have the benefit of five acres. Uh, so uh, I will um, leave it to uh, council member Cohen. I wanna thank council member Cohen for his efforts and that of his team. Uh, I know uh, Stacy and his team has been working uh, very hard on this as well as uh, Hugo, uh, Hugo Jimenez, uh, and I want to thank Hugo particularly for his help with the meeting we had with the vendors. Uh, Councilmember Cohen. 
Yeah, thank you, Mayor, and, and thanks for your uh, description of the history and the importance of, um, of what we're doing here. I want to I want to thank the members of the community and the vendors community that came out and spoke and and so passionately explained to us, reminded us of the importance. Um, of, of the flea market site, a really important element of, of District 4 and the entire city. Um, and I, I want to thank you for, uh, for everything that you've done to create a vibrant community for, for, um, at, the, at the flea market over the years. I've been frustrated uh, as I've watched the process for the entire time, for the entire 20 years since this has started, to see that the council time after time hasn't done anything to address the displacement of the vendors at the flea market. And I, so I was, had an interest right from the beginning of my term to find a permanent solution for the market and, and met with vendors, uh, met with city staff and, and, and pushed for other solutions that had not been discussed before. Um, in January, Councilmember Perales told our office about the frustration of the vendors and, and their representatives and their community partners with their inability to engage with City Hall. Um, and this led us to reaching out and engaging with the group that would eventually become the Flea Market Vendors Association. Um, you know, the diversity of the flea market reflects the diversity of District 4. Uh, it serves as an entry point for immigrants to enter our community, our country, and, and to the business world. In addition to the voices we heard tonight, we have a large number of Vietnamese business owners operating on the site, too. Um, and, and it's clear that the voice of the vendors has not been included in the process for the past 18 years. Uh, the vendors we have spoken to since January have made it clear that they want to control their own fate. And this agreement sets the groundwork for that to happen. The flea market advisory group that will be created will give the vendors that voice in the collaborative process that will follow in the years ahead. So um, I do wanna thank our city staff for working with, with us. I wanna thank the Vendor Association for their advocacy that gave us uh, the, 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 the space and gave the push to the applicant for um, to make, to make concessions and voluntary agreement with the city. Uh, I wanna thank the applicant for helping us reach this point as well. This Barry Essebart urban village achieves important goals for the city of San Jose and for the whole region. The urban village will provide transit-based jobs, housing, parks, and a new urban market. And for the first time, approval of this plan will commit the developer to build on-site affordable housing units next to a BART station. They'll be required to do that rather than pay the in lieu fee. And in fact, more affordable housing units will come on this site than were built, delivered in the entire year of 2020. So it's really important for the additional affordable housing units to get, to get built. I wanna thank my fellow council members who have obviously also seen the importance of the flea market as a cultural institution and as a business incubator. Um, and I thank the Vendor Association and all the vendors at the flea market for their engagement in this process that helped us get where we are. Um, so I want to make this motion that takes a lot of recommendations um, from staff, from, from my memo that I, that, that I submitted with Mayor Licardo and Councilmember Jimenez, and also from the thoughtful memos of other council members um, that have been written in the past week. So my motion, and I, I try to say this slowly enough that we can, we can get it all down. My motion first is to move the staff memo that covers the Planning Commission recommendation of the zoning changes that are before us. In addition, the recommendations in the staff supplemental memo, which includes really an important piece of looking for additional resources, um, financial and also locations to, to make sure that the, there's enough space for the vendors to have um, ongoing businesses. I wanna move the items in the joint memo submitted by Mayor Licardo, Councilmember Jimenez and myself. I wanna move Vice Mayor Jones's memo, which has some very thoughtful additions to the process. I wanna move recommendations one and two from Council Member Carrasco's memo, um, which add additional financial aid and resources from the city, which I think will go a long way to supplementing the financial uh, package um, that will be coming as a part of, of this deal. And I wanna move recommendations 1D, 1E, and number four from Council Member Perales's second memo. So all of that together is my motion um, for us to consider. Thank you so much. So right. motion and second, was that Council Member Jimenez? Yes. All right, thank you. All right, motion and second. Um, Council Member Perales? 
I, I was kind of hoping we would defer comment till tomorrow, but it sounds like we're already in the middle of it. So is your plan, Mayor, to go until midnight and then to continue the council discussion? Yeah, that was my plan. So we got about 20 minutes left, see what we could get done, and then obviously continue tomorrow morning as we need to. Okay. Um, I, I, I will uh, begrudgingly go through. I think we're all kind of exhausted. So I, I, I appreciate that you've made the decision that we can move on till tomorrow morning, but I'll also I'll, I'll speak a little bit now on, on the item and then carry on tomorrow. Um, well, first off, um, thank you to all the speakers uh, who showed up as well. Um, and I think, you know, as, as, as expected, um, overwhelming majority of individuals asking for one main uh, reasonable ask of, of just an opportunity for a little bit more time uh, I think it's unfortunate as well that we've heard it very clear now that uh, the applicant is not only not interested in that, but um, has has threatened to sort of pull everything off of the table uh, because of that. And, and I think there's a, a lack of understanding as to the urgency on my part and see if we can get into that maybe uh, not tonight, but tomorrow, depending on how much time we have here. So um, I think I wanna say as well, um, a thank you to Councilmember Cohen um, and his team and everything that they've done. As he points out, um, I I was uh, was asked uh, about a year ago uh, to to get involved uh, to try and assist the, the the flea market vendors. And at that point, there was no association because they felt as though they uh, were not having a uh, a positive relationship and response from the the, the prior D four council member. And so when Councilmember Cohen came into office. Uh, was one of the first things we spoke about and, and he has absolutely um, moved this along much, much further uh, than it's ever been. Um, and so I, I appreciate the work that, that he's put in. Uh, I'm personally not interested in, in you know, vilifying any council member who shares a different opinion than I do. Um, that's the nature of this job uh, and, and especially not Councilmember Cohen. Uh, I'm, I'm also not interested in vilifying um, the applicant, the Bum family. I'm interested in creating an opportunity for a win-win situation. And we've heard that from some community members and I'm hoping to appeal to not only my colleagues, but essentially the, uh, the applicant, the Bum family as well on, uh, on an opportunity to do so, uh, on a family that I know uh, cares deeply for uh, their vendor community. Um, it may not feel apparent and certainly in the way that, that, that uh, the vendors have been engaged, or I should say the lack of, of engagement over the years, certainly there's not a, a feeling of that. Um, and uh, I think there's an opportunity though to, to be able to prove that in what we decide to do um, tonight or tomorrow morning. And so uh, I, I also uh, recognize the, um, the potential failures of votes from back in whether it was 2007 or even when I was on the council in 2016 uh, in not getting enough support for our vendor community. And uh, I know Councilmember Cohen uh, mentioned that he was frustrated as well for, for two decades. Um, and as he served as a representative of the Barriers School Board, um, I, I um, also took a look back at that vote and, and uh, there were oddly only five speakers that showed up in 2016 public speakers and Council, uh, Councilmember Cohen may recall he was one of them as a trustee for the various school board actually asking for the council's support on that item that ultimately did uh, pass. Um, I did not hear Councilmember Cohen speak out against it or, or speak up in frustration of, of how we should change that. And I think it was a failure really on everybody's part uh, in not doing enough for the vendor community at that point. And uh, I think we were all unfortunate that the vendors were not as organized as they are today, but we are fortunate now and they are organized and I think if they were as organized as they are today, we would have heard from them speaking up as they did tonight back then. Um, and uh, what we do have though in front of us is uh, another chance, another opportunity, um, albeit uh, we also have a risk. We have a threat of, uh, of moving back to the 2007 uh, development agreement and, and really losing everything. Um, and I think that's what we're hoping to, to avoid here. And, uh, and again, what I think the opportunity will be we did also at that time in 2016 ask for robust community engagement. I think if you ask the vendor uh, association, the community now, uh, they would they would unequivocally speak and say that that did not happen over the last five years. Um, and in fact, uh, we didn't see that really become robust uh, until the last few weeks. And um, and and again, I think an opportunity that we have to to make right. 
I personally, because of the the quite honestly the the risks and the threat of of uh, the applicant withdrawing and moving back to the 2007 land use authority, I did not come to my decision easily on um, on what I asked for earlier, uh, which was a deferral, and um, certainly haven't come to to any of the, these decisions easily uh, in regards to. The, the the secondary memorandum that I've issued today, uh, and as well as as the ask that I'll have. In the uh, memorandum that I was unable to speak to in asking for a deferral, I will now explain some of those concerns that I had and why I think they're actually uh, merits. What is only one week, um, mind you, not not ninety days that I'm asking for that the vendor community has has been very clear that they're asking for. But what I feel is a very reasonable ask of seven days, which as of tomorrow, if we take the vote, it'll actually only be six days that we're asking for, um, that we have that opportunity to address some of these, these uh, concerns that I think are realistic and um, invalid. So number one, as I listed in the memo, there are legal concerns. Um, there were some, some broad legal statements made by the mayor at the large community meeting that we held on the 16th. Uh, about the city being being sued, um, and there was really an unclear answer, um, and 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 obviously was done um, was done on the fly at that meeting, uh, and we still have not had clarity on the legal consequences of that, which I feel that uh, this council would merit, even if it be in a closed session discussion, uh, and at least uh, in in a discussion here. There's been a lot of questions and concerns raised from uh, a number of local land use experts as uh, the city staff shared with all the council today and in the public record as well um, in regards to some of the obligations. And uh, I've, I've seen and appreciate staff in their response in, in those. Uh, these are incredibly complex uh, discussions and I think that those also merit uh, more than just uh, a couple hours of, of, uh, of headway in a response. The outreaching and engagement, as I pointed out, uh, has not been robust over the last five years. And, um, and in fact, since last year, um, I started pushing on city staff to, uh, to host a community-wide uh, meeting to address some of the growing concerns at the time. And as Councilmember Cohen pointed out, uh, was one of the initial uh, conversations that he and I had uh, and what really ignited some of these further conversations uh, and, and helped to spur um, greater involvement, but that's really been just here at the, at the last stretch. Um, and understandably, this past year has been difficult because of COVID, um, but I think that even more reason why we should be interested in allowing for a little bit more time um, to, to be able to better engage with the community. Uh, I would say as well, um, one of the challenges was the meeting that we had this past week, uh, where we, it's actually was the, the, the first uh, meeting where I think we can be confident every vendor received a hand delivered notice. And uh, that was just uh, seven days ago. Um, and, uh, and we had that meeting and unfortunately there were um, a lot of deficiencies and I don't think anybody would, would, uh, would argue that uh, a lack of translation services uh, lack of documentation for the Vietnamese community. And I think that's proven tonight in the fact that I don't believe we had anybody um, that, that was a monolingual Vietnamese speaker tonight. Um, and we know that we had a number of them there last Wednesday, uh, and we have a number of them in the vendor community. I think that there absolutely needs to be uh, better discussion, better uh, engagement with the vendors. Uh, and that's again, one of the reasons why the vendors have asked for, for a delay. Lastly, there is this uh, there is this looming sort of um, uh, uh, assertion that there is a July 12th deadline for a NOFA, Notice of Funding Availability from the state for an affordable housing grant that the applicant is stating that they, they, want to, they need to meet that deadline. They need to get this vote approved uh, in order to apply before July 12th. Uh, in my personal review and in, in consultation with staff on that NOFA, we actually feel that there's uh, actually um, not only uh, not necessarily any real compelling interest to, to hit that deadline uh, in regards to the actual loss or potential loss of points um, in that, but also an opinion from our staff that uh, there is a, a very, very low likelihood that this particular project would even get approved for such a grant. Um, and uh, I was going to ask our housing staff, uh, but considering the time, I, I won't ask them today. I may ask them uh, tomorrow for a response uh, in that, but hopefully my, my colleagues trust that uh, our staff has looked into this as well. And it does not appear as though there is a true time constraint 
on uh, this July 12th. Even if there were, a one-week deferral would still give us an opportunity, albeit we would need a special hearing for the second reading on July 6th, but it would still give us an opportunity to meet the July 12th deadline if indeed it was an urgency uh, deadline, which I don't believe it is. But a one-week deferral wouldn't, um, wouldn't uh, uh, cause that uh, to change. And so I, I am sort of confused as to why even uh, uh, that, that slight deferral would not uh, have been granted um, and obviously didn't get a chance to, to lobby for this earlier. And so I do have a, a, a question um, for uh, the representative of the applicant, if, if Eric Shanehauer is still here. Shanehauer. Yep. I'm, I'm, thank, you. <coughs> thank you. I'm here. Thank you very much. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, I, I'm just curious on, on what I've asserted here, and, and I'd like to hear your response on, on, on those assertions. So number one, um, you know, do you truly feel there is there is an urgency on the July 12th? And even if there was, you know, would a one week deferral affect that? Um, you know, do you believe that there was, you know, inadequate uh, outreach uh, in preparation for the meeting last week, um, especially in regards to obviously Vietnamese and Spanish speakers? Um, and then, uh, you know, as, as, as I've articulated in the request for at least a one week deferral, and it's been made pretty clear that um, the applicant would be uh, potentially at least uh, threatening to, to walk away uh, and, and revert back to the 2007 agreement. If we asked for a one week deferral and if that was approved, would you actually, uh, would, the, would the applicant make good on that threat? Thank you. Well, there are quite a few questions there. Um, <laughs> but with regard to the meeting last week, uh, last week's meeting was conducted by the council offices and the mayor's office in the city. So uh, we, the flea market, uh, besides assisting with the microphone and providing the water and also uh, hand distributing the notice to every vendor stall, we, we didn't have any um, coordination for that meeting. So I can't. I can't speak to the translation planning for that. I wasn't placing blame. I, I agree with yeah. you on that. I was just asking in regards to the adequacy if you had an opinion on that. Yeah. Um, but it, I think it was, um, despite any deficiencies mentioned, uh, it was a clear opportunity for many people to voice their opinions and their concerns. Um, and so that's that's always good. And we've had many sessions like that over the years, many that I've participated in um, with translation. Um, with regard to, um, you know, the, the one week deferral, you know, I mean, our question is, well, what, what precisely is going to happen in the next six days? Um, Right, we're, we're we don't we don't know what is going to happen besides six days passing by, um, and in our mind, as you can tell from the public speakers, um, we've we've reached a point in the process that there's a sort of a level of dysfunction. Um, it's very hard to to coordinate negotiate um, when. People have resorted to name calling and, and so forth. And so it seems like it would be more productive to us to, um, to pursue the process that Council Member Cohen and Council Member Jimenez and Mayor Licardo have put in their memo, which formalizes the process. The city will manage the process, create the flea market advisory group that will be predominantly um, um, vendors uh, and start doing all the planning that we're talking about, answer the questions that we're talking about. We just think that that would be more productive. Uh, a deferral where we're just sort of left in this limbo with us, the owners and the local council member and the vendor advocates, I don't see how how that gets morphed into a productive dialogue anymore. I mean, we've, we've done everything we can. We met, they gave us their demands in writing. I showed those to you. We responded to that. 
Um, the only other response we've gotten back from the vendors since then was their request for five-year leases and $28 million. Uh, we didn't agree to five years, but we have agreed to, in essence, three years, right? Because we've agreed that um, we wouldn't provide the one-year notice till two years from now. Mathematically, that's three years. So every time the vendors have given us anything to work with, we have come back and offered something more. So I just don't know what will happen in the next six days, but we've, we've, uh, I'd like to hear what you think the actual steps would be in the next six, six days. We think the formal launching the formal process would be the most productive. Council member, you're well over time. Yeah, my, my, my time is, is up. I'm, I'm happy to, to take it back up tomorrow, uh, and raise okay. my here, okay. Thank you. Council Member Sparson. Thank you. Um, so I, uh, I, so I want to just go over what the motion is um, on the floor. Can um, someone repeat it? I think Council Member Cohen probably would be the expert at that. <laughs> I, okay. I can, I can repeat it. Okay. Uh, let me go actually make sure I bring up my proper document here. Um, first was the staff memo which was the first memo posted. Second is the staff supplemental memo, which at the bottom actually has recommendations, not at the top as usual. Um, and then third is our joint memo, the one that I wrote with the mayor and council member Jimenez. The fourth is vice mayor Jones's memo. And then the fifth one is items one and two from council member Carrasco's memo. And and that includes all of two A, B, C, D. Um, and then from Councilmember Perales' memo, recommendations 1D, 1E, and 4. 1D, E. And then number 4. And 4, okay, to expand the interim. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so did the motion um, does not include the makeup of the advisory group where a major, super majority of flea market vendors or would consist of flea market vendors? Can I ask you why that wasn't part of the motion? Well, the, the agreement that's written out already and provides for at least half of the committee to be um, group to, to have representatives of the vendors. Beyond that, we've been trying not to be over prescriptive as a city. And my personal preference and the preference of all of us who've been involved was to leave the makeup to a group that will be involved, that will involve the vendors and a potential consultant that the city will hire to run the process so that we wouldn't over prescribe. Because we've, we've heard that the vendors kind of want to control that fate. And, and so we didn't want to over prescribe that the makeup of that um, of that group. Um, you know, in addition, we've, we've heard of multiple um, vendors at the market who are parts of different groups and not necessarily united with the, the, the group that has, has organized. And so, you know, we want to make sure that, that all of them will have a part in being able to determine who will serve on this group. And we're not going to tell them who is the appropriate representative and, and what groups they should be part of. Okay, and can I ask why um, the so the recommendation number one from Vice Mayor Jones that that was included because his memo was included? Is that correct? So mm -hmm. that would already be included. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, and then um, I wanted to ask because, and I'm getting to a couple of points. So including clarifying language in the ordinance and resolution that the conditions of approval remain in effect in the event the property is transferred. Can I ask why that wasn't included in the motion? It's already in the language. Well, it's already in the legal language of the, mo of the memo that, that I submitted. It's already, you know, the city and then the attorneys wrote the language that already has that. I mean, if we think that we want to include additional language that repeats that, that's okay. But we, it's already in there that this, this, 
would, would have the force of enforcement no matter who, who the entitlement transfers to. Councilman so Esparza, yeah. oh, I'm sorry. Councilman yeah, Esparza, yeah. you, you'll, yes. you'll have the mic first thing tomorrow morning. I think we'll okay. the midnight hour. Okay, all right, thank you. Right, so we'll so start we'll up with Councilman Esparza. And what time are we meeting tomorrow? Uh, I believe 9 a.m., is that right, Tony? 9 a.m., but we do need to take a vote. Oh, a vote need, on yeah, what? Yeah, we need a vote on, to continue on, the hearing until tomorrow morning, is that right? Yes. Okay, okay. I move to continue the hearing until tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Second. Motion and second. Okay, let's vote on that motion. Council Member Sparks. Jimenez? Yes. Rawas? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Roscoe? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Pardo? Aye. Thank you. All right, thank you everyone. Uh, the meeting will be continued tomorrow morning at 9 a.m.